Okay, Steve, you can go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. Will council members and council staff please turn on their video at this time? Please place all cell phones and electronic devices to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimonies at council.myc.gov. Once again, that's testimonies at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair, and we are ready to begin. Are we waiting for the speaker? The speaker is here, sir. Okay. I, I know the speaker has some remarks, but. Oh, oh thank, uh, thank you, Chair Torres. Uh, I'll keep it simple. Um, I, I mean, do you, this hearing today is, of course, about the disparities that we've seen uh, in our city, it's no coincidence that black and brown communities, uh, as well as Asian communities, are taking the brunt of the impact of this crisis physically and financially. And we are failing communities of color right now. And we're going to feel the effects for decades if we don't turn things around. The people here today uh, already know that. You don't need to hear it from me. I have a platform. I get to speak to New Yorkers all the time. I want to use my opportunity to speak to actually pass the mic to these communities to amplify their voices, the voices of communities that are hurting right now, and the voices of those that are serving these communities on the ground. Today, I'm here to listen and to start a dialogue. So I am not going to speak any further. I want to thank everyone for being here, and I want to turn it back to Chair Torres. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, uh, which has been the inspiration behind today's historic hearing on racial disparities. In particular, I'm deeply grateful for the leadership of Adrian Adams, one of the co-chairs of the BLAC. Good afternoon, I'm City Council Member Richie Torres, and I chair the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. From the very beginning of the novel coronavirus outbreak, we've heard a common refrain that the virus is, quote, the great equalizer the great leveler, that the virus, quote, does not discriminate. It is true the virus affects all of us, but it affects us unevenly. The outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 has held up a mirror to the stark inequalities that have made COVID-19 disproportionately deadlier in communities of color. Latinos and African-Americans have twice the likelihood of dying from COVID-19 compared to the rest of the city. The Asian community is confronting a new wave of discrimination unleashed by the president himself. There is nothing accidental about the racially disparate impact of COVID-19. The rates of poverty and pollution, the prevalence of pre-existing conditions, the overcrowding of homes, the occupational hazards of an exploited essential workforce, all of these are rooted in a larger historical and social context worth examining. Both our city and our country have what I call a compromised social immune system. And the purpose of our hearing is to examine in detail the intersecting ways in which the city's compromised social immune system has made communities of color especially susceptible to the worst impact of COVID-19. In almost all city council hearings, the government does most of the talking while the public largely watches passively from the sidelines. At today's hearing, instead of the elected officials largely speaking as we normally do, we will largely listen. And instead of arranging for the mayor's office to testify first, we have asked the administration to listen first and then to incorporate what is said, what is learned into testimony at a future hearing. The work of city government must be informed by the expert opinions of public health professionals, as well as by the lived experiences of those directly affected and those advocating on behalf of the affected. I look forward to listening. Before proceeding with the first panel, I understand that we have been joined by Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson. Uh, Deputy Mayor, please introduce yourself for the record. Hi, I'm Phil Thompson. I'm Deputy Mayor for uh, Strategic Policy and Initiatives for the City of New York. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And I would like to acknowledge the following colleagues who are in attendance. 
uh, the co-chair of the BLAC, Council Member Adams, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Kozlowicz, Menchaca, Powers, and Rose, and we will announce members as the hearing unfolds. So we'll begin with the first panel. Stephanie, can you call up the first panel? Sure. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm Stephanie Jones, counsel to the Oversight Investigations Committee. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called in to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify as the chair just mentioned. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I will call on you in order. Thank you. First, we will hear from a number of experts and representatives of impacted communities on this important issue. Our first panel will consist of Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones, Dr. Chandra L. Ford, Maya Clark Kutaya, and Dr. Carmen R. Izasi. Once I call on you, council members, please specify which specific panelists you are directing your testimony to. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and then you can begin your testimony. Once you are finished, please remain on the line as we will open it up to council member questions once all members of this panel have delivered their testimony. First, I would like to welcome Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones to testify, who will be followed by Dr. Chandra L. Ford. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting my testimony. I am Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones. I'm a family physician and epidemiologist, and my work is on naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism on the health and well being of the nation. So, Chair Torres, you opened this up so perfectly. People um, act as if uh, it's a surprise to see the disproportionate infection rate and the disproportionate deaths in black and brown and native communities um, in this country because, of course, all of us were susceptible to this virus, but this coronavirus has found and exposed the huge uh, fractures in our society. The, it's exposed the fact that opportunity is not equally distributed in this country, nor is exposure to risk equally distributed. And we have a name for the system of structuring opportunity and assigning value by so-called race in this country. And the name of that system is racism. Many people, the importance of saying that word should not be lost. Um, I have to say that many people in this country are in denial that racism continues to exist and have profound impacts on the health and well-being of the whole nation. And so when we see something like COVID-19, where the black and brown bodies are piling up so fast that they can't be normalized or ignored, they wake up and say, oh my God, racism. But that People woke up maybe with Hurricane Katrina. Maybe they woke up with you know, the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Maybe they woke up with the poisoning of the Flint water supply. But what happens is that then this nation falls back into the slumber of racism denial. So I think, first of all, it's important for us to acknowledge that there is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value that's working in this society. I just, um, I've submitted some written testimony, so I want to just quickly, because I know I only have a short amount of time, um, say, how is racism turning into the COVID-19 excess deaths um, in communities of color? And it's happening actually in two ways. It's happening through increased infections, rates of infection, and that's because we're more exposed and less protected. And then once infected, it's happening because we carry in our bodies the burdens of living in disinvested communities, poisoned communities. So we are the ones with higher rates of diabetes and heart disease and hypertension and asthma and all of these other things, which in the context of this infection make us more likely to die. And also, often we have less access to uh, a functioning, at least functioning for us, healthcare system. So now that we know about these differences, what we need to do is we're compelled to act. Some people might say, oh, racism, well, nothing we can do about that. Au contraire. There's a lot that we can do about it in the short, medium, and long 
term. In the short term, if people are more exposed because of their frontline jobs or because they're incarcerated or because they're unhoused or in, in, living in crowded situations, if people are more exposed, we need to make it more feasible for as many of us as possible to safely shelter in place. We certainly don't need to do what's happening in my home state of Georgia, where we're, we're pushing people back into the workforce and lifting the stay-at-home orders. So we need to keep those stay-at-home orders and make it more feasible for people to safely shelter in place, which means perhaps even lobbying for, uh, dare I say, a universal basic income or at least more than a one-time payment, making sure that the, that the Payroll Protection Act, which is supposed to keep people employed in small businesses, actually gets to our small businesses um, to decarcerate people who are imprisoned in our prisons, jails, detention centers, and to provide housing for those who are unhoused. We need to make it more feasible for as many of us as possible to be safely sheltering in place. And for those people who are part of that essential workforce, which has been until recently completely overlooked and completely undervalued, we need to make sure that they have the protective, personal protective equipment that they need, the full gear, the full thing, like the N95 masks, as well as hazard pay. In recognizing that uh, once we get more infected that we have more of these diseases, we need to make sure that we're testing uh, vigorously in communities that are overexposed. Um, we need to make sure that we get, um, I'm actually recommending a la Singapore or a la South Korea that we have mid-level isolation centers for people who are infected. They don't have to go back into their families uh, because they're not sick enough to be hospitalized, thereby infecting more people in their family or in their community, that there be isolation centers in trusted places. We don't want people to feel incarcerated. But isolation centers that are staffed by nurses who have thermometers and can check oxygen levels with pulse oximeters, who have oxygen in place and who can look at people and know when it's time for them to go to the hospital and be transferred as opposed to somebody saying, well, am I sick enough? <gasps> I can't breathe. Right. Um, and also, we need to make sure that we never use the existence of pre-existing conditions as a way of uh, disqualifying people from life-saving resources in case the resources become scarce, or even putting them lower on, a, on, a, um, on some kind of uh, prioritization scheme. There are other things that I've indicated in my written testimony. I just have two other quick points, and then I will uh, cede this floor. What we need to do in terms of affecting the pandemic for all of us, for the whole nation, is that we need to treat this problem, which is after all a public health problem, with public health strategies. So far, because we did not treat this infection as a public health problem, but rather treated it as a medical care problem, then we have made it a problem that's overwhelming our healthcare system. We, the kind of testing we need to do, not only do we need more testing, but we need a public health surveillance strategy for testing, as opposed to what we're doing right now, which is if you are sick enough to qualify to get a test after begging for it two or three times, then we are using it to, di to confirm a diagnosis, one person by one person. That's the way you document the course of a pandemic and its worst impact. But to really be able to change the course of the pandemic, we need to be doing population-based probability samples, probably weekly, of a random sample of the New York City population to sampling both asymptomatic and symptomatic people to say, how much is infection is there in the community right now? Because when we look at people who are hospitalized, that's a two-week-old estimate. That's how many were there two weeks ago. And when we look at deaths, that's a three- to four-week-old estimate of the prevalence of the infection. If we find out by testing both asymptomatic and symptomatic people in a probability sample way, public health surveillance, we will know how much infection is there now, which will help us predict where we need to have our health resources in two weeks. It also enables us to identify asymptomatic infected people and isolate them, thereby uh, really interrupting these, these asymptomatic spreaders who are a big part of getting the disease continuing. And we need to do contact tracing for everybody and monitor and quarantine those contacts. In this way, we can not only document the course of the pandemic, we can alter the course. And so my last comment is that now in this pandemic and going forward, we need to be guided by health equity. 
and there are three principles for achieving health equity that need to guide our response right now and as we try to build a whole new, better future. Those three principles are valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices, and providing resources according to need. So thank you again for inviting my testimony and uh, I cede my, my time. Thank you so much, Doctor. Please remain in the line as we will open it up to council member questions once all members of this panel have delivered their testimony. Next, we welcome Dr. Chandra L. Ford and Dr. Maya Clark Kutaya. Dr. Ford? Good morning, honorable council speaker, Corey Johnson, council member chair, Richie, uh, Richie Torres, um, chair of the oversight investigations committee and all other committee and council members present. Thank you for the opportunity to share remarks with you that might inform your questions for Mayor de Blasio's office in addressing racial and ethnic inequities in the COVID-19 pandemic. Briefly, I am founding director of the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice and Health in the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. The research, scholarship, and teaching that our faculty affiliates conduct involves empirical work to document specific health and healthcare related implications of various forms of racism, including but not limited to anti-Black racism, nativism and anti-immigrant sentiment, discrimination on the basis of religion, such as Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism, as well as anti-Semitism and other forms of social injustice. In light of the expertise my co-panelists have, I thought it would be useful to offer remarks based on what we've learned from the HIV epidemic and its relationship to racism. My comments today draw on the state of the science on racism as a public health issue, as reflected in the book that I recently co-edited on racism as a public health problem, Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional. It also draws on more than a decade of research on the implications of racism related factors for disparities in HIV diagnosis, care, and well being. I want to highlight just a couple of concerns this morning or this afternoon. Um, first, while the emergence of data on disparities in rates of COVID have raised awareness about the need to, issue, to ensure equity in diagnosing cases, it's important to ensure equity across each stage of the continuum of care. And by continuum of care, I'm referring to the key stages at which an individual must interact with the healthcare system in order to do well. With respect to HIV, this includes testing to get a diagnosis, as well as getting the test results. For those who test positive, getting linked to care, being retained in care, that is staying in care over the long haul if needed, and adhering to prescribed treatment regimens and prescribed medications. And we can evaluate disparities or potential disparities at each of these stages along the lines of the timeliness, the aggressiveness of treatment options, and the quality of services that are provided at each of these stages. Health inequities do occur within the healthcare system. Therefore, having access to healthcare, though important, does not address the differential treatment patients may receive within the healthcare system. In general, implicit biases, which reflect embedded institutional policies and practices, lead to systematic differences in how quickly racial and ethnic minority patients receive care and how aggressively their healthcare needs are treated. These factors in turn further contribute to racial and ethnic disparities. And with an infectious condition, there are implications not only for the well being of the specific patient, but also for those with whom this patient interacts, so close family members and others within their community. Similarly, the development of a treatment does not mean that disparities will necessarily be eliminated. The evidence from the HIV epidemic suggests, in fact, quite the opposite, that disparities are likely to be exacerbated 
if any treatments or solutions that become available are made available without proactive, intentional consideration of equity. And I don't know if it was received, but I uh, mailed, emailed a, um, a slide that I'd like to reference if it is available um, to council members. It is, um, it's, it's highlighting the patterns of, H of AIDS diagnosis and the ways in which the availability of antiretroviral therapies, which have been tremendously useful, actually exacerbated that disparity. So while African-Americans had always experienced higher rates of HIV and AIDS than their share of the overall US population would suggest, it was in 1996 when antiretroviral therapies became widely available that we saw a shift in the nature of disparities in this country, such that um, African-Americans and to a lesser degree, uh, Latinos, Latino populations were less able to make, to access the antiretroviral therapies and thus the dis overall disparities, the magnitude of those disparities between blacks and whites and Latinos and whites actually grew. Since 1996, and ironically, instead of reducing the black white differential in AIDS, as might be expected, over time, the availability of antiretroviral therapies appears to have exacerbated them. It's also important to consider um, concerns about the labor implications for communities of color working proximally to COVID-19. Data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics indicate that in 2019, 18.2% of all janitors in the US are black, 31.6% are Latino. These numbers likely undercount undocumented persons. 37.2% and 17.6% of nursing, psychiatric and home health aides are black and Latino respectively. Again, disproportionate relative to the shares of the overall population. I did not address here in the interest of time, another consideration that I believe is important to think about, and that is the concerns with conspiracy beliefs and mistrust. We can draw on the HIV literature to better understand this. Um, but in conclusion for now, allow me to say that there are important ways and considerations for thinking about how racism and inattention to equity matter at each stage of the continuum of care, from diagnosis, getting the test results, um, getting linked to appropriate health care, remaining in care as needed, and adhering and being able to adhere to the appropriate medications and treatment regimens. These considerations and the evidence from the HIV epidemic provide stark evidence that disparities are in fact likely to persist if a more proactive approach to addressing them is not undertaken at this point in the COVID-19 pandemic. As long as uh, those disparities persist in pockets of our most vulnerable populations, where more complex strategies are necessary to fully eradicate the problem, there are risks for our entire society, not just for those vulnerable communities. So I thank you for the opportunity to offer these remarks and I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you so much, Doctor. Next, we will be calling on Dr. Maya Clark Kutaya, followed by Dr. Carmen R. Isasi. Maya? Good afternoon, Chairperson Flores and all council members present. My name is Dr. Maya clark Kataya, and I am an assistant professor at New York University, Rory Myers College of Nursing and the Grossman School of Medicine. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today and share my knowledge on the topic of COVID-19 um, and particularly its impact on vulnerable populations. Individuals suffering from underlying medical conditions in particular those with multiple chronic conditions such as heart disease, obesity, and kidney disease are at risk 
or an increased risk of a COVID-19 diagnosis and COVID-related mortality. According to the Centers of Disease Control, 78% of COVID-positive patients admitted to the ICU in the U.S. had one or more underlying health conditions. These individuals are often black and brown and from other vulnerable populations, the elderly, the immunocompromised, the institutionalized, and the disenfranchised. This is the population of patients that I provide care for as an acute care nurse practitioner and conduct research with. My patients are from minority backgrounds. They live in low socioeconomic status neighborhoods and have low health literacy. They are the patients with diabetes and hypertension supported by federally subsidized programs already making decisions regarding their health versus their basic necessities. As such, they are likely to have poorly controlled medical conditions. They are the patients in under-resourced communities. My patients are, often, are also often in nursing homes. However, they could just as easily be in prisons and jails because the risks and health disparities for these populations are the same. The advent of COVID-19 has not only highlighted existing disparities and inequities, it has reminded us of the significantly poor poor outcomes related to lack of resources in these communities. As the COVID-19 illness emphasizes disparities and in the incidence and prevalence of underlying medical conditions and treatment regimens in these vulnerable populations, it forces us to take stock of how the current provision and division of healthcare resources in our country contribute to the healthcare inequities. Forget that many adv advantages afforded to those of money, of means such as testing and homeopathic remedies that may or may not work the sheer way of life of many of these patient populations puts them at risk of serious illness and not adhering to recommended recommend, rec restrictions and management plans. For example, they have to go to work to make money and they are less likely to seek medical care and more often to re rely on social networks like their church, church for support. They are the computer, commuter nation, sometimes taking multiple buses to and from work daily. They are the patients who have less ability to tune into CNN, Fox or MSNBC and search the web or other news outlets to stay informed of the COVID-19 crisis. For those that are institutionalized in nursing home or prisons, tighter quarters do not allow for social distancing. Furthermore, much needed resources such as medical staff and supplies are limited and some institutions, depending on location, geography and funding, for example, are under-resourced. Many of us would like to assign blame. We would like to prosecute a perpetrator but the fact of the matter is these disparities have existed long before COVID-19 and will sadly most likely persist after this pandemic. This is not to say that tackling disparities and inequities is hopeless, but that it is time to change our outrage into action, action that is sustainable and action that is meaningful. We as providers and researchers need to in be innovative in the ways that we reach our patients and ensure that they have the resources they need to keep themselves healthy and reduce their risk of contracting COVID-19. This includes eating well and sleeping well, exercising, taking their medications on time, and adhering to treatment schedules like dialysis regimens. We need to ask ourselves difficult questions, such as how are these patients obtaining their medications from the pharmacy? How are those who are suffering from kidney disease being transported safely to and from dialysis when they are already immunocompromised? How are we reducing their risk when the suggested personal protective equipment is already worn and patients still suffer from line infections and PPE is now at a premium? How often, excuse me, how are patients consuming the recommended diet when the general population continues to stock up during these periods of restriction? What foods remain on the shelves that is SNAP or WIC approved? How do you get exercise in a neighborhood that is not safe to walk? How do you get enough sleep when the burden of living paycheck to paycheck weighs heavily upon your chest? And then we need to come up with creative solutions. Providers need to educate patients and identify at risk vulnerable populations as well as their potential needs and how to address them. It is paramount that we facilitate rapports between communities with resources and those without. Policymakers need to broaden the scope of federally subsidized programs. It is time to begin to incentivize healthcare professionals to work in these under-resourced areas and institutions. While such programs have existed for rural areas, there are many areas in which underserved vulnerable populations still require attention. We need to gain a better understanding of the facilitators of the disparities in our nursing homes and the prison system and develop realistic solutions to bring resources into these facilities. We also need pharmaceutical companies, pharmacies and health systems to provide medications to patients free of charge and to potentially ensure that these prescriptions are delivered to those in need. Local politicians can encourage safe practices to keep their constituents healthy like crowd control and safe distancing in lines at the grocery store and supporting local food de delivery and, the, and other necessary efforts. We need to demand that the jails and prisons institute early release programs and create optimal management conditions 
for those caring for this forgotten population. If we fail now to protect these groups from COVID-19, especially in vulnerable communities, each of us will be impacted by the loss of a loved one to this novel illness. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I welcome any additional questions the committee may have. Thank you so much for your testimony, doctor. Finally, we will be calling on Dr. Carmen R. Azasi to deliver testimony. Doctor? Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Carmen Isasi. I'm Associate uh, Professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I'm, I'm epidemiologist and my research uh, addresses the uh, role of uh, adversities in health uh, among Hispanics and other immigrant populations in, in the city and across uh, the country. Uh, I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to, uh, you know, have some comments about the the effects of the pandemic on our um, communities of color. Um, not surprising, um, COVID-19 has expo exposed once more the structural forces that drive health disparities and increases the vulnerability of people of color in New York City and elsewhere in the country. Uh, higher COVID-19 risk and burden that has manifested in our population of, cohort, of, of color uh, is a result of a greater exposure to the virus uh, due to uh, major um, challenges that our communities uh, face, um, difficulties in social distancing and uh, job related, uh, given that a, a great majority of our population have jobs that are deemed essential for the you know, running of, of the city and the state. Um, in addition, the higher severity and mortality that we have observed is, as my colleagues have expressed, uh, you know, due to the higher burden of underlying conditions that are our communities already experience, given um, the high rates of diabetes, the high rates of hypertension, and the difficulties on maintaining uh, the management, a good uh, adequate management of their conditions. This is also an expression of the barriers to access to healthcare and health insurance that are a community of, of color uh, remain um, limited to. They have limited, they have in this pandemic, they have had limited access to testing in a timely manner that may have affect, you know, affected uh, their, their health and exposed them to a greater risk of mortality or more severe uh, progression. Uh, in addition, uh, given that all routine appointments uh, have been paused or significantly decreased, uh, uh, you know, in the whole network of hospitals and primary care um, um, uh, offices, there have been extreme difficulties in management of their chronic conditions, therefore increasing the vulnerability of our communities. As we move forward, uh, we need to start talking about building from equity, having an equity framework as we engage in discussions on uh, what the new reality is going to be for delivering the healthcare uh, for the city and for the state and how to mitigate disparities. We have to look at some of the strategies of delivery of healthcare that are being posited as novel or the, the future may in fact accentuate disparities further. One example is telemedicine. And um, you know, several, in the Bronx, in, in several hospitals, there's been a shift during this pandemic, the pandemic to offer service through telemedicine. But it requires an infrastructure and technology that our low income families and our families of color do not have. And even it's gonna be a harder uh, barrier for our uh, population with language barriers. All of these resources for telemedicine are directed for people who are very fluent in English. And the traditional translators that we have at hospitals cannot be easily incorporated. You know, the, there's also a lack of incorporation uh, of uh, patients navigators, for example. So, so far, you know, we have observed in the Bronx issues with video-based visits. Uh, as I said, some of our, uh, our parents, our families do not have um, the infrastructure. The Wi-Fi connection is poor. 
they have to convert to phone visits. Uh, the parents or, or the adults are not tech savvy and therefore cannot figure it out how to connect the video portion of those um, uh, new uh, ways to deliver the uh, visits. And there's also, um, you know, potential barriers in the sense of how we are going to manage the things that cannot be managed through telemedicine with video-based visits in person, like drawing the blood for, for um, the conditions, uh, doing, uh, you know, the conditions to be able to control, check the glucose, etc., cetera, and, uh, and vaccinations. Um, some other uh, communities are um, proposing that I could be like drive through for families to get their children vaccinated. But here in our communities where, the, where people don't have cars, they have not have the ability to go through uh, testing or immunizations uh, through these you know, novel ways of delivery. So this is um, something that we need to start discussing. You know, we need to root our understanding of our communities and start uh, building uh, the capacity to respond and minimize or mitigate the impact on our community. Thanks again uh, for the council to invite me to uh, talk on behalf of um, my community and uh, I welcome questions. Thank you all panelists. First, we'll turn to Chair Torres for questions. Chair? Thank you. Uh, before I ask questions, I would like to acknowledge a few more council members, Council Member Lewis, Lansman, Salamaca, Levine, Yeager, Kalos, Amphrey Samuel, Traeger, and Rosenthal. Um, but before, Mr. Speaker, do you want to ask questions first or? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Again, I want to uh, pass the mic. I want to allow the uh, members from the BLAC who have been spending an enormous amount of time on this. I want to allow them to ask questions during this time, led by you as chair of this committee and as a member of uh, that caucus uh, that we're so proud of. But I want to turn it over to a bunch of the members of color who are waiting uh, to ask questions. So thank you. I may come back at a later point, but I want to pass the mic for now. And it was really wonderful to hear these incredible panelists uh, and their amazing testimony. And with that, I'll turn it back to you to start the questioning and then hand it off to some of our other colleagues. So to, to all the doctors, you know, in our society, health, health is often framed as, a, as an individual rather than a structural phenomenon. It's often framed as a choice rather than a, a circumstance. And so I'm wondering what, what's the public health response to those attributing the prevalence of pre-existing conditions in communities of color to a failure of personal responsibility, a failure of personal choice. You know, one example that comes to mind is the commentary from the Surgeon General mm -hmm. who said that communities of color have to avoid alcohol, tobacco. So, you know, what is, because every time we mention the R word, racism, it provokes a visceral reaction. And so what is the public health response to that narrative? If I, if I might start, um, the, the problem, there, there are three big cultural things that are uh, working against people acknowledging the existence of racism. So I just want to name those and, and the public health responses to fight against those. The first is that in this nation, we have a very narrow focus on the individual, which you just described as manifesting itself in terms of blame for health conditions, but it also makes all systems and structures invisible or irrelevant. So we're, even when we think about health research, we're trying to get inside the individual to the genes as opposed to acknowledging that polluting industries or poor housing or all of these other structural things that we can see with our eyes, if we just spent that same amount of money addressing those issues would have a much bigger impact on health. So the fact that we are narrowly focused as an individual, as a society, um, keeps people, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing or a value thing that we must address. The second is that we're ahistorical as a nation. 
So we act as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance, and as if the present were disconnected from the past. So we need to address that too, and we need to even, the New York City Council, when you're considering issues, should hire a historian, because if you understand how the knot that you're trying to untie was put there, if you understand the history of a problem, then you're more likely to be able to untie that knot. But we need to acknowledge the foundational, that racism's foundation on our nation's history. We have to acknowledge all of the many levels, including uh, right after World War II, when the housing segregation became even more formalized. Um, and there I refer to the work of Richard Rothstein and the Color of Law and many other people who are talking about these things. We need to become more historical. And then the third of these huge barriers that we must address all of us as a society and nation is the endorsement of the myth of meritocracy. The story that goes something like this, if you work hard, you will make it. Now I give you that most people who have made it have worked hard. Not everybody who's made it has worked hard. We have very prominent examples of that right now, but most people who have made it have worked hard. But there are many, many, many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field, which has been structured and is being perpetuated by racism, sexism, heterosexism, all, all of these isms. And to the extent that we endorse this idea of equal opportunity and the myth of, of meritocracy, um, when we deny racism, we have to blame people. When we deny these unequal structures, right? Because they make us uncomfortable. They make you make us feel like, oh my God, somebody just called me racist. And so we deny these things. Then, then we are blaming people. We're saying they're lazy or stupid or ignorant or superstitious or whatever and blaming them. So we need to address those. Those are just three of seven barriers to achieving health equity that I've articulated. But these three in particular, not only, uh, make us ill-equipped as a nation to open our eyes and see what's going on, but they allow people to go back into that somnolence of racism denial. And we have to resist that going forward out of this as well. I have a question for, for Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford, you, if I understood your, correct, your testimony correct, correctly, you drew an analogy with HIV and AIDS. Yes. That, yeah. that despite advances in, there's a common refrain about HIV and AIDS, is that it's no longer a death sentence, but that's not necessarily the case. About it's you know the complexion of your skin, your zip code, are certainly factors in whether HIV and AIDS is a death sentence because of inequitable distribution of healthcare resources. Do you worry that in the context of COVID nineteen, there might be an inequitable distribution of antivirals and vaccinations, and how do we prevent that? I do. I um, I wanted to respond, just adding one more thing to those important remarks that Dr. Jones made to add, part of the issue is that we don't have the data. You asked, what is a public health response to those charges that essentially are victim blaming? As long as the data we collect are data that facilitate victim blaming, it makes it easier to do that. And that's a lot of what the data we collect are. I think it would be useful, for instance, to collect in addition to for instance, race and ethnicity, what's happening inside the healthcare system once people get into the healthcare system? How adequately, how quickly do all patients receive their prescriptions and so forth? If we could track things like that, we would be able to tell a different story. Or if on their intake forms, when, when people come to uh, the clinic, we do assess their family history and everything, what if we asked about the whether they're living in slum lord type or something? We would be able to track that as a public health problem. So I think a big part of it is having the data because the data allow us to tell different stories. And with that, I draw a parallel to um, when the general public realized that we couldn't really say how many deaths were happening due to gun violence because people weren't able to study that. In terms of whether or not I'm concerned about the um, about disparities actually becoming worse based on what we've seen with HIV, the short answer is yes, I'm very concerned. Um, I'm concerned because the epidemic is going to unfold and it's already unfolding in different communities differently. And in the communities who are most vulnerable, the solutions needed to address it 
as you know, and as was already articulated, are also more complex. And so there is that. In this case, part of what has me very concerned is that um, starting from the, the very beginning in the way that the president framed the disease and the condition as a Chinese one, racializing it, and um, finding ways to make this a, a source of division. The reason that concerns me is to this day, HIV prevention workers are still trying to battle conspiracy beliefs uh, about whether or not the government put HIV in certain communities, whether or not the uh, folks are able to get the same quality of care. Um, and these, these kinds of concerns are exacerbated in a context when the rollout of the prevention efforts were so uneven that even if there is, let's say there's absolutely no conspiracy whatsoever and everything is intended to be, to, intended to happen equally, the very nature of the underlying inequalities means that it might look like some communities are being directly targeted and that kind of quote unquote data would simply provide fodder to support the kinds of conspiracy beliefs that, that we saw and that we still see with HIV. So um, I think that building a trustful relationship is going to be essential. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I think that's critical. Yeah, I would like to add to that, that you know, once vaccines are available or even treatments uh, for these uh, virus, you know, the cost and the access for the people who are more vulnerable is gonna, you know, be a problem or could be an important problem as in the disparities. Um, there's already examples from chronic conditions where, you know, novel therapies are, um, you know, identify for treating cholesterol or diabetes, this, this tends to be very costly and not all insurance cover that. So how are we, we're gonna ensure that our communities have access to these, you know, new vaccines and new therapies that are gonna emerge despite, you know, despite the, 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 the cost associated with that. And also having providers who know about these treatment regimens and these protocols. Um, if we don't have that level of provider in these communities, it's not going to happen at baseline. Exactly. I have more questions later on, but I want to give my colleagues an opportunity to ask questions. Should we and I have to apologize, oh, yes. but I'm, I have to go to another meeting right now. Um, Indiana Porter, who organized it, knew that I was going to have to cut out early. So my apologies and thank you for inviting my testimony oh, and, and the rest of the people. You got it. Thank you for coming. I, 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 want, to, I want to start with um, Council Member Adams. Do you have any questions? Yes. Thank you so much, Chair Torres. Thank you for your leadership. I uh, thank the speaker also for his leadership. Um, to all of the uh, doctors that have uh, provided testimony so far, uh, we really do appreciate your brilliance, uh, first of all. Uh, in, in your presentation, your thoughtfulness for being here with us today. You know, um, on, on April 6th, the BLAC, um, I am a co-chair of the BLAC, as uh, the chair mentioned, we sent out a letter to our elected officials and we, we put up several points. Um, I'm just interested to know your thoughts on testing right now, because we're getting conflicting uh, thoughts and advice about antibody testing, versus swab testing and every other kind of testing. And we know right now, particularly in our communities of color, there is such a frenzy around being tested. There's a frenzy around walkthrough or drive, walk up or drive through testing right now. And, 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 and those of us who uh, composed the letter um, uh, by the BLAC thought it was a really important point to put in to address the lack of testing still um, in our communities of color. We're getting it in drips and drabs, but not necessarily um, to the extent that we feel that we should be seeing it. So my question really is, are we really on the right track right now in talking about testing and continuing the testing in our communities? And if so, 
Um, is it the standard testing? Is it the antibody testing? What type of testing should we be concerned with right now uh, as our communities continue to be infected, continue to die um, at monumental proportion? What should our focus around testing right now be? Um, and knowing too that there is such a hysteria in our communities for testing. So I know here for our community, our issue has been one that we don't have enough tests. The tests that we do have, there, there isn't sufficient ability to analyze those tests. And we're still asking, which is the best test to provide our, 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 um, our patients. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that because we're still trying to get to the bottom of it. I think the important thing um, is that we have to come up with some sort of testing, right? Some sort of testing that's accessible, that's available, that we can then act upon, which we still, I mean, I take phone calls from patients 36 hours a week and I'm still trying to figure out how best to get tested. Um, we don't know who we're testing all the time. Sometimes those, uh, those instructions have been, you know, test everyone with symptoms, test those who are febrile, test those who have family members who could be exposed. Um, there hasn't been much consistency in terms of what those, uh, what the outline is, but I would I would definitely say to stay on that track because we need someone to step out front and give us some guidance in terms of how best to keep our patients safe. And the question is still out there. Yeah, that that's really encouraging to hear that because at times, you know, personally, um, it's been a mantra of mine for weeks. We've submitted several lists, several lists in to the governor and mayor, and uh, several of our thoughts across, particularly in my area, Southeast Queens, have, have been rejected um, as suggestions, and we consider them still to be viable uh, suggestions. So uh, it, it was important for me to hear from you all, you know, what you feel about the testing. We were told initially it's not important. It's the health care that's important and getting the hospital beds. Well, we saw where that got us. We're sending a ship away right now. Comfort has gone away over the right. Hours because we don't need that. And, and our insistence continues to be on testing in communities of color. So thank you very much for that. Um, it's gonna be really important to get back to getting folks back to work. How do we know who's healthy and who yes. isn't? Probably. Exactly, exactly. Our point exactly. Dr. Sassi, did you wanna add anything to that? I think I saw you lit up there. I, I would add that there are sure. actually more, more than one reason to, um, to think about testing. And I share that concern about the quality of testing and what tests actually tell us. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really know, to be honest with you. Um, and also there appear to be a number of different kinds of tests. So um, again, when I think about the continuum of care and equity, one thing to keep, to keep um, on the radar is, are we getting the best tests of the tests that are now available? And I can't answer that question now, but that is a question that I would keep on on the, on the radar screen. Another reason why I think it's important, um, two other reasons I think it's important to emphasize testing. One is this concern about fairness and equity. Um, to it may not be a great test, but if everybody else has that test, our communities need to have access to it too. And that's important just on the face of it, but I think it's also important in the long term because if we are not included, then that again adds to this mistrust and the potential for conspiracy beliefs and things in the long run. And then the final reason that I think it's really important to continue to press for testing is testing is considered the gateway to the care continuum. It's considered the gateway to all other aspects of care. And it is again, a a, a source of data that essentially establishes the need for resources for the community um, for healthcare long term along these other stages. And so, um, pushing for testing, in my opinion, at least helps to establish that there will be a push for other um, sources of support along the rest of that continuum of care. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Uh, just one more question. I'm, I'm going to direct this to, um, to Dr. Katai. In your, uh, in your testimony, you spoke about um, um, close, quarter, um, uh, close quarters and the impact that close quarters, jails, and shelters have had um, regarding this pandemic. 
So um, what can we do? Um, we know that uh, jail is going to be jail, shelter is going to be shelter, but do you have any suggestions in ways that we can mitigate um, uh, the risks in jails and in our shelters? Sure. So my concerns there are that the, the, the resources at baseline aren't available for things like washing hands, drying hands, wiping down surfaces that are mutually shared. Um, I've heard that uh, there are prisoners saying they don't have masks, that they weren't instructed to do any of these things. Um, that's where the failure is. We need to get back to making sure that we're giving people just the basic education to protect themselves and then making sure that those who are providing care to them also get those same protections. Are they being tested? How are they getting to and from work? What happens when they go home yeah. so that they're not transmitting it or carrying it back into the facilities as well? Um, it is just that simple. Okay. It really is just that simple. It's just that we are ignoring these populations and not providing the resources right. to them. Right, exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Council Member Adams. Uh, the, the next questioner is Council, Council Member Rivera, who's the chair of the Hospitals Committee. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, I am the chair of the Hospitals Committee. I, uh, I guess I have one question related somewhat to hospitals, and then I wanted to ask you all about, about food insecurity. So my, my question on hospitals is that the city has said that it, in response to this evidence, of the of the disparities that they're investing in grassroots grassroots outreach and telemedicine but i think what we've seen is that the telemedicine is not really working in terms of follow-up and consultations and i think a lot of that also has to do with language access which was mentioned in your testimony so um we we've seen that 21 percent of hospitals 55 percent of of af QHCs, they actually have difficulties in recruiting even Spanish speaking uh, health professionals and that is the second language uh, most frequently spoken. So what are, are, are these the appropriate areas of focus, this, this investment in telehealth infrastructure or do you think the people in our hospital language? I, I didn't hear it, uh, the last question. I wanted to ask whether this was the appropriate area of focus to be investing in a telehealth infrastructure that is a lot more, I guess, sophisticated than what we have. And how can we prevent this, these sorts of language barriers going forward? I know you mentioned language access in your testimony, right. Doctor. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, no, that's a bit. That's a very, um, you know, important question. I. I don't think like going, you know, um, opposing telemedicine is the way to go. Definitely telemedicine has several advantages and uh, that a lot of, you know, higher income uh, populations benefit from. You know, people with better health literacy, with better resources can call the doctors and, and have like an appointment using a video conference call. So my testimony was not to imply that this is not a solution for low income uh, communities or communities of colors, but rather, you know, make sure that the infrastructure is there and that we cannot really, you know, widen the digital divide that we have. So the answer is not gonna be that simple. You know, it's a complex issue because, you know, how can we rely on a system that is unequal. And I'm talking here, you know, the digital divide, the fact that, you know, our communities don't have the infrastructure at home to uh, have, you know, good connections to be able to communicate with their uh, providers uh, via video conferences. So that's on one hand, you know, kind of like the technical aspects and, uh, and, and also, there need, there's need to be like some training, not only for providers to do that, but also for the patients to be able to navigate. You know, even, you know, myself with all the skills, I, I had like troubles joining this Zoom <laughs> you know, uh, call. So that's, you know, an example how this is not necessarily, 
you know, easy for everybody. If we're going to be talking, you know, young parents, if we're going to be talking about, you know, the elderly, how are they going to navigate that? And, um, you know, and adding to that the language barrier. Um, so it traditionally, you know, for example, in Montefiore Hospital, uh, there's been these services that if a provider does not speak the language of the patient, you call this, you know, service and they, you know, provide immediate translation, but it's more like a, as a physical thing. That doesn't exist or is not translated into this virtual world. So how can we manage that? Is there, a, you know, is there a way to have like these translators available when this patient interaction occurs remotely? Is there the technology for that? Are there the resources for that? So those are the things that needs to be explored before really uh, implementing, you know, telemedicine as a way to, you know, continue providing care under different different circumstances. I definitely think there's a place for both, though. Um, you know, piggybacking mm -hmm. on what Dr. Ford said before about trust and the lack thereof. This is a place. This is definitely a space where, um, you know, we can get the community involved and the dialysis centers in which I work. The patients don't rely on what I say. They rely on what the dialysis technician tells them, what the patient next to them tells them. Um, and this is where I think we have a potential to really make change if we utilize those natural born leaders in the community. Mm -hmm. Actually, I wanted to just make a point echoing that because right now we see that across the country, the military and the police and policing and military type strategies are being enlisted to do public health work. Mm -hmm. And um, that is, in terms of a public health response, is ill-advised. Meanwhile, there are people all across the nation who are trained to do community health work. And mm -hmm. um, right now, many of them may actually be sitting at home um, unable to work. And I think in terms of labor, making use of, I mean, it's a win-win on all levels mm -hmm. to shift to thinking about what would involve, what would it mean to involve these folks in doing that work instead of involving the police or the military um, in doing that kind of work. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I think the community health workers could, could use more professional development. They certainly want to work. And I think this could be used in so many spaces, even with, with our, our pregnant uh, people and pregnant women who are facing so many challenges, even pre-pandemic, which is mm -hmm. something that I, I'm really trying to work on. And to your point, uh, I think it's as high as 29% of New York City households don't really have access to online broadband. So we don't even have the internet capability if you were savvy enough. And that has a lot to do with poverty and racial disparity. So my, my second question is on food insecurity. And it has to do with underlying conditions with, with uh, many of you covered. I just gave, I was just out dropping food my third week in a row in the building where I grew up, which was Project Based Section 8, 171 low income families, many of them, many of them with underlying conditions, asthma, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, all of the things that are very prevalent in Latino communities, Black communities, Asian communities. We know that food is a very big issue, food deserts, how expensive it is. Um, we're glad that their food stamps are accepted at our local markets, at our local green markets, but what role do, do you believe food insecurity may play in the high rates of underlying conditions? Um, and, and what can we do as a city about it? I mean, it's such a, such a big issue is the food insecurity piece. And I, and I thank you all for mentioning it. And, and I guess my, my follow-up kind of is, we knew that these conditions already were in our black and brown and Asian communities, and yet we did not send the resources, in my opinion, to these communities to help kind of prevent what we saw unfold, which was a, which was a complete decimation. So I just, I just wanna know your thoughts on, on food insecurity and, and how that has played a role. I do a lot of work in this, um, in this space because I work with dialysis patients and most of their restrictions you know, kind of evolve around sodium restriction, potassium and fluid restriction. And I was just having this conversation yesterday with someone about how the use of SNAP and WIC doesn't translate into healthful foods, right? You can use an EBT card at a grocery store. You can use an EBT card at a gas station. 
you can get food pretty much anywhere, um, but it may not be what you actually need to eat. And I think that treating food as medicine is uh, highly imperative. I'm hopefully working on a study that will allow us to try that with some dialysis patients in the community where we can deliver meals to them, take away that risk of food security and insecurity and demonstrate that if I help them eat well, they have better outcomes. Um, we'll see if, if uh, the funding bodies like that idea, but for me, it sounds like it's simple. You know, this is, this is a basic need. If we feed you well, your outcomes will improve. Yeah, I want to add to that, that, you know, a few years ago, in, in one of my studies in the Latino community, uh, and that this was pre-pandemic, we had like very high rates of food insecurity, despite all the resources that, you know, um, the community had. And, uh, and that was, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. And that has an impact on, you know, the control of diabetes, the, you know, the family's health, the children's health, etc. cetera. Um, I think that this food insecurity is gonna even get worse, you know, when a lot of our community uh, have lost their jobs and, uh, and it's gonna be hard to, you know, find uh, a job again in the near future, so. This is something that needs to be accounted for. I mean, I agree with my colleague that, you know, having access to SNAP and WIC doesn't necessarily translate into, you know, healthy foods and there's more work to be done there. But I think like all the resources have to be deployed now and instead of cutting benefits to try to enhance the benefits that people receive right now or have to receive in the near future. There's certainly no data on this, um, but thinking longer term, mm -hmm. it would also be important to try, oops, let's see, okay. To try to make sure that um, dealing or things like that, uh, petty crime that are tied to food insecurity do not become a major basis for over-policing Mm -hmm. um, black, brown, and Asian communities. And, and then, I mean, the over-policing could be an issue on its own, could be considered an issue on its own. But to the extent it then places people in congregate housing or other places that are um, higher risk for infection or transmission, then, um, then that could become an issue. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is, if it's possible to kind of think ahead about what kinds of strategies or, or policies or practices might be put in place with respect to um, crime and policing to minimize the possibility of that happening. Well, thank, thank you for what you said, uh, uh, unopened policing. I think that overcrowding has proven to be a very big issue in our communities. And I have a piece of legislation to open our streets, but I do not want to open them um, relying heavily on NYPD personnel so that way our communities do feel further over policed. So I'm trying to do that in, in tandem and be responsible and have it be more community led. And I know this is a big problem and I, I thank you for your comments and, and I thank everyone for answering my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. If there's a second round, happy to participate. Of course. Uh, the next questioner is the Chair of the Immigration Committee, Carlos Manchaca. Council Member Manchaca, there you go. Yes, hi, thank you. And thank you to the Chair, uh, the Speaker and the entire Council today. I wanted to, as the chair of the Immigration Committee, just really hone in on the undocumented community mm -hmm. and really get a deeper dive in the impact to the undocumented community. When we talk, we talked a little bit about telemedicine and language access, but if there's anyone that can kind of talk a little bit about that, um, that experience, uh, I know that we're, we're, we're feeling it in, on the ground with immigrant communities. We're seeing it in things like the census a uh, high immigrant population areas around the city are incredibly low right now in census responses. Um, that's all gonna have an impact uh, for the next 10 years if we can't make that uh, get and reach that gap. Uh, so I, that, that's my first kind of opening question uh, to the doctors. Well, the first problem is like, you know, the current uh, environment in terms of the heavy 
uh, you know, the, the, the heavy line in terms of, uh, um, you know, the approaches to deal with immigration has really impacted our communities. And the undocumented immigrants are the vulnerable, all the vulnerable, vulnerable population right now. And you, you know, on the ground, and they are not only, I mean, we have reports that they, you know, in, in other counties that the fear of even going, sending the kids to school, you know, going to the doctors. But, you know, I wonder now if it's also, you know, fears to, you know, seek care, even under this pandemic, condu you know, conditions, and what kind of access of care they're going to have, what kind of their services are going to get access to when everything is going to, is, is being curtailed right now, you know, so it, it, it is a, a, a deep, a, a very deep problem. Unfortunately, um, there's been some data coming out of NYU that mm -hmm. being Latin or Hispanic increases your risk of mortality. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that has to do with patients not coming in and seeking care until the very last second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fear to seek care. There's a fear related to the way that undocumented um, are currently treated. And I think this has been an issue uh, as long as I have been a provider, but it's much worse now um, that I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is, but I can definitely tell you that we are seeing that, that they're dying. They're not doing well. They're not coming off ventilators. They're not leaving ICUs. And we're definitely getting them much more ill than I would like to see them. Uh, can you unmute council member? Can we keep the council members asking questions unmuted? Okay, I think that's, thank you. And, and I think that the, um, the, the conversations that I wanna have here, um, and I, these are questions more for the administration, but the last question, and I'll, I'll hand it back to the chair, is when we think about revamping the healthcare system, and we are thinking about uh, FQHCs, for example, uh, the, fed the, the federal clinics in our neighborhoods. What role do you feel that they need to be playing in this transition? Uh, if, we, if they're moving into telemedicine, uh, what advice can you share with us to really demand of our local clinics? Councilmember Chuck, are you directing that question to a particular panelist, or uh, to either e either either of the doctors? Okay. Well, FHQ clinics are the forefront of you know the the services that immigrant population have, and especially undocumented um, populations or, or groups. So the the role is important, but I think like any strategy that is deployed or intended to be deployed should consult with community leaders to best address the difficulties and the, the big challenges that the communities are expressing and, and how to you know bring you know closer that gap and be able to rebuild the trust that the undocumented community is been losing over the years. Great. Thank you. I, and I mentioned that just because I think that's where we're seeing that in Red Hook and Sunset Park, uh, the, the bridge to the, the local clinics are, are, I think, where we're going to have to spend a lot of time and reconfiguring it. Uh, and it's going to require some resources from the city and some other big partnerships. Um, but thank you so much. And, and I, I'll, I'll save some questions for the administration later. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you so much, Councilmember Chaka. The next questioner is the chair of the Committee on Justice System, Council Member Lansman. Thank you very much. Um, and I wanna thank the, the, the panelists, the witnesses uh, for your really informative and important testimony. And, and Richie, thank you for having this hearing. Um, you know, the context for much of the conversation is the fact that uh, racism and, and racial disparities exist uh, and permeate uh, our, our healthcare system and the health that uh, people of color and communities of color uh, are able to have. And uh, from our perch at the Committee on the Justice System, 
uh, we know and see and deal with firsthand how that same uh, racial inequality and racism uh, permeates the criminal justice system. One of the issues that I and, and other colleagues who have uh, chair committees with responsibilities over different parts of the criminal justice system uh, have been grappling with have been um, the, the, the difficulty in getting people out of Rikers Island who uh, are at tremendous risk of getting a COVID-19 infection and, and having very serious and tragic outcomes, as well as trying to minimize the amount of policing that uh, uh, we're engaging in as a city right now, uh, in, in part uh, because of the vast racial disparities that exist there. So I, I'd be interested in hearing from uh, any of the witnesses your perspective on how we can uh, uh, inform the conversation, shape the conversation, ensure that the conversation about, for example, um, releasing people from Rikers Island who really should not and do not need to be there um, is uh, a question fundamentally of racial justice um, uh, as, as well as uh, uh, just a pure health issue. Member, is your question directed towards a specific panelist? No, any, I think any of the, the, the panelists can, can answer. Um, and if my question is so um, obvious or, or, or phrased in such a way that, uh, that an answer isn't required, that's, o that's okay too. Um, but I do think uh, I, and I know some of the other of my colleagues who've been involved in this issue uh, have been frustrated by, i put this carefully, by the lack of appreciation of how the racial justice injustices that, that permeate our criminal justice system are also manifesting themselves in who ends up being trapped on Rikers Island in the middle of a coronavirus crisis mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and who gets to, to go home and, and who's never been put through the criminal justice system in the, in the first, first place. Mm -hmm. So if any of the panelists or witnesses have anything to say on that, that's, that's terrific. If not, I will just leave it with, um, encouraging all of my colleagues and, and all of us engaged in this conversation uh, to be mindful that the injustices of the criminal justice system are exacerbating the negative outcomes for people of color and communities of color in the coronavirus crisis. I think that's a, a very critical point. Um, this is Dr. Ford. I believe that it is not a misstatement to say that to, to allow that kind of injustice to continue or to persist where racial and ethnic minorities or other groups are systematically exposed, however unintentionally, at higher rates than other groups or where they are systematically at risk is, is a more accurate way to put it. Is, Literally, I mean, we don't think of it as putting people, um, you know, placing people at risk, but that is essentially what we're doing by default. And I have actually stayed up quite a few nights lately thinking about the morality of it in addition to it being a public health issue. Um, so I do think it's important to convey that failure to, to release people is actually, um, is actually an action that's placing people at risk and not only placing individual people, but it's directly, it's, it's going to directly contribute to disparities. I think that reframing it as not a crime question primarily, but a question of health. And again, this goes back to rethinking on whom do we rely to address it? The, um, I think that's absolutely critical because the training, you know, we use the tools we have and it's important to think of the army that's addressing it as being the public health professionals, that army, not another army. And I, I'm hopeful that by shifting the orientation in terms of who's doing the work and who's, who's able to talk about being on that front lines and doing it, that that will help to shift the overall conversation as well. The, this is a very difficult set of questions that you're raising. 
but part of what makes it difficult is our insistence on framing it as a question about crime. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that an important way to, uh, an important thing to do is really to shift the orientation. And part of that is shifting who's doing the work um, because they will use the language of their field, you know, the community health workers, et cetera. Thank you. Richie, thank you very much. Of course. Uh, the next questioner is the health chair, uh, Councilmember Levine, who had a wonderful profile in the Washington Post. Councilmember Levine. Is the council member there? Hi there. Okay. Uh, apologize. Uh, th thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you for your leadership on this issue uh, and, and pushing this to the fore. Uh, this has been a really inspiring conversation, a disturbing conversation. Um, I, I, I want to ask about what I think is an emerging challenge in, and one of the greatest sources of inequity so far in this crisis, which is the difficulty in protecting your family if one member is sick. Yeah. Or those who are wealthy and have a large house, um, maybe you have a basement or a separate bedroom, and it's possible to isolate. But for those who have small apartments and large families, it's almost impossible. And in fact, this has been one of the main drivers of the spread of this disease. It's one reason why low-income neighborhoods, one of many, including so many others you've spoken about today, why low-income neighborhoods have had much higher rates of coronavirus. So the city needs to offer an alternative so that people can isolate safely from their families. And um, that, that is a great use of the many vacant hotel rooms that we have. And in fact, at least at some level, this work has begun uh, beginning last Wednesday. We are now offering um, these hotel rooms to the family, to some families who need it. I, I don't believe there's a, a member of the administration uh, still um, in this hearing. But as far as I know, they haven't reported yet on how many have uh, taken up uh, this option. Uh, but we're going to need many, many thousands of rooms so that no one has to be stuck in an apartment where they could risk uh, contaminating their family. And, uh, and, and the last point I'll make that perhaps I'll, I'll ask some of our, our uh, experts to weigh in on is the, the program that we're going to be building soon to trace contacts of everyone who's had exposure to the virus and ask folks to quarantine for 14 days at home um, and providing them their food and medication, et cetera, when they're at home. This is important because it's gonna allow us to restart the economy, but um, I'm really worried about how this is gonna play out in low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, I don't want this to feel, to be something that's imposed from above I want there to be deep community engagement at every single stage uh, of the design and delivery of this program. I, will, I think we need community-based organizations engaged, again, in the design and delivery, in the door-to-door -door work, in the delivery work, in the medical check-ins. Um, I, I can't think of, of, of a task which is gonna require greater sensitivity, uh, greater cultural, uh, awareness, greater language skills than this program. Um, and I'm talking about something that's huge that could require mobilizing thousands of staff people. Uh, so I, I just wanted to put that out there. If, if any of our panelists would like to weigh, weigh in, uh, I, I'll appreciate that. Um, and, and again, um, to, to Chair Torres, thank you for being an outspoken leader on this issue, um, for convening this important conversation I don't know if the speaker is still on, but I want to thank him as well for his incredible leadership on this issue. And to all my colleagues in the BLAC, um, what you've done to highlight this has been invaluable and I, I fully support you and, and grateful for your leadership. Thank you, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mark. It's nice to see you. Oh, thank you, Corey, thank you. Thanks. Our next, our next question is the Chair of the Education Committee, Councilmember Mark Traeger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all uh, the speaker and my colleagues and all the powerful 
uh, uh, panelists for very powerful testimony. Um, I, I wanna speak from an education lens for a moment and, my, and direct my questions to our esteemed doctors, physicians for their expertise. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, just to give some facts, we have about 1.1 million students in our school system. Three quarters of our students are at or below the poverty line. Uh, we have over 200,000 students uh, who uh, are with IEPs. We have over 100,000 students who are in temporary housing, over 30,000 students who are in shelters. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundred, over 100,000 students, multilingual learners who were traumatized by uh, national hostilities towards immigrant communities. During the pandemic, the inequities, the trauma have greatly uh, exacerbated uh, conditions. Uh, thousands of kids still have not been given access to learn. Um, and I would like to hear uh, your thoughts on the important role that licensed social workers play now more than ever to provide direct services to our students. We have a system of over 1.1 million students, but only about 1,500 or so licensed social workers. And social workers don't just take on cases of kids, they also become family social workers helping mom, dad, and those, and those at home as well. Uh, and also the role of nurses. Hundreds of our schools did not have, and still do not have, full-time nurses working in their schools and many communities such as in Coney Island or even Elmhurst, Queens, for example, um, their primary healthcare access point is the public hospital. Wouldn't it be something if you had proactive primary healthcare access points in your schools to serve as a community school? So if you could speak on that to bolster our argument that every school should be a community school with social full-time social workers and full-time nurses, I would greatly appreciate your expertise and support on that. Thank you so much. Those are important uh, thoughts. I mean, there is a wide, you know, body of literature that, you know, indicates that trauma is important in the long term for the health and development of a child, even the health as adult. So what our children are experiencing now is going to have long-term consequences if not enough resources are deployed in terms of mental health services and uh, health services in general. So uh, schools, for those uh, schools who have like, um, is, um, you know, a health, um, like nurses or uh, school health services, those are better equipped to deal with that. And, but you're right that there are many that don't have those resources. Certainly social workers are gonna be key, you know, to help navigate the, the children and their families through this and the impact because they, they, you know, right now we're seeing the impact in terms of, you know, infection and morbidity per se of the virus in our families. But a year from now, two years from now, we're gonna have the impact on the psychosocial and economic component. Correct. And what are we going to do? We need to be prepared to mitigate that, especially in our low income uh, communities and our communities of color. Thank you. Thank you. And do you, in, in generally speaking, support the idea of having our schools being really uh, reimagined as community schools uh, with full time supports? such as having adequate social worker to student ratios, having adequate full-time nurses to student ratios, because for many communities, particularly communities of color, low-income communities, the school is the primary access point for very key services for children mm -hmm. and for families. And if we keep depriving them of these vital services in the healthcare industry and other industries, in many cases, the school is the access point for fresh food, fresh produce. And so as we see right now in this crisis, schools are the meal sites. So mm -hmm. if do, do doctors uh, on, on the panel support the idea of really reimagining our schools as community centers, community schools, where learning and uh, nutrition and healthcare and, tra and trauma-informed measures to provide direct therapeutic services to address the trauma that this 
pandemic has greatly exacerbated even before the pandemic and certainly during the pandemic. And I, again, thank you all in the chair for your time. It's an, it's an interesting you know, approach. And I think, you know, we were talking before about how we reimagine the health, you know, the health system, the health delivery system. I think everything needs to be reimagined now and how, how we're gonna prevent for the further disparities to increase and prevent another disaster like the ones we're observing now. Thank you. We also Thank see that a lot of our children are receiving most of their resources through the school anyway, and it's been mm -hmm. successful already. So why not continue in that vein to ensure that our, our students don't end up becoming, you know, adults with chronic conditions that we could have prevented in elementary school or in middle school. Thank you. Thank you. My understanding is that, thank you, Councilmember Traeger. My understanding is we've been joined by the public advocate. Uh, uh, public advocate Williams, are you here? I am, can you hear me? Yeah, honored to have you here and uh, you're feel free to ask questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. I wanna thank you, uh, Chair Torres, for uh, being here and bringing this up and the leadership you've shown as well as uh, our speaker. Um, and I think everyone who's on the panel uh, representing them, themselves as frontline workers or representing others. I really wanted to be here today to just make sure that I was on the record putting some of this disparity in context just from, from my office. And I wanted to make sure that I, I was abundantly clear because like all of you and all of us, I know I have grown more aggravated uh, as the time passed by. Uh, as we crossed the 20,000 New Yorker who has lost their lives, uh, these numbers didn't have to be this way and certainly the disparity didn't have to be this way. I just want to be on the record and the council of this body to be clear that this, yes, has something to do with uh, an unintelligent racist in the White House, which I'm clear about, uh, but this also has very much to do with our local leaders in the name of uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio and especially Governor Andrew Cuomo, who asked for and received unprecedented powers. And that can't go without any accountability. Uh, because what we had was truly three cisgendered white males who were in executive positions to make decisions. They didn't even have people around them when they're having these press conferences, and we can see that. And the people who are hurt are the people who look so much different than them. And we never had a clear message for a lockdown. Uh, we never had a bold message, and we never adapted to the data as we got it. I recall the mayor not shutting down the schools, um, the mayor equivocating on St. Patrick's Day, the governor, specifically his words, we don't wanna use shelter in place because we don't wanna scare people. Spending days to name it pause, spending days to put pause in effect. He wanted to turn the dial to use his words, 25%, 50%, 75%. <clears throat> Many of us at that time said there is a human cost to this inaction. And we are seeing that human cost now. Uh, they both, those men put forth policies uh, that were different. And so for certain segments, they said, we are going to, uh, you have to shelter in place or telecommute. The people who can do that either went to the Hamptons where their rent was raised, so many people went there, or they stayed home in Manhattan where they can have groceries delivered to them and pharmacies delivered to them because they had that infrastructure. The rest of the city were told that you are now essential workers. Uh, you cannot telecommute, you have to go home. You have to go to work and come back. On top of that, you're gonna to go to work and come back with no personal protective equipment. And on top of that, you're gonna to go to work with no personal protective equipment and we're not even gonna test you. The decisions of where to put the USNS Comfort, where to put the field hospital in Central Park instead of Van Calden Park or Prospect Park were made by these two men. Just a week or so ago, they discovered where NYCHA was. Uh, and so the decisions, and so I wanna applaud the two of them <clears throat> for actually trying to get resources more from the federal government but the decisions of where those resources went in this city and in this state was a decision they made. The decision to not close down the city was a decision that they made. And so it's just aggravating to watch folks on TV pretend as if the decisions they made did not cause this disparity. You don't get to hide behind saying that these communities had a lack of health resources beforehand uh, or that we have a dense city. All of those things were known before COVID was here. COVID has exposed it. The question is, what was the plan 
for the least among us? What was the plan for the nursing homes? What was the plan for the incarcerated? What was the plan for the vulnerable communities? We had none. And we're now just trying to implement something. As a matter of fact, the governor said, we don't have time to deal with the incarcerated. He said the nursing homes are not his job. I wanna make sure that accountability for the people who made these decisions, one, because that's what leadership is. And two, as we move forward with the same people who brought us to the situation, if they will not even admit to the mistakes that were made, how are we then corrected to move forward? And uh, this is something that is eating at me every single day because there are those of us who pleaded and begged and did whatever we could to make swifter, bolder decisions. That never happened. And so now we have two thirds of the top zip codes that were tested were in white wealthier neighborhoods while the people who were dying were in black and brown communities in the Bronx, in Queens, and in Brooklyn. What data were you using? I'm glad that the BLAC, my office, and others asked for this data. We're now asking for data from the NYPD of who's getting summons and who's getting arrests. And I assure you, we will see a disparate uh, impact there as well, because the NYPD can't solve this problem by themselves. It needs to be a communal enforcement. That's hard to do when the mayor and the first lady are going walks in the parks, when liquor stores were open, when constructions were open. So I'm thankful to the administration for the task force that many of us asked for to be put in place. There's still questions about when they're gonna be put in place, who it's going to be. I'm happy to work with Deputy Mayor Thompson. I would not have chosen the first lady as a co-chair, but I wanna move forward. Uh, we'd like to know uh, if we're gonna see an impact in this year's budget. Uh, and in the time frame for some of the recommendations. If we don't get those questions answered, uh, the task force may not be worth much. I just wanted the opportunity to make sure that was on the city council record. I thank this body for having this conversation. And I'm looking forward to when the administration will be here so we can ask them why they moved so slowly, if at all. But thank you all to the panel. Thank you, uh, Chair Torres and Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Our, our next questioner is Council Member Barron, the Chair of the Committee on Higher Education. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Oh, I think, okay, can you hear me? I can, I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanna thank you for having this uh, important gathering and for all of the persons who are here. I just wanna be on the record, we talk about getting on the record that what we're looking at in terms of the disparate numbers of Blacks and Latinos who are being recorded as uh, being infected and in fact dying from this disease is not looking at the symptoms of their having uh, those social determinants of good health in low numbers. It's not just looking at the fact that, yes, the increased numbers of those who have heart conditions and chronic conditions and diabetes and uh, asthma, those are symptoms of the result of systemic racism that we have been subjected to since we have been here. And until we look at changing all of that, doing away with those systems and putting in place new systems that are going to be more equitable in providing the services to our communities that they need, we're gonna continue. I still say that we need to, as someone, one of the panelists said, get increased testing. One of the panelists said, testing is the gateway to everything else that's going to come because it will determine how the resources are going to flow. So I commend uh, those council members, the BLAC, who has said that that is a priority. And we're hearing all oh, the numbers of testing is increasing. I want to see that that is in fact the case because people are still saying they want to get tested and are not getting tested supposedly because they don't have all of the criteria that would uh, necessitate the agencies saying, okay, you're going to be allowed to have this testing. So I think that it's important that we on the ground, those organizations that have validity and credibility with our communities, be at the forefront of providing the leadership. Uh, with all due respect for bike lanes and everything else, no one in my community said that they thought a response to the disparate number of infections and deaths would be ameliorated by a bike lane. 
and until our communities are the ones making the decisions and saying what it is that we want to see in our community and getting that response until that happens we're going to again be at the mercy of those who are sitting in these positions to make those decisions to say oh we're going to give you this we're the great benefactors we're going to give you this and until black people and brown people who are the ones being most disparately infected in a negative way are the ones who say what it is they want to see and how they want to see it implemented and the priorities of them coming down we're going to be uh, expanding this, the same disparities that we're facing now as i've asked people in my community they're not concerned about a bike lane they want that money to immediately be put into testing immediately be put into the conditions that they are facing when they are told to isolate and they're going back to crowded conditions and don't have the ability to move to another room of the house and we want to see long range we're talking about the immediacy of what we're facing as well as the long term change of the systems so that we are no longer uh, subjected to living in conditions that have us with limited economic opportunity so that we don't have a health care plan that allows us to be able to get the uh, responses to our needs in our community. So I want to thank the panel. I've heard that from the panel. And I want to say to my colleagues, we have the opportunity to make sure that we steer this movement in a direction that's responsive to what we see happening in our communities and making sure that those funds get directed to, to those uh, opportunities and systems that will ensure that we as a people begin to get some equity in what it is that we're facing in terms of the poor health, the uh, limited access to food, the uh, unsatisfactory or inadequate health systems that are in our community, as well as those other things that have been mentioned, education, the over-policing. We already see a disparity in how uh, our community is responded to when we so-called don't distance appropriately and other communities get responded to. So I want that on the record. I want to encourage my colleagues to be strong. I want to encourage my colleagues to comment on things that are given to us, saying that this is what the black and brown community will need to move out of the disparities and say yay or nay or say ask us first you know ask us as a black and brown community what it is we want to see and i want to thank the panel for their contributions and i support my colleagues as we stand strong as we move forward in these budget times and that we call out those persons in power who cut money to hospitals who cut the programs for health, but yet and still stand on a grand stage and talk about how we're helping to fight this pandemic in New York State. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. The next questioner is Councilmember Brannon. Councilmember, are you with us? I don't think Councilmember Brannon is here. Councilmember Ayala? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, actually, but very fitting that I go after Inez because I, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with every single thing that, you know, she has said. Um, you know, no one has come to us to ask us anything in our communities. Um, I'm really horrified at the thought of what the next, you know, few years is going to look like um, in terms of, you know, uh, our constituents' mental health. Um, the chair of the mental health committee and so you know for obvious reasons this is something that is really um near and dear to my heart but we are not hearing from anyone and access to mental health is already a problem in a pandemic it's virtually impossible to seek help uh we have nyc well which is is, is great it's a great program um, but we don't have, there's no one in our communities, there's no one speaking to our constituency. Um, and that's a, that's a huge problem, especially when we have families that are uh, losing loved ones 
and not even being allowed an opportunity to grieve appropriately, where we have families that are losing employment and then having to worry about how they're going to make rent, how they're going to buy food, how they're going to care for their families. Um, the, the overwhelming amount of stress that is being imposed on all of us. I mean, I am, you know, I'm, I'm oftentimes, you know, feeling uh, quite, you know, depressed as well, right? Um, I have an outlet, I have people that I can speak to, I'm very fortunate in that way, but not everybody has that. Uh, my husband and I developed COVID and my mother who lives with us subsequently developed it as well because we live in a household where there are seven members and even though we have a three bedroom apartment, it's not the biggest apartment, it's not small enough, but she suffers from mental health issues and she was uh, secluded to a space in the house by herself now because everybody was kind of quarantined and that was eating at her. You know, she was going insane. And so she kept breaking into our room, which is how probably she, she got it. Um, but she said, Um, house um, and not be able to speak to anyone, right? She doesn't go on the computer, right? She's not computer literate. Um, she can only call but so many people a day. I was really eating at her. And so I'm really concerned about uh, what this looks like for our mental health. I'm concerned about young people. We don't talk enough about our young people. They have lost every single outlet. They don't go to school anymore. And I use my, my own children. I love to use my family as an example of everything. But um, I have three three uh, teenagers at home, two 18-year-olds and a, and a 14-year-old. And they normally don't go out. But they, they release all of the social emotional needs at school, right? And so when they come home, they are fine. They've satisfied whatever you know they needed to satisfy throughout the day. But they don't have that anymore. And so you know, who we're not really addressing um, our young people in that way. We're not considering, you know, all of the sacrifices that they've had to make, um, that they will no longer graduate, that they don't see their peers, that they don't have um, access to that connectivity. And so I wonder if this is, you know, something that in your fields you're, you're hearing, um, something that you're paying attention to. Um, we're obviously, you know, really concerned at the council and we'll be, you know, look forward to having um, hearings on this to learn more about what that looks like, what does mental health look like for first responders, what does it look like, you know, for families, but really curious to see what the panel um, has to say about that. I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that I have to leave and it's been a privilege to participate in this conversation and I'm happy to afford my remarks and um, I'm happy to respond to specific questions in the future if they come up. Excuse me and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ford. I don't work with pediatrics um, specifically, but uh, some of my colleagues obviously do. And this has been um, definitely very much on their minds. Uh, this and the health of frontline workers, those who are related to frontline workers, um, and the other question is, you know, what are we going to do in the recovery phase? We're going to have a lot of people who are very ill for a very long time um, that are going to have what we expect to be pretty severe disabilities that are going to require um, care as well. So I think the recovery phase is going to be, um, if not as stressful, more stressful than what we're currently going through now, because it's also uncharted territory. Uh, we're trying to stay abreast of mental health and make sure to recommend it when possible. Um, but again, with the risk of people transmitting the disease, how best do we do that? How do we keep people safe? How do we get mental health into people's homes um, is a question that remains for all of us. But it's definitely a question that we are talking about. It's an issue that we're trying to um, answer for our patients and provide some management. Uh, Council Member Ayala, do you have any more questions or? I don't. Thank you, no, Councilwoman. Thank you. Uh, the next questioner is Councilmember Rose. Councilmember Rose, are you? Can we unmute Councilmember Rose? Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I, I want to thank you, uh, Chair Torres, for having this hearing. Um, it's very timely. Um, in fact, it's overdue. Um, and I want to thank the speaker for, um, for giving this such importance. Um, 
I, I think I want to thank all of the doctors who testified today um, as to um, relating it back to historic and systemic racism. I think we can't address any of these issues unless we address them. Um, Dr. Kamara talked about um, the historical significance of, of how we kind of arrived there. And um, we can't address the density and housing and the close uh, capacity that people have to live in without addressing redlining and gerrymandering and gentrification. Um, these are all issues that we have not um, had, I think, the courage to talk about here um, in New York City. Um, I live on Staten Island, and those are very real issues, even up until today. And so I wanted to talk about, you know, um, it was said that access to, um, to testing and to care is paramount to stemming you know, the spread of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, and testing was, was a key. And in all of the communities of color, that was, that was absent. There was no testing available in Staten Island. The only testing that was available was a drive-through, which was all the way on the other side of the island where people who don't drive didn't have access to. We, are, we were not addressed in our communities because we don't have a public hospital. And in the absence of a public hospital, we were totally, totally left out of any plan that the administration came up with because we didn't have a public hospital. And so we have two private hospitals, which were very small um, fish in a huge pond in private hospitals. And we were denied um, resources early on and, um, and protective equipment for our workers. We are isolated twice. We're isolated as a community of colors, but we're also isolated geographically. Um, we're not even considered in any plans because we don't have a public hospital. And so my, my question is, how is it that we can talk about access to care and um, we can eliminate total populations um, based on the fact that there is one, not a public hospital and two, by, by geography. And I wanted to ask the doctors if in fact they found if capacity was an issue or had a disparate impact on the level of care that communities of color receive. And, um, and if so, um, how do we, how do we com combat that? And we also, um, how do we get culturally competent care? Because we have a federally qualified health center that was working in our communities and the, the community of color, and they were not given the equipment or the, the PPEs, uh, masks, or the tests that they needed. They had a very small, um, limited amount. They were issuing them in our NYCHA project, and they were then following up to make sure that people had food, that they had access to medication, and that they would check on them periodically since the hospitals would not take them because of a capacity issue. Can you tell me how we are supposed to address, um, address access to healthcare um, with these types of, of, of limitations put in place? And, um, and I'd really like to hear if you found or felt that there was any um, disparate impact on the communities of color based on capacity, on, on the healthcare system ability, capacity issues. Thank you. Do any of the panelists have a response? Uh, Councilman Rose, do you have a are you directing your question to a particular panel? I, I was hoping that one of the doctors that um, had been on the front line in this um, pandemic could, you know, could answer my question, especially about uh, capacity. 
or lack of capacity and its impact. So I'm not a doctor, I'm a nurse practitioner, um, but I can tell you that from my experience, the, the units are way beyond capacity, um, doing one and a half to two times more patients than they should be. The nursing staff are taking six patients to a nurse in an ICU where the setting is typically one to two patients in the ICU. Um, we're turning operating rooms into ICU beds. We're putting units that typically don't have critical care capacity and turning them into critical care units. So yes, we are way beyond capacity. We are also redeploying nurses to areas where they have never practiced before. You now have um, physicians and nurse practitioners taking care of specialties they've never managed before. And although you know we get generalized training um, in med school and as nurse practitioner students, your specialty becomes what you know. And so has this affected um, the provision of care? Likely. Um, to what degree, I cannot say, but um, I can definitely tell you that the way that we're delivering care is not the ideal way to provide care in this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. Uh, the next questioner is the chair of the Public Housing Committee, Alika Amprey Samuel, followed by uh, Councilmember Brandon. Uh, Councilmember Amprey Samuel, are you here? Hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Chair Torres, as well as um, Speaker Johnson for um, putting together this hearing. What we're talking about today is really a highlight of what many of us have been screaming and yelling and fighting about for the past nine weeks. And as a chair of the Public Housing Committee, and more importantly, as a Black woman living in a low-income Black community, um, caring for a school-aged child and a very fragile mother, mentally and physically, um, and with, I feel, an entire community on my back, this has been a nightmare. Not only do I represent the highest concentration of public housing in the country, I have thousands of seniors who live in HUD 202 buildings and families who are living in rent control buildings, rent stabilized buildings, and they have always struggled before COVID-19. And it didn't take a rocket scientist to see that a virus that attacked the lungs would have a serious impact on the families that I represent. And the time that it took to even get the attention we needed two months later is just outright disrespectful and a total disregard to humans in need. And the people in my district were just flat out not a priority at all. And many lives were lost that could have been saved. And when I look back at just the first map that the city released that highlighted the percentage of patients testing positive, that map was released on March 26. And it didn't even list the Brownsville community on it. So when we talk about being left out and forgotten, that map dated March 26 is a clear indication of certain communities just being forgotten. So the data has always been there. We knew exactly who would bear the greatest burden during this pandemic. And yet black and brown communities were left to fend for themselves for weeks. And now that we see relief efforts ramping up at the same time when we're talking about opening up streets and the governor talking about open up the state, and we're seeing press conferences over and over about hope being there and the numbers coming down, but yet we're still dying. And I know my uncle, Nathaniel Royal, died last night in Brookdale Hospital. And my uncle went to one hospital in the community, tested negative, he was in there for a week and a half, came home to a crowd apartment in Van Dyke houses with his mother who's 90 and two other uncles, and tested positive, went back to Brookdale and died within two weeks. He died last night at 722. And he is the 28th person that I know personally, loved and cared about who have passed away, personally, 28. And so we all grieve. So with that, my question was in align with what um, uh, Council Member Levine talked about and Council Member Ayala about 
overcrowded apartments. And we know that overcrowded apartments is a struggle and we see this every single day. But to say that, you know, how, um, hotels are opening up is not really a realistic um, uh, way to address this discussion, this issue. And um, when we talk about family members who have mental illness, um, you know, mental challenges, we can't say that a uh, caretaker is able, you know, if they test positive, then they can go to the hotel. Or we can't say that, you know, grandma who has a mental illness can be, you know, isolated in the hotel. We can't say that. So my question is, what is a realistic way to address overcrowding that we still see and people are still dying and this mental health issue has only exacerbated? What's a realistic way to, to for us to, um, to give real information and advice to families that live in overcrowded um, apartments and situations because hotels is not the answer um, at all. And families still have to work and families are still coming home to crowded apartments and families are still dying. Rest in peace to my uncle, Cato Nathaniel Royal who died last night in Brookdale. So that's just my question to anyone who is able to answer it, just a realistic um, answer. Um, I'm sorry for your loss. I have to tell you that um, many of my patients are going through the same thing. I spoke to a patient the other day who is taking care of her 85-year-old mother and her 94-year-old father, and both of them are COVID positive, and she is not. Um, there is no way for her to go. She cannot go stay in a hotel. They cannot go stay in a hotel. They require that she cares for them. I have patients who are parents of young children that are positive that they're caring for. They cannot leave home. Um, so the best that I can tell them to do is to do their best to wash their hands, keep their areas clean, make sure their children are doing the same thing, um, that they don't have people who are not in the homes with them coming in frequently, that they don't go in and out and expose themselves um, to other unknown sources of possible infection. It's, a, it's, it's definitely a tough situation and many of us don't have the option of isolating ourselves from our family members because we are caregivers. Um, it's, it's a double-edged sword, to be perfectly honest. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that's just been, it's, you know, and it's just a, a tough, um, it's a tough question and clearly, you know, something that is just really going to take a whole lot of people to figure out. We thought that, um, you know, providing the families in NYCHA with, you know, they came, they swooped in with the National Guard and dropped off um, sanitizer and masks, but it was one per apartment and not one per person that lived in the apartment. And there was no help or guidance with even the distribution. And I found myself out there pumping um, sanitizer into uh, water bottles um, um, as if we live in a developing country. Um, so, you know, I, I guess this is just a continued conversation that I look forward to having with my colleagues and folks from the task force that the mayor's office just announced to really figure out how to save the lives, um, you know, the folks that are still living and, um, you know, figuring out a way to, to help those families. So thanks, everyone. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Alika. Wish I could give you a big hug right now. I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah, Alika, thank you for just beautifully capturing what it means to be a woman of color in the face of COVID-19. That was just powerful testimonial. I want to call um, Councilmember Branner. I'm having trouble hearing the council member. No. Can't hear you, Justin, but it doesn't, it says you're unmuted, so I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe you try to mute and unmute yourself and see if that works. I think we can, go ahead, can we hear you? No, why don't you uh, log out and then log back in? Uh, in, in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, do you have any questions before we move on to the next panel? Uh, I do. Um, I don't want to spend too long. I wanted to kind of waive my time before and let members of the uh, council go before 
I went, but let me just um, go through a few. I first want to say thank you. I mean, these panelists have been unbelievable today. I'm just so grateful to all of them and their unbelievable expertise and guidance and everything that they've said. And I also want to thank the members of the council to hear from uh, so many members who have been personally impacted and whose communities have been ravaged uh, by COVID-19 is again, really, really powerful. Uh, I just want to ask a few uh, questions. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to, to, to kind of check in and see, and anyone can take this, from a public health perspective, what do you all think are the most effective strategies for engaging and communicating with communities that may be especially vulnerable uh, to COVID-19, such as communities of color? Uh, are there major gaps that you've been seeing from government leaders? Are there things that you think that we could be doing to improve communication um, to these hardest hit communities? And, and if anyone wants to take that, um, I don't know if there's anyone, I don't know if, uh, if uh, Dr. Maya Clark uh, Kutea, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, uh, if you wanna uh, answer that question. Sure, um, this is pretty much the patient population that I work with um, most often. And I think what I've found is that relationships mean a lot. Mm -hmm. Knowing the community, knowing the needs of the community means a lot. Spending time in the community means a lot. Making sure that the community understands that what you say you're going to do, you actually do, means a lot. Coming back and telling my, my community what my results were from the work that I've done seems to mean a lot. And those things have made an impact in terms of being able to have conversations with patients and have them come back to me with concerns um, and needs of our community. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. In addition, I would like to add that, you know, engaging the community uh, and the expertise of community, community health workers. Community health workers traditionally have been a tremendous resource in terms of educating our communities, linking them to resources and being a trust source of, um, you know, information as well as, you know, the linkage to health services. So from the public health perspective, you know, leveraging the community health workers that, you know, are engaged already in the system via uh, community health organizations or um, health services uh, would be a way to go. Thank you. And, and do you all think that the city has been sufficiently forthcoming with data, uh, with public health data uh, on a day-to-day, -day, week to week basis in ways that are helpful to researchers who are studying the impact of the disease, especially the impact on communities of color. Uh, how would you all um, sort of grade the city as it relates to the data that they've put out to be able to help researchers and clinicians and scientists who need to use that data to understand these impacts? That's a great, um your question. Um, certainly, you know, seeing the daily updates from the city in terms of, you know, numbers of uh, cases uh, being tested and positive, being hospitalized and, and the death is important. But I think there has been an, a gap, especially at the beginning, in showing how this was disproportionately affecting community of colors. And I think that needs to change. I think it would be a a great resource for the not only the you know the scientific community but also the, the public health community in terms of knowing the actual data how many people have been able to be tested how many people are, couldn't get access to that of those uh, deaths that they were not originally you know attributed to COVID death because they died at home are, were they related to the infection or not? So what is happening? I don't think that was that uh, much of information on, on that regard. Thank you. I see David Jones raising his hand and he's not been on this panel, but he is one of the, uh, I think, most important leaders in New York City and is the head of course for the Community Service Society. So I'm gonna unmute him and David, if you wanted to answer that question, go ahead. 
Yeah, we, we've been concerned about this because the city stopped reporting uh, on a timely basis uh, the, ratio, the demographic uh, impact of death and, and uh, people going into the system. We would urge the council to say the city has to start giving uh, accurate, almost daily reports on how this is hitting. We can't operate in this sort of, oh, this is the gross number. We have to take it by race and, and locality to really be effective here. So I would urge this is something the council can leverage the city to do. It would be enormously helpful to people to understand what's going on. Also. Thank you. And I wanted to ask, I'm glad that the city and state are starting to focus on the need for contact tracers. You've seen the announcement that the governor made with former Mayor Bloomberg about needing to hire up uh, what they've called an army of contact tracers. But I think uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Carmen Esasi just said this, so I don't want to be repetitive, but I think it's an important point to make. We need to make sure that we hire people who are culturally and linguistically competent for communities all across New York City. You need someone who speaks Bengali for the Bengali community. You need someone who speaks Yiddish for the Orthodox Jewish community. You need someone who speaks Spanish. You need someone uh, who speaks Tagalog. You need someone that speaks to all of these communities. And I wanted to just see if you all think there are ways that we should be thinking about recruiting and advertising to make sure we are getting contact tracers that will actually be able to communicate effectively throughout all communities in New York City. And if you have seen, you may not have seen, but if you've seen any other cities that we should look to as models on how to do effective contact tracing for an extraordinarily diverse uh, public. So any, yeah, any I, thoughts on recruiting and advertising and any other cities that we should look to that have done this effectively on getting the right type of people to become contact tracers? Yeah, I haven't seen um, you know, other cities effort just yet. Uh, but but something to add to the list of you know cultural sensitive is also sensitivity about like uh, docu you know uh, documentation status uh, because people are going to be afraid to respond if you're going to be you know calling somebody and ask who you been in touch with who are you you know where uh, you know had dinner with or who you visited who lives at home what if these you know families have members who are not documented mm -hmm. and how are they going to be reliable answering that when there are fears that that would trigger you know uh, putting at risk um you know their their families to be deported or, or detained because of the documentation status so i think you know that has to be added to the training in sensitivity that uh, all these you know tracers need to be need to receive uh you know where to advertise college you know community colleges community centers you know community health organizations you know all these community centers that are around the you know the neighborhoods and and have people who may qualify for these those are great venues to try to hire people that are representatives from the community and are you know, vested in the health of the community. Thank you. And, and I apologize. I'm not sure I can see all of the panelists or people that have been speaking. So if they're, that, that spoke before so eloquently and wonderfully. So if there are other people that, that I can't see right now who were testifying before on this panel that wanna answer, I'm happy to hear from other folks as well. Okay. Um, Lastly, just a last question, uh, and I think you've talked about some of this in your opening statements, uh, but also in some of your responses to the council members today, <clears throat> but just a kind of a, a broad answer, a kind of an overview. From what you have seen, uh, what does the city need to do better? What else can we be doing now? Of course, we understand the long-term issues and the long-term disparities and the glaring and gaping holes in our social safety net and in our healthcare system. But immediately today, uh, in the next three days, in the next week, 
what are the things the city can be doing more of and what can we do better in the days ahead? As it relates to communities of color, low-income communities, immigrant, dense communities, what else should we be doing? Well, I think the first is to protect better our essential personnel, you know, and give them the, what they need in terms of protection, making sure that the guidelines and the recommendations and for everybody who is working on a grocery store, for everybody who is now reporting to a construction site, for everybody who is, you know, delivering food uh, that has the protective, um, you know, equipment that they need to remain healthy. And, uh, and you know, continue the testing you know, centralize in those places that most of you have highlighted in terms of, you know, housing, in terms of nursing uh, homes, the most vulnerable now. So those are the things that we need to focus immediately. I would agree and um, piggyback on that and say that testing is going to be key and education is going to be key in these communities. Um, letting these communities know how to keep themselves safe what to do if they feel that they're becoming ill, where to safely seek treatment, how to seek treatment, um, what to do if they can't speak for themselves. There's a lot of education that really needs to, that really needs to happen solely around self-care and how to take care of themselves in addition to ensuring that patients can get tested so that we then know where the resources need to be dispersed. Thank you. And before I turn it back uh, to uh, Chair Torres, I just for a moment, because I can't stay on the rest of the hearing, I have to uh, go lead a budget negotiating team, uh, a two and a half hour meeting on the city's budget on another Zoom conference. But I just wanna take a moment, and there are a lot of people that I see on this call that I could call out uh, who have been uh, friends and wonderful. I see former borough president Virginia Fields, uh, who, who is uh, wonderful. But I wanna take a moment and just thank Oren Barzilay, who is uh, the president of local EMS union 2507 and his workers have his his amazing amazing members have been the ones who have been going door to door home to home as EMTs that have been going in and saving thousands and thousands and thousands of New Yorkers and in many instances without the proper personal protective equipment that they need his his union has suffered a tremendous number of losses uh, during this time. Uh, it is scary for uh, these EMTs who are not being paid a fair wage. Instead of, you know, talking about a, a, a ticker tape parade, which may be nice at some point, we need to pay our EMTs appropriately for the work that they do and cover them and their families. So uh, I want to just thank Oren and his union and his members for all of the compassion and hard work, working double shifts, not seeing their families afraid to go home because they've been exposed and they're gonna potentially expose their children or loved ones. I saw a story last week of a young uh, EMT who uh, died by suicide, uh, you know, John Mondello. So, you know, I just wanna thank you, Oren, for, for everything that you have been doing and everything that your members have been doing during this time and we want to make sure that you all are not just thanked with our words but that you are appropriately and your members are appropriately compensated for the work that you all do. I unmuted you for a moment. I know you're going to testify in a second and before I go I just wanted to recognize you and thank you for everything you're doing. I, I sincerely and genuinely appreciate that. Thank you so much uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, that means a lot not just to me but to all our members. Uh, you guys are the backbone of our city, and to hear this come out from City Hall all the time, uh, it means it's tremendously valuable to our members. So thank you. Thank you for Anything that recognition. Anything we can do, Oren, to be of help, and I know you're going to testify with some things that you need, but anything we can do, let us know. We know that so many of your members, again, are people of color, are women, uh, yeah. women of color, who are these essential workers that are on the front line literally saving thousands of people's of lives every day. And for the first few weeks of this unbelievably painful uh, moment in New York City, you saw people just talking about hearing siren after siren after siren through the streets of New York City. 
And we know that people were driving those ambulances. We're in the back of those ambulances, keeping people alive. And those are your members. So I just want to give my deep gratitude from the entire city council uh, to you and to your union and to your members and anything you need, we want you to let us know. Absolutely. Thank you again. I'm, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to turn it back to you, uh, Chair Torres. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before we move on to the next panel, I just want to explain that we're going to take the input that we gained from the panelists to inform our next hearing, which will focus on cross-examining the administration's plan for addressing racial disparities. And so I'm curious to, to, the, to the panelists, what question should we ask the administration at the next hearing? What's the most important question we could ask? I would want to know about testing yeah. and resources so that you can ensure that you get resources to your to the community. Yeah, I, I was about to say the same thing, the testing and the um, and about the plans for protecting essential personnel. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie, can you call up the second panel? Sure, thank you, Chair, and thank you to our panel again for testifying. Our next panel will consist of Bertha Lewis, David Jones, Theo Oshiro, C. Virginia Fields, Frankie Miranda, and Joanne Yu. A few reminders, council members who have questions for anyone in the panel, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and the chair will call on you after all the, these panelists have completed their testimony. Once the chair calls on you, please specify which specific panelists you are directing your question towards so the panelists knows who's, who should answer. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and then you can begin your testimony. Once you are finished, please remain on the line as we will open it up to council member questions once all members of this panel have delivered their testimony. When council member questions begin, panelists and council members who are asking questions, if you could please leave your mics unmuted if possible, just to facilitate the flow of the conversation. Going forward, each panelist will have three minutes to deliver their testimony. First, I would like to welcome Bertha Lewis to testify, who will be followed by David Jones. Bertha? Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Can you see me? Because I, I can't see myself. I can hear you, but I cannot see you. Uh, somebody took my video off. I don't wait, you know, I don't know. Uh, start my video. Hey, I here I am. This is the first time I've ever done this Zoom thing. I'm old, you know, so thank <laughs> you. Um, so, um, I've been listening in and I'm going to tell you right now, my, my opening testimony is five minutes. So that's all I got to say about that now. <laughs> but I do want to thank you all for inviting me to talk about uh, some of the racial and economic disparities that's been exposed today uh, by this pandemic, this plague, as our president says, and to do just what needs to be done. So one, I think there are five important things. You need to fund an independent study to document exactly what happened during the course of this pandemic. And let me be clear, when I say independent, I mean independent and I mean outside the control of the city and its leaders, that means you. You gotta consolidate the various databases that are used to keep track of testing, infections, hospitalization, treatments, and deaths. This is an especially important in times like this, but it should also be the way going forward that things should be done uh, when we return to so-called normal times. You've got to establish a new Office of Pandemic Research and Response. The need for such an office became apparent shortly after the pandemic began. And that need is not going away anytime soon. We had one, uh, you know, novel corona, there's going to be more. Establish new healthcare programs to address the various needs that are identified during the course 
of the independent study and work with New York State's congressional delegation to ensure that all future federal funds are distributed through municipalities rather than through federal agencies and large destructive banks. Let me just jump ahead. Um, I've sent my full testimony where I elaborate on each of these five things, but I'm just gonna jump to my personal experience. To begin with, I'm a trifecta. I'm definitely over 50. I am obviously black and I have diabetes. Because I have diabetes, I undergo dialysis treatments three days a week. Those treatments take place in a dialysis center where I am in a room with 19 other patients undergoing similar treatment. All of these people are people of color. And some of these folks um, are COVID positive. All right, so here. Um, even though our group is one of these, you know, big groups that are so-called at risk, uh, tests are not being conducted. Now, you all blew nursing homes when everybody knew the first folks were elderly with underlying conditions. There are over a hundred dialysis centers in New York City. 46,800 people are treated every single week and yet no testing is done at these centers and you are not thinking about the healthcare workers that work in these centers. Why have we among the most vulnerable residents of this city been totally ignored? Clearly Mayor de Blasio has done nothing to take care of me during this pandemic, nor has Governor Cuomo. He's done nothing to, to help as far as I can determine. He doesn't even know if I've been infected or any of the other dialysis patients have been uh, infected. And sure as hell, our President Trump has not done anything to, do, to suggest that he's particularly worried about my health and safety, which means that you, you, City council members, you are our only hope. That's why I'm so happy you're having this. We could do a better job of these virtual things, but that's virtuality for you. Do whatever you can to ensure that every resident of New York City is able to get tested whenever they want in a location that is within walking distance of their residence. Second, you've got to ensure that we implement programs that will ensure that fewer minorities in this city are harmed by the next wave of this horrific disease. And that next wave, you know, good old Dr. Fauci told us is coming this fall. Third, you've got to commit to addressing the underlying problems that everybody has made abundantly clear that affect minorities. And fourth and most important, I want you to commit and I want you to commit right now, today, that you will do whatever necessary to ensure that when a vaccine is developed to prevent Corona-19, Ms. Rona, as we call her in the black community, that that vaccine will get distributed in a way that will ensure that minorities are not at the end of the line. If you do nothing else, do that. That is your job. So thank you for allowing me to voice some of my thoughts. I know some of you who know me, you might say, well, you know, she's, that's just radical. I understand that. Um, but the problems we are trying to overcome have become entrenched in every aspect of our lives and they can only be resolved 
if we are unwilling to embrace this concept of change. Unlike many people, you all that know me know I don't waste time while I'm in self-isolation wishing that we could get back to the way that things were as quickly as possible. The way things were weren't so good for me. I spend my time thinking about what can be done to make things better uh, than the way they were before. Let me just say also, City Council, Mr. Speaker, I know you gone now, but I don't know what your process is, but you need to be talking to each other because the stories that I heard shared today and the statements that I heard shared today by city council members, you already know the answers. You already know. So don't ask questions that you already know the answer to. Um, also, you already know that us that are on this panel have been talking about this stuff for forever. I don't know what kind of power you have, but you need to exert your power now. No budget, nothing moves until this caucus, this committee gets what it needs. You can't keep complaining. You're in office, you're in power. You are our only hope. Minority businesses are our only hope. To hell with the mayor's task force. Y'all know what that's all about. You tell these task force guy what you want and what you need. You already know it because you've all made statements about it. So thank you for, for letting me speak. I really am happy to be on with the rest of um, my uh, panel members and um, when you ask us questions, ask us short questions. Don't ask us questions um, that come behind a grand statement from each of you. Thank you all. Thank you, Bertha. I'm Council Janita John taking over for Stephanie Jones. Bertha, please remember to remain on the line as we will open it up to council member questions once all members of this panel have delivered their testimony. Next, we will welcome David Jones to testify will be followed by Theo Oshiro. So well, thank you, Mr. I'm Speaker now. and uh, Chair Torres. I'm David Jones. Obviously, I'm head of CSS and a member of the board of the MTA. Uh, I think the uh, prior panels have already covered a lot of what I would say. I had my staff prepare a long document that goes through a number of different initiatives, housing, health, paid sick leave, um, uh, criminal justice, so I'm submitting that. But I would like to put one thing out there. I've seen the governor's approach to budget and the cutbacks he's suggesting, and I've seen the mayor's uh, proposals. I think you and the council have to do an equity screen here because some of the cuts they're talking about <clears throat> directly impact the poor communities more than anyone else. Uh, I don't want to keep beating up on Mayor de Blasio, but his decision to cut summary with employment that uh, uh, Councilwoman Rose has always pointed out is perhaps one of the most devastating impact on teenagers, 120,000 of them who need work, have no school to look forward to, and are already loosely connected uh, to the labor market. That's not a good investment while you keep a ferry service running at deep subsidy. We got to have an equity. What are critical issues to keep this city viable? And what are sacred cows that you're unwilling to touch? I also think the, the governor came through with an expense budget with no suggestion of revenue, revenue raisers. All those ideas that many on the council have already put out now have to come to the fore. Yes, there has to be austerity. It has to be austerity that's going to be focused in areas that we can cut back in but it can't rip through education, healthcare, and the rest at the expense of everybody else because you don't want to touch those in influential areas where people have big money and can, you know, be political contributors. So we're, we have to come back to a billionaire's tax. There are 112 billionaires living in the city of New York as a one-time shot 
in World War II, World War I, in the Great Depression, people were asked to step up, at least in the short term, to provide revenues that are so vital. To have this business as usual is just totally unacceptable. So I'll leave that, I'll, I'll submit my te testimony. I've even suggested, now that we have such a great loss in the value of gasoline, let's start upping the, the tax on gasoline. Uh, not to the extent that it brings people back to $3 a barrel, uh, $3 a gallon, but we certainly could get a dollar on every one that's sent out. Something that is innovative, that applies to the state, that helps transportation, that helps healthcare, housing, and the rest of the critical needs of the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Please remember to remain on the line as we'll open it up to council member questions once everyone has testified. Next, we will welcome Theo Oshiro to testify, who will be followed by C. Virginia Fields. Theo? Time Thank starts. You so much. Uh, my name is Theo Oshiro. I'm deputy director at Make the Road New York. I want to thank the committee, uh, the chair, Richie Torres, uh, and the speaker for the opportunity to comment today. Uh, the communities that Make the Road serves are among the hardest hit by this crisis. Our largest base is in central Queens, uh, the epicenter of the epicenter where Elmhurst Hospital has been in the national spotlight, heroically trying uh, with few resources to save some of the most impacted community members in our city. Across all of our sites that Make the Road, our members and participants are dying. Many more of our staff and members are or have been sick and have lost family members. We have had to train frontline staff on how to help community members locate bodies of deceased loved ones. So those bodies can be located and tracked until it is possible to have a burial, if the family can even afford one. New York City areas where low-income people of color reside are the hardest hit. According to an NYU Furman Center analysis, neighborhoods with higher rates of confirmed COVID cases have lower median incomes and higher shares of residents who are Black or Hispanic. Notably, the analysis also confirmed what we already knew from our own direct experience. COVID-19 is more prevalent in areas where more people reside in crowded units, and there are higher rates of confirmed COVID cases in areas where less of the population is able to work from home. In the epicenter of the pandemic, the numbers are stark. Immigrant communities are among the hardest hit by COVID-19. Most New York City residents are employed in uh, essential jobs that are employed in essential jobs are immigrants. 54% of the total according to the Fiscal Policy Institute. Over a quarter of food and drugstore, 22% of social service, and a striking 36% of cleaning service employees do not have citizenship status. And that's according to the New York City Comptroller's Office. The impact of this in increased exposure combined with other factors is taking its toll. Latinx residents make up 34% of coronavirus deaths. It is clear, as others have said, that structural injustices that have been around for generations have now allowed this virus to decimate our communities. One particularly hard hit segment of our community are immigrant workers who are undocumented, as Council Member Menchaca raised earlier. Nearly one in six New York City jobs lost due to, due to the pandemic was held by an undocumented worker. And this is the population that had been and have been doing the most dangerous frontline jobs. No matter, no matter how many hours an undocumented worker has spent at a dangerous essential job, their family will not be able to access pandemic unemployment assistance if that worker dies after contracting coronavirus. They won't be able to access unemployment insurance, or in many cases, even food stamps. Time's expired. New York uh, let, let him finish his testimony. New York City must do everything it can to fill the gaps that will inevitably be left by our city and state governments. Charities have been stepping up, but this will never be enough to have a real impact on this community. The city should look for ways to provide real support to these communities at scale. I wanna echo uh, what my colleague, uh, David Jones was just saying about in investment in our communities. Uh, you know, at Make the Road New York, we've been working double time to address the needs of our communities and demand for our services has doubled. Uh, we've been on the phones and even though our physical spaces are closed, our, our, our staff are, are busier than ever to meet the complex needs of our members. Our organizations must still pay rent and other expenses that allow our staff to do their job. City, including discretionary contracts, should be as flexible as possible and continue to reimburse nonprofits for all their expenses in this critical time. 
We understand that uh, hard financial times are in our futures, but if our city cuts funding to crucial nonprofit service providers, epicenter communities will sink deeper into crisis. Uh, committee member Rory Lansman has spearheaded the Low Wage Worker Initiative, which is currently the only funding uh, we have enabling us to support immigrant workers who are essential workers and are also excluded from many forms of relief. This initiative and others like legal services for the working poor and deportation defense are more crucial now than ever and will be into the future. And of course, uh, health initiatives will be more important than ever. And when uh, we, we were talking about earlier about community health workers, and I wanted to uh, highlight uh, how crucial community health workers will be to, to our response as a city at Make the Road. Uh, we have trained community health workers for many years. And even before the pandemic, we have seen the, the critical ways and, and, and real high impact ways in which they've been able to improve health outcomes for community members. These are trained community members from the community that speak the language of the community who are able to have the trust of, of patients and uh, encourage them to adhere to medication uh, and also to make sure that, um, that uh, health outcomes generally for our communities are improved. Uh, and also, you know, another word on language access, which we talked about earlier. Our city has actually strong policies around language access not only from an executive order, but through legislation. And so the framework is very much there, uh, but investment is needed. You know, we've seen that even the, though the framework is there, uh, the language services that limited English proficient New Yorkers needed in this moment uh, fell apart. Uh, and and it, it has been because, uh, you know, adequate investment in the systems, the staff needed to provide those services uh, had not been as strong as it could have been. Uh, my testimony is longer uh, around other uh, very important health initiatives uh, and funding that needs to be preserved, but I'll, I'll submit that in, in the written comments. And I really appreciate the committee's time today uh, and thank you for uh, working on this crucial topic. Thank you, Theo. Uh, please remain on the line as we'll open it up to council member questions once everyone on this panel has testified. Next, we will welcome C. Virginia Fields followed by Frankie Miranda. See Virginia Thank, I'm sorry. Thank you. And in my four minute time, I wanna just address something that our earlier panelists talked about and that is the importance of data. Working with the New York City COVID-19 group that's comprised of many of the leading advocacy groups here in the city, we have presented or will be presenting to the city council, city mayor and governor some recommendations for enhancing data collection, the dissemination and the utilization of data to mitigate against growing health disparities in this epidemic here in New York City. And there are three areas that we think are important. We need data transparency so that we have information based on race, ethnicity, gender, age, language spoken at home, pre-existing health conditions and zip codes. That will help us know more better where to target our resources. And we know that in communities of color is where those resources need to go. We need enhanced data collection in collaboration with community-based partners. Given the unprecedented nature of this crisis, it is critical to collect additional data about cases in partnership with high priority communities. People who work on the ground, who know the needs of essential workers in our communities, like at the grocery stores, the pharmacies, the nursing homes and others. Collaborations with community-based partners will also be critical to fill the gaps in knowledge about populations in our community and hopefully began to address issues of overcrowding and well as people at risk of domestic and residential violence and those living in shelters. Thirdly, we need more routine communication regarding the efforts and the outcome. The city must work with communities and community groups representing our populations to discuss the data, share analysis reporting, and ownership of the findings. If the city is not able to provide this kind of information, B 
be transparent and tell us so that we're not expecting things that are not forthcoming. Fourth, we need attention to addressing unintended consequences of data dissemination. And third and lastly, we need clear application of data for policy, programs, and milestones. These specific recommendations with all of the details will be presented to the council, especially in light of this hearing today, about some very practical things that we should be doing around data and how data can help inform what it is we need to do in our communities. Lastly, let me say too, as Bertha said, I have been listening and Europe, this has been a most heartfelt and heartwarming uh, hearing today to hear the council members speak honestly about the lack of engagement of council members because the community is not being engaged to the point that we can identify who is being called upon and to hear the council members, especially council member Rose talk about what is happening out there in Staten Island. It is time to take action and we're prepared to do that. And on behalf of the New York City COVID, uh, New York City COVID-19 Working Group, we will be submitting these recommendations with the hope of moving us further, at least on the matter of data. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you for all of the members of the committee. And I've been sitting on this, but it has been most important, and I'm glad I stayed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Borough President. Thank you. Please stay on the line as there will be council member questioning once everyone has testified on this panel. Next, we'll welcome Frankie Miranda, followed by Joanne Yu. Frankie? Time starts thank now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Speaker Johnson, Chair Torres, and committee members. Um, the impact of COVID-19 in communities of color in New York City is staggering. Data from the New York City Department of Health shows that the virus is killing Latinos and Blacks in the five boroughs at twice the rate that is killing whites. Official public data is just now accounting for hundreds of men and women who have died of the disease in their homes. Indeed, when the worst of this crisis subsides, we will find that the signif a significant number of Latino New Yorkers, especially those whose immigration status was unsettled, avoided hospitals out of fear of incurring costs of care or falling victim to the anti-immigrant enforcement actions of the Trump, Trump administration. The economic impact of the pandemic is felt in a special and difficult ways in the Latino households across the city. As it was mentioned before by the doctors, Latinos and immigrants are less likely to have jobs that allow them to work remotely or about to buy social distancing rules. They are also more likely to suffer from food insecurity and lack of health insurance. The economic impact of this pandemic on the Latino community will be nothing short of devastating because Latino workers are overrepresented in frontline service sectors of the economy. They make up a sizable portion of the newly, the newly employed. As Councilman Menchaca and my colleague Theo mentioned, many of our people remain employed form of the backbone Backbone, backbone of what is now considered the essential workforce. Grocery store staff, cooks, caretakers, cleaners, delivery workers. To make matters worse, there are massive holes in the pandemic safety net, especially for the undocumented, mixed status families and people related to an undocumented immigrant whose jobs are disappearing, who are not eligible for an employment insurance who have no company sponsored health insurance to rely on and who won't be receiving support from the federal government. My point here in the last few seconds that I have is that if we are to effectively address this unprecedented crisis in the Latino neighborhoods and communities of colors of New York City, we must make sure that Latino community based organizations and, and communities of color organizations are front and center when it comes to resource allocations and interventions directed at our state's most affected population. Our nonprofits are deeply embedded in our neighborhoods, 
providing frontline health and human services to millions of, of New Yorkers, and they're also economic engines employing tens of thousands of people. I'm talking to my members every day and my colleagues like Joanne Joe, and all that we are seeing is that our organizations are not being funded or taken into consideration when some of these large decisions on food security and other areas are being decided as we speak. So we need to make sure that the response and the resources of the city reflect the face of this epidemic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, please stay on the line for council member questioning after our last speaker. And our last speaker is Joanne Yu, after which there will be council member questioning. Joanne? Time starts now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Torres, uh, all the council members, uh, council member Ambry, Sam Ambry Samuels. I'm so sorry for your loss. It's, um, your testimony was really touching. My name is Joanne Yu, and I'm the executive director of the Asian American Federation. And as we start to hold these hearings to figure out how we're gonna open our city. We are obviously seeing the disparities of the American class and caste system play out in the black and Latino communities who have paid a disproportionate price in terms of death and illness and job loss. And these outcomes are were inevitable as if we take into account the years of socioeconomic neglect and lack of funding directed at communities of color. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I wanna share with you what I, my, my member agencies are telling me, um, even before this pandemic, uh, as we Frankie and I've been on the speaking uh, path, um, our community organizations were always chronically underfunded, always one paycheck, you know, one month away from just not being able to pay our staff. We are worried about all the budget cuts happening, um, for and, and and the budget cuts that um, will happen on, on off the backs of this illness, uh, the virus, the um, David Jones, you know, as he mentioned about SYEP, this is a mechanism that helped to get low-income families out of poverty and to be able to help to build career ideas. And now, um, as that program got decimated, now our our nonprofit organizations are adding to the unemployment line, and we are scrambling to figure out what what we're going to do to help our kids. Um, the non one of the things I want to share with the council members, they, my, count, my member agencies are terrified that you are going to cut discretionary funding. For many of our, of the many, 70 nonprofit organizations that rep we represent, they, many of them receive discretionary funding, and that is what they're running their emergency COVID food programs off of. If discretionary funding goes away, they don't know what is going to happen. All of the programs that have been rolling out it is so obvious who is not at the table. Um, one of my members said to me, um, I'm using all my discretionary funds to be able to feed our seniors. Uh, we wanna contract with the state, we wanna contract with a re restaurant. They don't know, they don't, they've never done business at the city before. So now I'm filling out forms for them, yet I've never done it before. And so all of a sudden, um, you know, I'm a social worker, I wanna help my seniors. I'm not a contracts person, but I don't even know how to fill these forms out. And this is where we are. I wanna talk about, um, I know time is running out and I will submit my full uh, testimony, but I also wanna talk about the importance of public charge, you know, with, with Trump's policies, the Asian non-citizens um, are disenrolling at nine times the rate of Asian citizens. People who are eligible to receive this are terrified, so they are, well, they are disenrolling and we don't know how to make sure that they stay on so that they can get pro programs. Expired. I, I've served in my members and I've said to them, are they asking you public charge questions? And people are saying, absolutely. Every agency has said, yes, they're coming to me to say, I'm hungry, I'm out of, I don't have a job, but if I, please don't enroll me in public benefits because it means that I might have to have, there's going to be immigration consequences. So this is the concern of our um, community. I wanna talk about what Frankie mentioned about food programs. Um, contracts are getting, contracts are you know being written. Uh, people are getting money, nonprofit organizations. I know for a fact, none of those organizations look like people like us leading those conversations. We wanna make sure that we get food programs to our seniors. I am reading stories of seniors who are looking at pictures of seniors receiving bags of potato chips for their meals. I am, I read a Facebook post this morning of a young man who said he's raising money because he is, he says, you know, he realizes that the 
um, seniors he works with, they get bags of carrots as a meal. This is not a meal. This, the, the, the speed of how they had to implement this, I totally appreciate that. But why are they not using the resources that they have? That's all of us. There are millions, our, our seniors don't go to food banks. Our seniors cannot eat the meals that are given to them that's selected in a random basis. None of those contractors know any of our community members. And we've all offered up ourselves as resources. That is not happening. I know that um, I don't speak just for the Asian American small businesses. I speak for all communities of color, small businesses. These loan programs, we cannot ask people to take on more debt during this time, all the small business owners. They, you cannot ask them to put their workers on the unemployment line. Those loan and grant programs are not eligible to us. There is language capacity issues. There's cultural issues. Small business owners keep their receipts in a shoebox. They don't have accountants to be able to file picture perfect documentation. And so we are completely not within even the realm of uh, being able to file for you know PPE, PPP. Um, one of the questions that I get constantly, how do we access testing? And you know, we we have a lot of workers who live with five strangers. So if one gets infected, um, where do we send them? They're afraid to go home, and their their uh, roommates are saying they can't come home. Um, I know the city has a program to open up hotel rooms. How do we even access that? They have programs that we don't know anything about. How do we enroll our members in that? How do we get our people in that? I and I you know I appreciate everybody talking about the numbers of people who are impacted. Um, I looked at, there was a report yesterday of the South Asian community um, in Elmhurst, um, the South Asian community, the Bangladeshi community are the po poorest New Yorkers, and they are the frontline workers. And they are, the deaths are really high, but they're not counted because they're dying at home. They're dying at home because they can't go to the hospital. They're dying at home because they can't get tested. People have been rejected three, four times, and they just stay home and there's no way to bury people. It has been crazy out here. Other, the other question, um, thing I wanna address with you because you've all been our biggest supporters, e-bikes, undocumented community. You know, for many years, two and a half years, many of you stuck with me and fought with me to legalize these e-bike workers. The irony of the governor legalizing the e-bikes and then now they're being able to deliver food just before the pandemic hit. So all of a sudden, for two and a half years, these guys were vilified. And then, ta-da, magically, they are essential workers. They have no equipment. They're at the mercy of these billion-dollar corporations who are making the customers, you know, Grubhub sends me an email saying to me, can you contribute to the worker fund? Should they get sick? No, you have a $3 billion revenue. Go fund it yourself. Stop preying on immigrants. Our, our city... There is no way that they are not going to work with our cities and we need to, the council needs to step up and really put your foot down to say if you want to work here, you need to play by our rules. Um, the hate crimes. Um, I've asked NYPD, will you ever inform our community? It is never the job of the Federation and it is not our um, MO and our style to say we want to increase, you know, police interaction between all the communities of color. We started our own reporting site because NYPD let me scream by myself for three months. And now there, there's, a, uh, there's a workshop today and everything is moving now. But still, when people report, they don't even take it seriously. Um, I have instances where nobody ever thought that, oh, Asians are targets of race, racism and hate crime. Well, it's happening now. The, the small business numbers that declined, that happened early for us at 90% business decline in February when restaurants were closing because of racism. The mental health, I totally appreciate Councilwoman Ayala. She has been one of my most critical partners talking about mental health. People are calling, asking for help. Um, all of the Asian American, the three Asian American mental health programs said so they are beyond capacity. We're gonna need to talk about this. I see Dr. Gill um, on this call and I know she's been one of our most important uh, she's been a mentor and she's been a really, out, you know, important speaker on this issue. Kids are having anxiety. Seniors are having anxiety. I read something where the seniors are afraid to go outside because they're afraid to get robbed. Um, and so they're staying home and they, they can't even go grocery shopping. So 
all of this is to say, I am really grateful for to the council for this opportunity to share our community stories and hope that our restart really includes visionary plans for a new economy that is centered on the everyday true essential workers of the city. And after being months at home, we are for sure going to try to go back to what we see as a normal. But this is a re an opportunity to reject all of the injustices that we have felt that we could not fix and bring together those who have been invisible all this time to build a new city. And I hope this legislative body will work with us to demand accountability and economic fairness for all. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, now we will turn to Chair Torres for questions, but just a reminder to all speakers on this panel and any council member asking a question, please leave your mic unmuted. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, there's a sense in which the council has cognitive dissonance because on one hand, COVID-19 has given us a greater consciousness of racial disparities. But on the, on, the, on the other hand, we're facing these monumental budgetary challenges. You know, IBO estimates over the next three years, we could have $14 billion worth of deficits. Mm -hmm. That was before the nine, $8 billion cut from the state in funding to localities. So how, how do we reconcile the, the need to address racial disparities in the face of austerity imposed by the federal government uh, and by COVID-19. Well, do, with all due respect, uh, I, I just want to emphasize what uh, Joanne mentioned is that decisions are being made. Decisions are being made. There is limited funding. Decisions are being made and um, the resources need to go to those communities. And the best way to do this is through a nonprofit network of organizations of color that already is sixth in the city. This, what our organizations are ready, and we are not being, we're not being considered in these decisions, and we're trying to get the proper um, um, introductions and the proper conversations. Joanne can tell, you know, we have been in many of these conversations, so we're not asking to do anything that is not being done right now. And um, uh, with that, you know, it's just simply fairness, equity, and parity in terms of like what exactly is happening in the city with regards of these, of these uh, before it was talked about contact tracing. Uh, Massachusetts already recruited a thousand people to do contact tracing and they're doing very well. And what are they doing? They're contacting and they're contracting people in communities through or community-based organizations. So I want us to really think about how can we move forward with these conversations, knowing that there is a network here ready to serve and that is already serving, keeping employees against all odds, but many of them are like six weeks away to run out of funding mm -hmm. for their payroll. And they're trying as best as possible to respond to some of these, um, some of these uh, new challenges. I, I think the other thing you have to look at, and I started to talk about it, um, this is you know, a couple of ways bureaucrats or elected officials tend to do it. We'll do an across the board cut. In this environment, that's not appropriate because we have communities that have already been devastated and to make everyone co-equal and say, oh, you're all gonna take a 10% cut is not appropriate. That we have to dig into this, this equity lens, I think that Frankie is talking about, has to be there. This is about fairness, but also equity. Is every community suffering the same? Do certain communities need the kind of resources that our more desperate communities need? And again, there has to be a revenue side to this. This can't be a zero sum game where we're gonna take it all out of the expense side and not consider serious ways to get revenue into this system. It, not to mention it'll be a hard lift. I mean, we've got an attitude, oh, we can't touch certain communities or people of wealth because they'll leave the city. Well, frankly, if this thing goes really badly for our communities, they're gonna leave because this place will be intolerable because of new infections that will break out, because of new problems, social problems that could emerge when you have hundreds of thousands of disconnected young people who have no chance of working and now have their education set back potentially years, we have you know, to be arguing it and the council has to be in the forefront of this argument. I agree with David. I agree. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, I fully agree with the, the last comments that were made and to be brief, 
this really is the time for leadership at the council because you come from the communities, the BLAC, representing the populations we're talking about and to make sure that you are a part of the discussions when these decisions are being made, not after the fact and coming to ask your opinions, but demanding to be at that table because you know the impact it will have on your community. Secondly, the decisions are a matter of life and death in these communities, as we have been hearing on the panel before, and as we all know, that if resources are lost in our communities, it is a death sentence for many of our people. So using your voices, using your positions for the people you represent and demanding nothing less but equity as these decisions are being made. Um, I, how do I say something here to answer the question? I know. No, we can hear you. <laughs> we can hear you. Yeah, you can, yeah, Bertha, you can speak. Okay, listen. Is the majority of the council. Nothing moves without you. You cannot take the view that, oh, you know, this has been cut. You have to look at this budget. You all can decide how to rearrange the priorities for who gets cut. If it, you're, you're asking all of us today uh, to talk about communities of color, and yet one of the themes that's running through this is we depend on you all, a lot of us do, um, to actually fund us here. So number one, um, not only are the healthcare workers on the front lines, but the people you've asked to be on these panels are on the front lines. You're serving the people and you say you care about. Number two, this whole thing about um, uh, minority businesses, I, I had posited before this that you've got the city council can hold depository banks um, to account. We deposit our money with the very folks that made the last economic crisis. We don't have to uh, do business with these people. We're in a crisis. The city council could raise up and say, that's it. We are we re looking at uh, who we do business with. And we're not just going to take these Band-Aid things. We put billions of dollars. Our whole city budget goes through. Citibank, Chase, this. And also what the city council could exert itself in saying pension funds for the working class are on the line here. We're going to reassess how uh, the city invests um, with folks. You, you can rearrange how your priorities are. Again, you know, I agree with David and all my panelists. We're crying out to you all to seize your power, to use your power. You've got to be able to do it. You are our last line of defense, all of you. Mr. Chairman, you were one of the first to get hit with this virus. This is personal now. This is not theoretical and it's beyond political. You all in the city council, you know, uh, uh, the uh, forces that be like shut the city down, you all can shut the city government down if they do not deal with this. So we arrange who's being funded and what this budget looks like. You don't give a rubber stamp to it anymore. Hold the depository banks where the city has put its funds to account here. I, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you because if you don't rise up and exert your power now as a council, then what? We're going to have an entirely... Uh, three quarters of a new city council in 2021. 
if those of you who are leaving and going out, you know, don't let a crisis go without you taking advantage of it. Now is the time. Again, you know, we're counting on you. So rearrange the budget. Don't give this mayor a rubber stamp on it. You know, they didn't do it in Albany. You can do it down here. Don't look at the cuts. Look at what you have and you decide where it goes. Council Member, that's a really tough question because I think it's a question out of uh, fairness because we've never gotten our fair share of the resources. So all of a sudden you're saying, how do we cut that? I don't know. I mean, like, you know, not to be disrespectful, but that's not our problem because we we already know how to make do with the little crumbs that we've been giving. And what we're saying to you right now is that that cannot be the new normal. Um, I signed on to a letter recently by a group that works on, uh, you know, police, uh, you know, responsibility, CPR, and the police get to keep their entire budget intact. And I thought, hell no, not on the backs of seniors who are starving. Why does the police get to keep their entire executive budget when people are going hungry and people are getting potato chips to eat for meals? This is not that time. And, you know, one of the things that I am very, you know, like we all have worked together, communities of color, we are the majority and minority city. And I can tell you when we emerge out of this, we are not going to be sitting down quietly. And it's not going to be okay to to continue to make us, you know, like share a piece of pie. We want our own pie. We want to we want to be able to we contribute greatly to everything, the big economy, the little economy, obviously our communities are the front lines, we're the invisible hands. And as we start to plan this, you know, emerging out, it can you we cannot be asked that question. That is not fair to us because we've never gotten our share. Asian community, we are 16% of the population. We get 1.4% of the city contract dollars. That is that is those are some pitiful statistics. And so, you know, I want to we have your back. It is exactly what Bertha said. It is time for a revolution. It is time for us to rethink what the priorities of the city are and who the city will prioritize. And if you want to lead that revolution, we will stand behind you. I know we've spoken about future contracts. I know several of the organizations on the panel are plugged into a larger network of not-for-profits. What's the status of existing contracts? Have your have the have the non for profits on the ground have trouble securing funds more so than normal? If you could just explain the experience in the midst of COVID nineteen. One of the things that I know, uh, my organization, National Black Leadership Commission on Health, in working with a number of networks and organizations throughout the city here, uh, they are really struggling because number one, in the current contracts, they are not receiving the dollars from uh, city government or state government. There are delays in receiving monies on these current contracts, yet we're continuing to provide services and programs, doing outreach in the communities and assisting in many ways with the hope that the money will come later. But for the time being, many people are continuing to work on faith. Some organizations are uh, having to furlough staff because they cannot continue. They do not have the ability as perhaps financial ability as some others do. And they were not prepared. Uh, you know, I don't know how many people were prepared for such a pandemic, but many of them were not prepared techn technologically in terms of being able to work from at home remotely. And therefore, they are not, you know, doing uh, work that the contract demands. So I agree with the comments about the role of nonprofits, and they cannot be sacrificed because without the nonprofits, so much more, which I've said at city council hearings, government should give nonprofits whatever they ask for. Hold us accountable for the monies because government can never do what nonprofits do. So they're suffering. We're all suffering right now because of delayed payments and moving into the next fiscal year uh, for the city in terms of July 1, 
we have no idea what is going to happen. And that's why it's so important for the city council to hold a line on a lot of these proposed cuts coming to organizations. I, I would just add that, you know, I think that make the road we we do get uh, you know various different city contracts um, to provide services and as I mentioned in my in my testimony, you know nonprofit organizations including Make the Road have have had to really shift the way that we do work right I think that we've had to make sure that our staff are doing existing work plus other kinds of work as well because we need all hands on deck to to meet every kind of need that we're seeing right now so I think in terms of contracts we need to make sure that city contracts are as flexible as possible to the reality that nonprofits are seeing on the ground right now. Um, I've seen that, you know, there's some thought uh, that, you know, potentially uh, nonprofits have fewer costs now that many of our offices are closed. And we know that that's definitely not the reality, right? We have unmet costs where, you know, shipping supplies out to our, our, our staff members in their, at their homes. We are still paying rent, right? Well, we're still, um, not only paying existing bills, but additional costs as well. So I wanted to make sure to highlight that. And, you know, I, I know that there is, uh, it's a big sprawling government, right? We know that there's lots of different agencies, lots of different contracts. I think what nonprofit organizations need most now is clarity and, and, and a streamlined process and, and, you know, simply a simple process so that we're not buried in paperwork in the moment uh, where we're really needing to be on the phones uh, delivering food and, and all the stuff that we're doing. And to add to Tio, uh, some of the guidelines that the city had uh, released with regards to uh, city contracts, uh, we know that th there was some sort of like a communication saying that uh, everything after March 12 was going to be only reimbursed if it was essential, but then we were asking about what was the definition of essential and finally, yesterday, we got a communication about what is exactly considered essential, but there are some limitations in there that if you haven't started your program before March 22nd, um, you are not going to get reimbursed. So there has been a lot of scrambling around, and there has been so much talk about that there's these the reimbursements will occur, but now it's like figuring out, and we kept asking for, for answers, and it took a long time to really understand what exactly are these restrictions. So many of these funds will never be reimbursed. Will never be reimbursed because there's no time to reshift or to do the modifications necessary for this contract uh, to be reimbursed. So there are many challenges, even for the monies that has been already allocated and promised. Council member, you know, the contracts are slow to begin with. You know, getting paid was uh, slow to begin with. It would take months and like, you know, we would start a new year and then but meanwhile, we start, we're working off the old uh, year. And so right now we do need those funds. None of us have a big uh, reserve. Um, you know, we live, we are, we are you know, dangerous, uh, you know, living on the edge um, and we don't have money to be, you know, be able to have, you know, they say a solid nonprofit has six months of revenue, um, six months of reserve and there's no way. I don't think we have six weeks of res uh, revenue. So the city needs to pay out much faster, but that's not happening. And now, now that you know everybody's working at home, I think they are trying to figure out the mechanisms to make it happen. Like you know, the, now you no longer have to you know triplicate uh, notaries. Uh, you know, you, they'll accept an electronic electronic signature, but the payment needs to happen faster because that's what we're paying our staff with. And as Frankie mentioned, there's a lot of confusion about essential services. Everything we're doing at this point is essential services. I'm not really sure what the distinction is. Like our job right now is to keep people alive and keep people, you know, getting getting the help they need. We, we're making sure that vulnerable populations are um, taken care of. And so, you know, I read that memo and I just laughed because I thought, mm -hmm. well, what is not essential at this point, right? Like, you know, you know, one of my board members recent recently said to me, and I, you know, I laughed and I thought it was. Pretty, pretty profound like you know he said I realized that the true essential workers are working right now the the all the unessential workers are at home ordering food from that gets delivered right so I consider myself that I'm not an essential person you know I am I am not essential worker my leadership work is important to amplify those voices but right now you know my job has been working 14 hours a day making sure that the the needs of the undocumented immigrants 
the mental health needs, um, you know, the, the small business owners who are panicking, planning on filing bankruptcy. Um, those are the concerns that we have. How is that not essential in getting our city started? Um, the, the, it's for the, again, um, here's the thing. They're on the, um, this new task force that uh, the mayor set up, the OSI just gave the mayor $35 million. And there's other uh, big time philanthropists that wanna give the city this money. You know, at some point, Again, you guys have got to say, wait a minute, we're not going to have OSI or this, you know, Bill Gates or whomever, uh, you know, say that they're giving the city this money and we don't have anything to say about it. You know, we're always at the end of the line. So again, uh, council members, stand up. You know, like Joanne says, we got your back. We've always had your back, okay? If, if, if you stand, we will stand with you and we will go down with you. But, you know, there's this all of this goddamn philanthropic money that, you know, folks want to feel good about while they're in, you know, their other home in Connecticut. So, you know, you, you've got to let OSI and all of these big philanthropies know any money that's coming in uh, uh, to this city, we, the city council, um, will tell you, as Joanne said, who's essential and who's not. Yes, I just want to make one comment because unfortunately I'm going to have to leave the call now. But again, there will be follow-up, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the council to send the information specifically, again, as it relates to what we talked, what I spoke about specifically about enhancing data, providing sufficient information so that we can direct the resources of where they are needed in our own communities. And as those resources come into our community, we can direct the locations what are the best testing sites? What are the best locations in order to um, do uh, contact testing? How is that going to be implemented? Community-based organizations and the net many networks that we have, faith-based organizations must become a part of this at the local level, and that would scale up testing outreach, and a lot of the other things that have been talked about here today. Secondly, and lastly, I do agree again with the council, with the dis discussion around the council, and I'm hopeful that the BLAC will really step up based if nothing else on the discussions that have taken place on this call today and everything that has been expressed. Thank you so much. Councilwoman Barron for your comments and to the public advocates who opened it up to around these issues. We stand with you. So let's work together. And I'm very hopeful that we can escalate a lot of what needs to be done in our own communities through the amplification of our voices, our resources, identification of needs, and making sure that those needs are being met. Thank you so much. And I unfortunately have to leave the uh, uh, conference at this time. Thank you. And my final question for the panel is, uh, what question should we ask of the administration at the next hearing? <laughs> Go, Bertha. <laughs> Tell them what the hell? I mean, you know. <laughs> you got. Uh, you know what questions to ask, Mr. Chairman. You know, uh, again, um, just being an elected official, a city council member, doesn't strip you of your humanity and your common sense. Um, I think 
all of the panelists here and uh, like, I, I, I love all of them because these are my brothers and sisters down on the ground. Um, you know, we've all told you what we think should be done and what has been happening. So when you say what questions should we ask, you know, you already know what questions you should ask. You know, how is it that this didn't happen? How is it that that didn't happen? You know, what's going on? Everybody um, has told you, you don't have to keep um, hearing it over and over again. And even, you know, if you don't take the questions that we say that you should ask it, ask your own questions because you're right there, you know, in the council. You, you know, you see this sausage making you know, all the time, you know, and, and uh, listen, I, I'm just, I'm so frustrated because, you know, my community has been at risk. I'm personally at risk and all of this stuff that has been happening um, to us, none of us can tell you all of uh, what has been happening down here on, on the ground. So, you know, it, you know what questions to ask. You'll ask the right questions um, when the time comes. And, and, you know, there's like 70, 80 some people um, on this call. There's other um, uh, panel members that I see. So I'm just saying, you know. No, the reason I ask, I, you, you know, elect, I just want to be, let me address that point because elected officials, we don't know everything. Right. You have on the ground insights that can inform the questions we ask. So you made a point earlier, Bertha, about dialysis centers. To be honest with you, that's not something that had occurred to me. So now that's going to be incorporated into the city council's plan. So if there are any distinctive questions beyond the obvious that I could ask at the next hearing, let me know. Uh, that, that's that's mm -hmm. the point of the question. I think one of the questions I have, um, I have a question about everything, but the question I have is um, how are how are decisions being, how are the cuts being prioritized, right? Is there some minimal, you know, data about which communities will be impacted, right? Because honestly, like, I feel like the cuts that are happening, we're gonna, our communities are gonna be victimized again. And, you know, like I look at SYP, that serves poor kids of color. And so I'm thinking when that cut happened, I said, oh my God, here we go again, right? So I would like to see, I would like to also see who gets to keep the resources and who, who doesn't. You know, like I said, we've never even had a shot at getting anything. But, you know, I'm on calls and I'm thinking, what are, what are people talking about? They are like 50 steps ahead of me. And this is when I call Frankie you know, you know, and say, did you know that X, Y, Z? Like, why are you not here? Right. Um, I'd like to know um, who is getting all the funding. Um, I know for a fact that, you know, there was a twenty five million dollar investment made in, for instance, food bank. I'm not hating on food bank. Good for them. But I know for a fact that my community, my senior agencies, don't access food bank and food bank has nothing to do with us. And so then great, I'm glad that they got $25 million, but where's my $5 million? And I, so I think these are the conversations that we need to ask, like who's getting the money? And, and I wanna know the people who are getting the money, I wanna see the breakdown of who they're feeding and supporting, because that's the other question is, um, you know, if you're getting money to serve low income, you know, we know who the low income folks are, because that's all folks like us. Um, and so we'd like to see the data breakdown of that. Like, I think there needs to be accountability instead of just writing checks, because that's how things work. And like, that's how things work for working sake. I think that is, I think we really need to make a commitment that we cannot go back to contracting as usual because our community our community took the brunt of this well i think in the, the housing arena particularly if we revert to what the administration was doing of essentially going and subsidizing large developers again because they're quote in trouble and continue to starve places like nycha um, and also start playing games with numbers of what affordability is where suddenly affordability becomes 75 to 100,000 a year, as opposed to people who are desperately needing at the bottom. I think those are the kinds of inquiry that they've, they've sort of gotten away with over time. And that, that takes digging. 
And it also takes an understanding that there is a tendency to provide uh, support for political creators. I've been in and out of political life and for a long time, but this is a reality we have to recognize. But I think this is a chance that you have as the administration changes to lay the groundwork for what the next administration will look like by asking these very tough questions now and forcing the administration to come up with answers that make sense to you and your constituents. So I think a lot of us would be more than willing to help in that process. I would, I would just add that, um, you know, I, I want to continue to shed light on this issue of, of, of our city's undocumented community because, uh, what, you know, we, what we know and we, we hear in response to the need to, to provide uh, resources to the undocumented that is that it's impossible, that it's that, you know, the state government, that there's um, rules and laws and regulations at the state level that prohibit the city or, or limit the city and its ability to uphold and 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 support the undocumented community. You know, our, our city has has been built by by immigrants. Uh, our city uh, in this moment has run uh, largely because of of the work of immigrant communities and people of color. And so I would I would like to hear, you know, not only from the mayor but but from you know our council members and our elected officials into the future what, what the plan is to engage you know, with the state to make sure that we are not limited in this way and such a crucial community for our city. Um, you know, at Make the Road, we've been uh, fighting at the state level to make sure um, that, you know, whatever waivers or, or legislation that needs to happen at the state, state level uh, happen so that we can support the undocumented. Um, uh, but, you know, we wanna continue to partner with you all um, and push the state uh, to make this a reality, so I, I would I would want to shed light on that and 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 get real answers on a plan to 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 push our state to to loosen these these limitations. Uh, Frankie, you actually inspired me to ask about the administration. Why has the administration failed to engage organizations like yours in the hiring of culturally sensitive contact tracers? So that's again, that's something I had not thought of, and and. Uh, you're, you're mute, I think. Can we unmute Frankie? Juanita, can we unmute Frank? Okay. Uh, uh, yes, thank you so much. I, I have my cat running around and making noises, so I no, mute myself, sorry. Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, again, you know, we see the, the model that Massachusetts is doing. So that's, that could be also, you know, a good way to look at it. They already have hired more than a thousand people in communities through nonprofit organizations to do contact tracing. And again, you know, here in the city, we can do an incredible job reaching out to our networks and doing outreach. We do it all the time. So if people are going to really trust somebody knocking on their doors or calling on the phone, rather than saying like, I'm from the Department of Health, especially in our communities, they rather have somebody with, with their, their community organizations, their com the, uh, community organizers that will trust and they will give them actually the last 10 people, 20 people they have, they have contact with. So it will be critically important to be done this through nonprofit organizations in communities of color. I just wanna thank all of you for taking the time to participate. Just remember if I can add, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that we're really concerned about is the census. I know that it's been extended and so we are, um, you know, looking at all the areas where uh, there's been a low response, um, predominantly, you know, communities of color. Um, so we do need some investment from the city council again, so that that way we can keep that going because this is not just a one-time thing. This is how we're going to be seen for the next 10 years. And for me, this is one of those really scary things that keeps me up at night because if people don't want to be stand up and be counted, and and granted, you know, a lot of this happens because we have a horrible president, but um, I know to the extent that the council can really lend support to communities of color, um, you know, our aggressive outreach once we get um, out of quarantine um, and that we can really knock on doors and to be able to extend, um, you know, to really do the, the uh, get boots on the ground, I think that would be really helpful. And that is a request um, as a census information center. Thank you, everyone. We're gonna move on to the next panel. Juanita, can you pull up the next panel? Thank you all. Um, our next panel will consist of Diana Hernandez, 
Marcus Hilpert, Dr. Rosa Gill, Dr. Perry Pong, and Dr. Henry Chen. Council members who have questions for anyone on this panel should use the raise hand function in Zoom and the chair will call on you after all the panelists have completed their testimony. Once the chair calls on you, please specify which specific panelist you are directing your question to so that the panel knows who should answer. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and then you can begin your testimony. Once you are finished, please remain on the line as we will open it up to council member questions once all members of this panel have delivered their testimony. If you have written testimony, please send it to testimony at council.nyc.gov after today's hearing. So first, I'd like to now welcome Diana Hernandez to testify, who will be followed by Marcus Hilbert. Diana? Time starts now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to share my perspective um, as an assistant professor of sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia and an appointed member of the New York City Environmental Justice Advisory Board. Uh, I'm honored to uh, share uh, what have been kind of longstanding observations about COVID disparities um, in my training as a sociologist, as an academic researcher, who focuses on the social and environmental determinants of health with a specific focus on housing uh, and household energy as determinants of health. A lot of my community engaged work uh, is actually based in the South Bronx uh, where I grew up and also live. Um, so just as kind of a background uh, for my comments, uh, as the pandemic unfolded, we initially thought that age was the key vulnerability but in the US, the endurance of the color line is in fact the proven susceptibility. The manifestation of the COVID color line is based on race, place, socioeconomic position, and health status. It was Frederick Douglass uh, that first mentioned the color line in an essay in 1881. And it was repeated by W.E.B. Du Bois in the 20th century as he documented health and social disparities negatively impacting Black Americans. And in the most recent example, it may well be that history will show that the color line will define the COVID-19 pandemic, especially here in New York City. My comments today are in three parts. First, I'll provide some facts about the disparate COVID impacts based on available data. Second, I'll provide some perspectives on factors that have contributed to these disparate impacts uh, that range from socioeconomic conditions to health and healthcare disparities. And lastly, I will offer some considerations as we plan the way forward. In terms of the uh, disparate impact, COVID-19 is exposing and exacerbating existing health and socioeconomic inequalities in our society and especially in our city, as others have pointed out. Uh, black New Yorkers are two times more likely to die of COVID-19 than their white counterparts, and Latinos uh, are 1.8 times more likely to die. The Bronx and Queens have 1.9 and 1.7 percent uh, times higher COVID death rates uh, than Manhattan, respectively. Uh, and in the context of COVID, social distancing has been aspirational at, at best, as I pointed out in a New York uh, Daily News uh, op-ed in early March. Uh, due to crowded housing, reliance on public transportation, and jobs on the front lines. And those risks are not equally distributed due to labor market and housing discrimination entrenched in racism. Uh, we've seen primary and secondary impacts of the impact of the pandemic alike. Those primary uh, impacts have been illness from infection with some potentially lasting effects, as well as premature death. And on the secondary impacts, we've also seen mass trauma from compounding losses, uh, including mourning from premature, sudden, and unceremonious deaths, economic and wage losses, academic learning losses, uh, a severe mental health toll, uh, and also losses of a sense of normalcy and identity, safety, and security as we face uncertain times in the recovery period. All of these disparities are really based on underlying risk factors uh, that are rooted in high, in, in high unemployment rates and high poverty rates, high rent burdens, uh, food insecurity in communities like mine. Um, 
It's also about uh, unfair, uh, unjust, uh, and unequal healthcare outcomes uh, with some of the highest uninsured rates in the cities also stemming from the Bronx and Queens uh, as examples. Lots of avoidable hospitalizations among children and adults alike and a lack of regular providers as well as overwhelmed medical facilities. Uh, and uh, this has materialized into chronic health conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, disproportionate smoking rates uh, stemming from a saturated tobacco retail la landscape. Uh, so as we move forward, um, I'd like to uh, kind of uh, think about COVID specific um, responses uh, as well as kind of moving beyond COVID. The data transparency issue is a really critical one. It's an uncomfortable reality, but it's really, uh, you know, having access to this data as a researcher, working with other researchers who also do this work, uh, we realize that a lot of how we're doing this is kind of uh, scrappy and there should be uh, uh, more uh, data transparency to make it available. We also need to address misclassification of debts ensuring that uh, folks that are um, that are, are properly counted uh, in terms of those that have been uh, affected and um, and also uh, succumb to uh, COVID. We need universal testing, including antibody testing and hotspot testing in the most impacted and most at risk communities. Uh, we need prioritized uh, vaccination access. So uh, one thing that I am really proud of is that the Bronx actually has some of the highest rates of uh, HPV uh, vaccination rates and other and flu uh, vaccines. Uh, but we also need to be on the front of those lines. Uh, access to PPE for all residents according to their levels of risk and community engagement, really ensuring that people that are most impacted are meaningfully engaged. We need to be supporting health and well-being in communities of color and low-income communities, thinking about physical health, mental health, and preventive health care access. And we also need to know that uh, at some point, um, there will be another pandemic, and hopefully we can point to unusual suspects, not the usual ones of race, place, and socioeconomic disadvantage. We need to also be thinking about support for the safe, for a more comprehensive safety net. As of today, we have over 30 million Americans that have filed for unemployment uh, benefits. Uh, but what does it look like? Uh, unemployment benefits are not enough, but we also really need our opportunities for people to be digitally connected, food secure, housing secure, energy secure, um, and uh, have uh, opportunities for rent and mortgage relief, utility bills, uh, assistance, quality and affordable food access, telecommunications, and Wi-Fi service access, uh, as well as uh, broadened healthcare insurance. Uh, and my last point is that as we think about the post-COVID reality, we should be thinking less about resilience and more about security. Uh, time and again, we've seen emergency and disaster contexts followed by a rhetoric uh, of resilience and building resilience in our communities. In fact, our communities are too resilient. Um, and we have been uh, expressing and demonstrating resilience, uh, more resilience than we need to. And so uh, I, I wanna posit that that uh, assumption is problematic and bouncing back to social, uh, economic and health positions that were precarious and unstable to begin with are not places to return to. Instead, our communities need to emerge better, stronger and more secure and those most affected also need to be elevated in their baseline conditions. They need to be more, they need to lead more dignified lives and be better able to survive this and other calamities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diana Hernandez. Please remember to stay on the line as we'll open it up to council member questioning once all members of this panel have delivered their testimony. Next, we will welcome Dr. Marcus Hilpert to testify, who will be followed by Dr. Rosa Gill. Talk starts now. Hello, uh, Chairman Torres, Speaker Johnson, Council members and panelists. My name is Marco Silpot. I'm an engineer doing research in environmental health sciences and I'm an associate professor at Columbia University. I note that I shared accompanying slides with the council, but not, since not everybody can see these slides, I will present things as if you hadn't seen the slides. To be honest, after having listened to the insightful and saddening remarks of Chairman Torres and the other panelists, 
I feel what I'm going to talk about is very technical and perhaps not of immediate relevance. I also have to say I was under the impression that I have five plus minutes, but I only have try three minutes. So I think I need to freewheel. Uh, uh, doctor, take whatever time you need. Okay, good. Th thank you. Um, so I want to comment on two matters. Firstly, I want to present results of a study I led to examine the environmental impacts of the opening of a large trucking intensive warehouse in the South Bronx. I want to explain why this is relevant to this hearing. Air pollution causes disease such as asthma and heart disease, which in turn, in turn can increase the severity of COVID-19 infections. Health disparities can arise because often sources of air pollution emissions are added in low-income communities and communities of color. Such air pollution sources can include industrial operations, power plants, and traffic. Second item that I want to address are the elevators in NYCHA housing, which can hinder social distancing. So let me first remind you about the highly non-uniform distribution of air pollution in New York City. For instance, the South Bronx is exposed to high levels of black carbon, a tracer of tailpipe emissions from trucks. Some of the air pollution sources in the South Bronx are local and include two interstates, several trucking intensive businesses and the waste transfer station for the entire Bronx. In 2018, a new warehouse of an online grocery store opened in the South Bronx. Suppliers deliver goods to this warehouse with large trucks and then these goods are delivered to customers with smaller trucks. Columbia University was approached by a community organization, South Bronx Unites, to study the environmental impacts of this warehouse. I am the principal investigator of this NIH funded study, which is conducted in collaboration with South Bronx Unite. We use traffic radar devices to count vehicles. We also measured air pollution and noise. We found that after the warehouse opening, traffic increased significantly during several time windows throughout the day. Um, but, pre no, continue. but predominantly uh, at night, the contributions of the warehouse to air pollution and noise levels were relatively small, in part because baseline levels are high. So baseline levels at four out of the eight measurement sites we found that the noise levels exceeded EPA's recommended limit of 70 decibels, and the black carbon levels we measured were consistent with the NICAS report, which shows higher BC levels in the South Bronx than compared to the Bronx and entire New York City. Let me also just quickly talk about elevators. We are concerned about the COVID-19 impacts on people residing in densely populated NYCHA housing. Elevators are of special concern about Half of NYCHA's 3,000 elevators are functionally single elevators, meaning that they are the only elevator providing access to a specific set of residential floors. If such an elevator breaks down, residents need to take the stairs. I calculated that on average, 121 NYCHA residents share an elevator, a high number which makes it difficult to practice social distancing, but if particularly if so-called single elevators break down. Perhaps you can use these numbers to advocate for resources to be used for NYCHA. To wrap up, we determined the environmental impacts of the opening of a trucking intensive warehouse in a low income community. We found significant increases in traffic and relatively small increases in air pollution and noise. However, when interpreting this finding, you need to keep in mind that over many decades, air pollution sources were systematically added to the South Bronx. For example, the Deegan and Sheridan Expressways were built through the neighborhood and many trucking intensive businesses added in the Harlem River Yards. All of these sources contribute to today's high level of air pollution and this air pollution can cause a number of cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, which can increase the risk of severe illness and potential death from COVID-19. Hence, air pollution contributes to a higher burden that communities of color carry during this outbreak. In conclusion, our research suggests, and also the research of ours, that longer-term envi environmental actions are needed to help protect the health of communities of color. Thank you. I'm sorry that I read my notes, but I needed to be fast.
None at all. Thank you, Dr. Hilbert. Please stay on the line as we'll open it up to council member questioning once all the members of this panel have testified. Next, we will welcome Dr. Rosa Gill, followed by Dr. Perry Pong. Dr. Rosa Gill. Uh, good afternoon, council members, uh, Chairman Torres, as well as other distinguished members of the uh, uh, committee. Um, and thank you so much for uh, taking, uh, giving me the opportunity to present today at this very important hearing. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the presence of uh, many of distinguished colleagues who are also presenting very important testimony. Community Life is a 31 year old uh, nonprofit organization, and we are uh, committed uh, to provide uh, New York City vulnerable communities with affordable and supportive housing uh, for persons living with HIV and mental illness. Uh, we believe that no one should be without housing and supports that they need to lead a healthy and minimum meaningful life. Although this has always been uh, our priority, now more than ever with the COVID um, uh, crisis, this becomes really a necessity. I have prepared testimony that um, uh, includes uh, data, uh, but I'm just going to skip that in the, um, given the uh, uh, amount of time that we have, and also Dr. Hernandez and others have presented that data. I really want to concentrate Chairman Torres, on something that is a taboo for the Latino community that has really serious implication for the COVID epidemic and after the COVID epidemic. What is the taboo? None of, one, none of us want to be called a loco. So mental health is really a taboo. As a matter of fact, we started this hearing at one o'clock and I counted the number of references to mental health. Thank you to council member Diana Ayala, the leader of the mental health committee, because obviously she really addressed the issues. But it's very interesting in this uh, testimony of very distinguished colleagues, we all have talked about public health, but we have not talked about public mental health. So I want to talk about that. Um, let's talk about the fact that prior to uh, COVID epidemic, the literature, the psychiatric literature has for years, I'm talking about 30 years now, documented that Latina women have the highest incidence and prevalence of depression. That Latino men has an extraordinary incidence of uh, schizophrenia that goes back including to Puerto Rico and studies done in Puerto Rico. Furthermore, the psychiatric literature really through the years show how the lack of access of bilingual and bicultural treatment is significant in the prevalence of Time. among our Latino community. Therefore, this is pre-COVID. Uh, in addition, I want to say that um, the mental health disparities are even greater for the Latina adolescents. 43% of Latina adolescents in New York City high schools, they feel sad and hopeless. 21% of all Latina adolescents in high school in New York City are considering suicide seriously. Furthermore, the CDC data shows that 13% of all Latin adolescents in New York City High School have attempted suicide. Let me remind all of us that when we experienced September 11, the children in the public school, the Hispanic children in the public school had the highest level of trauma and depression given that event of September 11. And here we are now talking about the COVID trauma. Let me tell you what we at Camila have done. We have for 11 years now developed the only suicide prevention program for Latin adolescents in the city of New York 
the New York State and the country. And basically, this is a program that we have committed for, uh, uh, to do in four centers in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, in Queens, and, and the Bronx. And I just want to share with you uh, that in these centers, what we provide these Latin adolescents is with critical tools to deal with depression and their suicide behaviors. Meaning that we do creative art therapy, we actually provide them with tutoring because many of them are not doing well in school. And we especially work with the families because I do not believe that you can really treat in mental health and adolescents without really involved with the family. Furthermore, in the Latino community, we don't talk without talking la abuelita, la tia. So the family becomes the critical element of intervention for these adolescents. So we have succeeded and in the 11 year, none of our adolescents have completed suicide. Um, and many of them have succeeded and are in college and are actually volunteering their time to help uh, others in, in the program. So what happened with these adolescents and their family during the COVID epidemic? Let me tell you what, 83% of the parents of these adolescents who are at risk of suicide have lost their jobs. And those who are working are at greater risk of contracting the virus. Many have lost loved ones. Uh, actually, we have one mother who is in a ventilator for several weeks now. 72% of the parents of these things are undocumented. And the situation is even more terrible because they don't have access to the federal stimulus check or the unemployment. They are all about 100% basically their experience food inequality. So we have provided them with the support of Hispanic Federation. We have been able to provide them food. We are giving them uh, resources in the community. But this is just a little bit of an illustration of a program of what we are doing to address what I call the most um, unfair inequalities, which are the mental health inequalities that we don't dare to talk about it because it's a taboo issue. So I just want the council members to put in the agenda as we really work toward a new New York City that mental health has to be a partner at the front end for this new New York City that we are going to build. I just very briefly in response to council member Levin, who is concerned about housing and the hotels. I just want to tell him and other colleagues and Chairman Torres that Monday of this week, Community Live opened 84 rooms in a hotel uh, for COVID patients who are uh, coming from Columbia Presbyterian system and from the Mount Sinai system because or either they have been in the hospitals and now they need a place for isolation to continue to recuperate, or also because they are they went to the emergency room, they found they have the symptoms, but they do not require admissions. So, and this is an effort that is supported by these two great um, hospital systems that allow us to really contribute a little bit to the crisis of, of COVID. I just wanted, uh, in, if I may, for a minute, Council uh, um, Chairman Torres, what are we going to do future-wise? I serve on the advice, on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Board of New York, District 2. So I am exposed to the macro financing issues of New York as well as the country. I serve on the Board of Health of the New York City Department of Health, and I see the macro issues of public health being in front of me. So if we really want to really think what we're going to do future-wise, we need to begin to talk to Wall Street and say, how are you going to be a partner now? Because we have given you a lot. So you better come to the table and then provide us with what we need that. And that is 
in, as a follow-up of the previous um, panelists. In terms of the suggestion for community health workers, 30 years ago, I created a program here in New York City that I identified over 200 nurses from Asia and from Latino, uh, Latin American countries. And we provided training for them to pass their LPN and their registered nurse exam. So there must be a lot of immigrants in the city of New York who are coming from different communities who have been professionals in their countries of origin. So why is it that we don't tap those communities to really be the workers tra tracking, tracking the uh, COVID? Mental health, again, you, we need refocus our priorities and put mental health as one of those. Last but not least, Chairman Torres and council members, who is monitoring HPV when there are going to be cuts of new development for affordable and supported housing in the city of New York. I already have gotten the news that, well, you know, they're looking at the budget for, you know, the closings in June. So are we now in the middle of this crisis, Chairman Torres, allow to reduce the opportunity to create more affordable housing for our communities? Come on, let's stop this nonsense. If you need a revolution, let's just go march and do the revolution. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts. And, and Dr. Gill, I, I know firsthand that you've been a leader in promoting mental health among Latinas. So just thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Please remember to stay on the line as there will be council member questioning once everyone on this panel has testified. Next, we will welcome Dr. Perry Pong, followed by Dr. Henry Chen. Dr. Perry Pong. Time starts now. Thank you for the invitation. I am the Chief Medical Officer of the Charles Yuan Community Health Center, and we serve many Asian Americans from throughout the New York City area. COVID-19 has exposed and exacerbated the inequities in the city. I'm gonna make a few points today. One, the Asian American population has not been spared despite having a lower case and death rate. As well, many anti-Asian incidents have been reported and the city must remain vigilant to protect the community and call out these incidents. I wanna make a comment on the COVID case and death rates. One explanation for lower rates in Asians are, is that Asians in New York City are predominantly immigrants and immigrants are in general healthier as those who are ill won't be able to immigrate. And Asian populations readily absorb the social message of distancing. As well, some of our communities are more insular due to language and cultural barriers. A comment about immigrate, immigrants being healthier. So, we know that that is a phenomenon. So that black, including Caribbean and Latin other and Latinx communities have had higher death rates means that that's a greater, even greater impact that can be expected from social inequities. In addition, further evaluation of data for subpopulations, including Asians, such as South Asians, needs to be done to understand the full impacts and needs for the future. We must not blame people for getting COVID-19. They cannot be scapegoated. They are not at fault for getting the infection. It is only a reflection of the history and conditions of the United States and New York City. Uh, point two, language and culture needs to exist in most immigrant communities. You must not also forget about the undocumented. Information disseminated needs to address these differences and similarities. People need help to be able to apply for benefits loans, health insurance extensions or changes. They need help to be able to do that. Four, community health centers are vital for the city's health and as, and as a safety net provider. We will need support as we take care of even more uninsured and vulnerable patients. Many of our centers have furloughed workers and reduced hours. Yet we are economic mainstays, provide jobs and paths for training and advancement in our communities and we will need help to regain our footing. Five, I will command the city and the Department of Health and Mental Health 
for the direction of information in COVID-19. They made big efforts to reach out to Asian communities and medical communities, particularly the Chinese American medical professionals. We were able to be briefed and give timely feedback as eyes and ears for the Department of Health and Mental Health. This type of effort would also be needed as we I'm sorry. the pandemic. They wanted to do more testing early on, but they could not get enough tests from the CDC. And speaking about testing, the community really needs clear messaging on the value of testing, whom should get, te whom should get tested and why and what is the strategy. The conflicting information from the federal, state and city level leaves the com our communities, employers and medical community in confusion. That is bad medicine and can lead to bad outcomes. It needs to be an organized effort. Lastly, many communities, in particular communities of cover, color, including Asians, have a high number of workers in service industries and small businesses. Whether taxi drivers, home health aides, hotel workers, restaurant servers, cooks, facility staff, they are vulnerable economically and, and medically. They will need help. They need help to apply for programs, whether federal, state, or city, or they may not even be eligible to apply for programs. They need safe working conditions. We all need public transportation that is safe for our communities and our MTA employees. Please help small business, help health workers, help our people without health coverage, because now it's every headline, companies are calling employees independent contractors so they don't get health benefits. Please help communities and not Wall Street. Wall Street will survive just fine. Communities won't without your help. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pong. Please stay on the line as there will be council member questioning after our last speaker on this panel. And our last speaker is Dr. Henry Chen. Time begins now. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Henry Chen, president of community, uh, Somo Community Care. Uh, on behalf of the community, uh, Somo Community Care and our chairman, Dr. Raymond Taraj. Thank you, Chairman Taraj and um, the city council members. And would like to have this opportunity to introduce Somos. And I've just finished the testing site in Brooklyn, which is the first ever walkthrough COVID-19 antibody testing site in the entire New York City. And SOMOS Community Care is a network of over 2,500 physicians in the Bronx, Queens, Lower Manhattan, and Brooklyn. And we come together to form this SOMO Community Care and was awarded a grant by the New York State Department of Health in this program to improve healthcare of the underserved Medicaid patients and reduce hospital admission 25%. We as a group of dedicated community physicians have focused on this growth since the beginning. And we continue to do the same during the COVID-19 pandemic. And here is the sum summary of our work. Um, so most community care. We begin as a group of physicians in the community and first at AW Medical as a private practice in Washington Heights, applied for district and was approved and subsequently organized those organizations who are active serving the Latino community and the Chinese community. They are Corinthian Medical IPA, Eastern Chinese American Physician IPA, Balance IPA, Excelsior IPA, Brooklyn IPA and Queens County Medical Society IPA and two ACO, Balance ACO and Chinese Community Accountable Care Organization. And Balance ACO was the number one ACO in the entire country, receiving share saving and safe CMS over 144 million over the past five years. And CCHO ranked number two in the entire New York State as receiving share saving for, for over 40 million. And we are the only physician led PBS to participate in the New York State district program. And each of our providers work very, very hard 
in our community to accomplish the goals of district. And we organize SOMO's provider to function on one EMR system and able to join real and save patients' information among the patients. And Department of Health of New York established only 12 pilot programs for the value based payment in the waiter program. And SOMO obtained six of them. After the completion of the pilot program, SOMO was one of the only three organizations to participate in the final New York value based payment in the waiter program to continue to reduce the cost of health care and improve the health of the most underserved patients. We, as SOMO's community care network, in 1918 alone, we saved New York State Medicaid program 11.9% per member per month, which equivalent approximately 336 million. And SOMO has made contribution to better understand the overall health care of the patient across New York City. In 2018, SOMO's community care conducted study and interview across the borough of New York City and published the first ever state of Latino health and the state of Chinese health in New York City. And we found there's a few uh, major disparities in health care uh, in the Latino and Asian communities. First of all, it is the language barrier. And the second is the access to care. Number three is transportation. And we found only 25% of our kids have one computer at home. So now will be some issue with the home study. So we we'll talk about this later. Now, how about SOMO and COVID-19? And when COVID-19 pandemic arise in New York City and SOMO, the first established a 1-800 number to educate our New Yorkers with multiple language, including English, Spanish, and Chinese. So most quickly and organized to establish COVID-19 testing site, as we all know, the testing was very limited from beginning and so more community care and take a big effort into it. We provide PPE, including masks, gloves, guns, and all this and to establish a drive-through site in Queens to offer to the community and free of tests for COVID-19 nasal swab. The early result we found about 70% of the patient tested in our site were positive, confirming our suspicions that many New Yorkers were already infected by COVID-19. So we immediately alert the local authority of the high density Hot spot area in Queens. On Friday, March 20, Governor Cuomo announced the shelter in, order, in place order. SOMO worked closely with the governor, local authority, military, healthcare providers, and volunteers to open a three lane drive through testing site in Queens, subsequent in the Bronx, Lehman College. We collectively have over 120 to 150 volunteers working in all the sites at this time. Because of the understanding of the COVID-19, the, um, the disease, and we have Inex Hernandez, a physician and epidemiologist from Dominican, uh, Dominican Republic to suggest someone should take a step to test COVID-19 antibody for our community uh, residency. So we make a huge effort to um, funding the source to buy the testing kit for COVID-19 antibody test. We are able to open the first ever walk through COVID-19 antibody testing site in the Sunset Park of Brooklyn, which is mixed of new immigrants, Latinos, Asians, most of those residents are underserved and poor. They do not have a car to go through the drive-through. 
uh, and many many of them don't even get tested. They Dr. have they Dr. are Chang, infected. Doctor Chang, I'm going to interject quickly with a question. Um, you know, questions have been raised about the accuracy of antibody testing. Are you confident in the accuracy of the antibody testing being conducted at the moment in New York State? Very confident. All the testing so far, we have collected over a thousand uh, patients, uh, members, uh, the residents tested. Very consistent. Over 85 to 90 percent of those tested positive, consistent with one, with positive uh, nasal swab, second with typical presentation of COVID-19 two weeks ago, and also close contact with confirmed COVID-19 patient. So we are very confident that the antibody test, it is consistent with the nasal swab. Of course, you cannot make 90% of, or more than 90% of the accuracy, but that adds a layer of comfort for the people who are able to go back to war and aiming to reopen New York, reopen the other, uh, the, the economy. So if you have tested positive for the antibody, you are kind of comfortable to be feel free to go back to war. Right now, CDC recommendation is only three criteria. One, three days after symptom free, you go back to war. Number two, from the first day on, seven days after the symptom, you go back to war. And three, you asymptomatic for 14 days. So without any understanding of the antibody or the virus, they've sent the people go back to work. What we are doing here is provide an extra layer, particularly for the essential workers, for first responders, for healthcare professionals, and give them extra layer of comfort. And we know that from the previous panelists, everybody asking for testing, testing, testing in the color community, in the underserved community, we are doing this is exactly what every single panelist was asking. So we have many, many patients coming with the great story. One of the great story is that one of the nursing home uh, worker have been uh, in the hospital, typical presentation, rejected by the hospital three times, not offer any testing, just tell them, go home, you're okay. After 14 days, you go back to work. He came here just by instant, walk through, we get it done, it was positive. IgG and IgM, which means he has some immunity in his body, but how long this antibody lasts, we don't know. This is brand new, novel virus. So we need to do more tests. This month, three months, six months later, I we need to know the community, the immunity in the community. That's what we do. No. Thank, thank, the you. thank you, doctor. Um, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Hernandez, can, can can you explain to the public in greater detail how social contact, social conditions make communities of color vulnerable, the kinds of conditions or diseases that it causes, the comorbidities? Um, so first of all, uh, Chairman Torres, I, I didn't uh, properly acknowledge the fact that we actually have uh, met in the past and I appreciate all of your work uh, in uh, public housing um, and even in uh, just kind of opening this conversation uh, a lot of times we think about disparities long after uh, these events, but it's really clear that you guys are trying to take uh, an early step. Uh, so social conditions, poverty, uh, I'm assuming that this is what you're talking about, poverty, um, issues around food insecurity. Well, I could take one quick example if you want. Okay. Uh, so the most common COVID-19 comorbidity is hypertension. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then, to a lesser extent, diabetes. So, why why is hypertension and diabetes more concentrated in communities of color than elsewhere in the city? So, I mean, the first panel I think laid it out really well, but there's uh, a lot of evidence that suggests that structural racism uh, essentially gets under the skin. Uh, that a legacy of uh, having to encounter uh, institutions uh, and challenges that are uh, interactions that are based on uh, racism and discrimination uh, make the realities for people of color, uh, Blacks and Latinos uh, and other people of color that much harder. 
Uh, so we have disproportionate rates of hypertension, of diabetes, of obesity. Um, I mentioned the smoking rates, which has a lot to do with tobacco licensing uh, here in the city. Um, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity is 2.4 times uh, to eight times uh, more prevalent in the Bronx compared to the, fi the financial district, Greenwich Village, and Soho. And these are precisely the kind of comorbidities that are showing up when it comes to COVID-19. Um, these are legacy issues. Some of it, you know, you can attribute to lifestyle and diet. And in some ways, that's the easy response because it's behavioral. But if we think about food deserts and why it is that people are uh, essentially unable to uh, uh, exercise and do kind of physical activity outdoors, uh, ironically enough, uh, with all of the public housing uh, kind of open space and green space that there is uh, in the South Bronx, uh, we actually open, have the least access to green and open uh, space uh, for people to actually be able to utilize a, um, those, those spaces for physical activity. Uh, this is something that uh, our partners, uh, Marcus Hilper, who's a, a colleague of mine, um, has been working with South Bronx Unite around uh, and other uh, groups to kind of raise awareness about the importance of access to a green and open space for health. Uh, so some of this is about the built environment uh, and some of it is also about uh, these kind of structural factors and institutional issues. Education is a big uh, piece of this um, as well uh, and, and where people live and how they're, they're living uh, in terms of density and uh, how that uh, the, the testing issues are really important because you test one person in, the, in, in a household and that allows you to kind of have a better sense of uh, you know, quarantining and, and other opportunities, but that's really difficult when you don't have a lot of space. So there are a lot of kind of different factors, uh, but the funda fundamental causes um, of illness and the social determinants of health really point to, uh, you know, poverty is uh, strong indicators as a, a, a lack of education, uh, educational opportunities and educational attainment as, uh, as strong uh, kind of indicators. And then uh, that around income and people have to make decisions behind between you know paying the rent uh, and buying food a lot of times uh, though that balancing act and that trade-off uh, means that people are uh, kind of sacrificing the very kind of a good for its quality uh, so you know in order to afford housing you know people uh, with limited means uh, are uh, also you know kind of occupying poorer quality housing and buying poorer quality food and that um, materializes into some of the health disparities that we ultimately see in terms of chronic health conditions. And, and to build on that question, you know, Harvard University uh, did a study revealing a close correlation between pollution and COVID-19. And so Dr. Hilford, if you could just flesh out the relationship between the two, how, how pollute, and that, I think that the pollution example is, is useful because pollution is not a personal choice. Like mm -hmm. no one chooses to breathe in toxins that predispose you to COVID-19 morbidity. So if you can flesh out that relationship for the public. Yeah, <clears throat> that's exactly, that's correct. So we know that, that air pollution causes a lot of deaths in the United States. And there was this recent Harvard study which found that if you have an increase in one microgram per cubic meter in particular matter 2.5, so you have a 8% higher chance of dying from COVID. And just to put that into perspective, one microgram per cubic meter, the national ambient, ambient air quality standard for PM2.5 is 12. So numbers in New York City range somehow between, between eight and 12. So if you go from eight to nine, so then according to the study, you have 8% higher death rate. And that's actually quite significant. So if you were able to reduce uh, air pollution, that would help a lot. It's not the silver bullet. You know, air pollution is not the only cause for all of these pre-existing conditions, but it's one thing that we should work on. And I think one thing that we could do in the, not in the near term, we, we have our plans for right now, uh, but it would be great if there were, we could do something to reduce the levels of air pollution in local income communities and communities of color to increase waterfront access. So I moved here to New York City four years ago from Baltimore. So that's not where my accent is from. Um, but in a way, I believe- We won't hold that against you. I'm a Yankee, I'm a Bronx guy. But we don't 
I, I, I believe we could actually learn from other cities, you know, how to deal with waterfront development. So in Baltimore, for example, there was also an industrial waterfront poverty, property, Covington Point, and it was actually developed in a manner that it both serves both business and both the general public. So there is a boardwalk. And if I'm looking at the South Bronx, you know, almost none of all the businesses that are present at the waterfront needs access to the water. There, there are no boats coming in and ships coming in. And I wonder whether this land could be developed in a manner so that it also serves the general public so that they can walk along the shoreline and maybe walk over to Randall's Island and I should also say, we should not only look at the South Bronx, so that's my area where I have a community partner, but we should also look at the other boroughs, uh, Brooklyn, Queens, um, for example. <laughs> yeah. I also wanted to kind of add that, you know, it's the compounding effect. So you have air pollution on the one hand, and that's one layer of the environment. And then you have the housing environment. So people that are now basically living at home, but also then disproportionately like exposed to uh, lead and mold and uh, lack of heat, uh, lack of hot water, like all of the things that make our homes viable at this point. That's, I mean, in a lot of these communities that we're talking about and the South Bronx, like, you know, happens to be where I'm situated right now and, you know, where uh, we, we do a lot of work, but it is a really good example of a place that has all of those compounding kind of issues uh, coexisting uh, and really adding to like the levels of risk that people have to face. So they're just not facing the economic risk, they're facing um, environmental risks, some of which are not in their control as you uh, so aptly stated uh, in your opening. One rubric to put that in the risk. Oh, Dr. Pung, I'm sorry. I know you've yeah. been waiting. Thank, thank you, Councilman Torres. So one, one rubric to put that under is sort of stress, stress to the body, stress to the organism, stress to our health. So if you are treated differently because of your skin color, that's a stress. If you live in conditions which are not optimal, that is a stress. If, as Dr. Gill has put it, if you don't have positive mental health, if you have you know, you're hiding your condition. If, if you suffer those things, that's going to affect your health and lead to diabetes, lead to, why do they call it comfort food? Because I eat because I have to deal with this stress somehow. Why do people smoke? Yes, nicotine is addition, an addiction, but also I can walk out and I see, um, it doesn't matter what color you are, truck drivers, restaurant workers, I see them all smoking because that's about their job and their job stress and what 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 conditions do they have? I have 15 minutes for a break. I have to work 12 hours, 10 hours. I need to keep going. I need to drive for eight hours, 10 hours. I need to keep myself awake. How am I going to keep myself going? So, you know, all those stresses to the system will lead to diabetes, will lead to high blood pressure, will lead to obes obesity, will lead to mental health conditions. So, you know, that's a easier way to understand for a lot of our patients. They, if you ask them, how are you stressed? And amazingly, they deal with it. They say, I'm doing okay. But if you ask, how are they living? What are your living conditions? Um, and not just having a job. Do you have a job where you feel respected? Do you have a job where you're valued? Or I feel so much for people. I see people driving, I think their own cars in the street delivering Amazon boxes because Amazon calls them an independent contractor and won't give them any benefits, right? So how can the city council help with all these kinds of factors? Any little thing that can they help uh, would help our populations, to help our most vulnerable populations. We must really reach out and look to them and not to our corporate, I hate to say our corporate interests, though we rely on them for our taxes and tax income. Thank, Thank you. you. So, I, you know, there's been, Dr. Pong mentioned the word stress, Dr. Hernandez, I believe you mentioned the word trauma, Dr. Gill, you mentioned the word mental health. Uh, 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 you know, infectious diseases have the power to traumatize, right? You know, if you think of the Colombian exchange, 
Important diseases like smallpox have had long and lasting consequences for indigenous populations. AIDS continues to traumatize the LGBTQ community. What, what are the long, and this is a hard question to answer, but what's the long-term impact on the psyche of, of the Asian community, the Latino community, the African-American community? The impact of the COVID epidemic? Yes. Um, the psychological legacy that this will leave behind like other places have done. It's going to leave a lot of trauma behind because there have been a lot of death in our community. And many times, you know, what it is, the families have not been able to grieve appropriately. As a matter of fact, some of the bodies have not been able, you know, they, they, they have not been taken to uh, the appropriate burying places. So there's a tremendous amount of guilt that we already see uh, in our community um, because they feel that they were responsible in a way for, for this death. Um, uh, they are responsible for not even taking care of, of um, those loved ones who die and who die by themselves in, in a bed, in a hospital, removed from the love of the community. Um, these are very traumatic uh, events that, um, you know, we are going to see for quite a long time, Chairman Torres. And I have to point out that children, we have not yet focused on the impact of COVID on children. Their home, uh, they are like Dr. Hernandez had indicated, you know, the housing conditions, you know, maybe there are 10 people living in one bedroom apartment. And those kids are supposed to be attending school and have a computer to attend school. And there, you know, we see, for example, the 35% of the Latin adolescents at risk of suicide have experienced physical or sexual abuse. So all these stressors now of COVID, Chairman Torres, are going to be uh, really impactful on those families uh, and, the, and the community. And I don't see that we're really beginning to focus on that. That's my perspective. I don't know the other colleagues here and on the panel. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, I called it mass trauma from compounding losses, right? You have the academic and the learning losses uh, that are, you know, stemming from just lack of engagement and, uh, you know, not being in school and being scared. I think our children just don't really, you know, have the tools to really understand what's going on. There's the economic losses and the loss of identity. And some of that is about familial ties, right? Like if you're no longer a daughter because you're, you know, your parents have passed or something else about your relationships has changed as a result of this, there are so many dimensions. And I talked about unceremonious deaths. And I think that that's, you know, for those of us that think about the mourning process and the need for closure, and that's not available because of how people are dying and dying alone, uh, there's a certain trauma to that. So yes, uh, you know, Dr. Gill, I think, I thank you for uh, raising the mental health uh, issues. I mean, I think those are the unseen effects, uh, but I think those will probably be the like longer standing ones. Uh, so thanks for raising the awareness about that. And Dr. Chen, I think you had a... Yes. Um, as um, primary care physician in the community, we hear a lot of a sad story in this uh, COVID-19. And I would like to have a, a request the, the chairman and the city council member to prove some funding to those people who really needed the housing. Because as you know, the Latino community and the Asian community, many of them live in just one small apartment. And with the multiple generations, many times, anywhere from four to eight to 10 people living together. Now with the stay home order, and if one gets infected, and the whole family will be infected. We do see many patients with three, four family members infected. Only one of the kids is spared. I have very sad story among the Chinese population. And a couple all get sick. And with the three years old kids and stay home. And they all live in one room apartment. Who's going to take care of these kids? And who's going to take care of the young parents? And I have another patient, a little bit better off life, and four family together. 
and three got infected, and one because she wear the mask and spare. So how do we help these people? We all understand and stay home. We keep six feet, but with a small apartment, how do you keep six feet? And among the, the family member, and they even they either go out of the door or they jump out the window. Otherwise, they can keep six feet uh, social distance. So it, it is a difficult time, and we would like to have a city council to provide some sort of a, the hotel or or that we send those kind of we call comfort hospital to identify those COVID positive patients and put them in one location, help them out, do not cause this cluster outbreak out. We call cluster breakout either from one family, either from a small community. This is a huge breakout among New York City. Why? New York City has the most of the um, cases among the entire New York, uh, entire US because we all living in a very tight condition. So that is the fundamental issue. We need to have the policymaker to address this, to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, please note that if you want to submit written testimony for the record, you can email it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. So thank you all. And now we'll be moving on to our next panel, uh, which will consist of Steve Choi, Beatrice Diaz Tavares, Haley Gorenberg, Barika Williams, Adrian Holder, and Melissa Sklar. Council members who have questions for anyone on this panel should use the raise hand function in Zoom and the chair will call on you after all of the panelists have completed their testimony. Once the chair calls on you, please specify which specific panelists you are directing your question to so that the panel knows who should answer. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and then you can begin your testimony. Once you are finished, please remain on the line as we will then open it up to council member questions once members of this panel have delivered their testimony. Again, if you have written testimony for this panel, please submit it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. So first I'd like to welcome Steve Choi to testify, who will then be followed by Beatrice Diaz Tavares. Steve Choi. Time begins now. Is Steve Choi on? If not, then I ask Beatrice Diaz Tavares to please testify. I will begin when you speak. Thank you. And good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Torres, for hosting this very important. I'm going to echo many of what my colleagues have said before, but it's so important to hear. Because as you know, COVID-19 has really exposed the, the disparities in our communities, particularly with immigrants and community of color. It's been disproportionate and it's going to be lasting. But even before this pandemic, our clients were already reporting a high level of anxiety, fear, distress, uncertainty, instability in family life, economic insecurity, lack of income and food insecurity. This combination has effectively acted as pre-existing conditions and has intensified the health, social, economic, and financial challenges that have become increasingly dire each day. I do want to focus on certain areas. So at Catholic Charities, we realized the need that was going, that is there. So not only did we start open up our food pantries, but we did what we're calling pop-up pantries because it's not the traditional areas of food pantries, but it's actually different areas that are needed. So we have gone into the Betances NYCHA housing. We have gone into Inwood, into Washington Heights, where on a special day, we will bring additional food bags to help those families. We have distributed over 57,000 bags of food to uh, meals 
in these different pop-up pantries. Our day laborers continue to do outreach. We visit our paradas at least three times a week and we're giving the men information. We're giving them sanitizers, masks, as much as we can. And we're also on a chat with them, really providing them information. And our youth services, do continue to provide services. We're at one of the regional enrichment centers, but we're also doing wellness checks. We're calling the students, we're helping them access the technology that is needed, especially in this time. But we are concerned. We're concerned because with the stay at home, we are concerned about the domestic violence that many of our family members may be experiencing. And that is a concern that we, we like to raise before this chair. We also want to assure that as we consider all the legislation, as we consider what is necessary for the city, that we really give a thought of what is sustainable and what we need in our recovery, where we want to stress all New Yorkers, undocumented, documented, have access to the services they need. We ask that you consider it and it be pivotal and cost effective. I think one of my colleagues previously said, why should we have to suffer? You know, it's always the social service agencies, it's always our communities that suffer when these cuts come. And we must all the vulnerable New Yorkers with services and ensure the that their providers, all of the community-based organizations receive the resources that are needed to continue to serve our communities. We wanna to continue to partner with the city and we really want to be there to help our communities move forward. There is going to be such an economic devastation. Our day laborers are still standing on the corner waiting for jobs, but they're not being picked up for jobs as we know. We have all the family members. We have multi-generational families. And I think the doctor before said it, we can't practice social distancing in our apartments. And there is why we have such the pandemic among the African American and Latino communities. I thank you for this opportunity and for this time. And we're here to partner with the city to see our communities go forth. Thank you, Beatrice. Please stay on the line as there will be council member questioning after every member on this panel has spoken. Uh, next, we will turn to Steve Choi to testify, who will be followed by Haley Gorenberg. Steve Choi. Time begins now. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Choi. I'm the executive director of the New York Immigration Coalition. We're an umbrella organization that works with over 200 immigrant serving member organizations, including some of the great ones who are testifying today. Thank you to Speaker Johnson. Thank you to Chair Torres and the members of this committee for convening this important hearing. With over 12,000 confirmed deaths in New York City, the horrific impact of this pandemic cannot be understated. This disease does not discriminate. It doesn't care about your race or ethnicity. It has, however, been preying on communities of color that were already affected by many longstanding policies. On the economic front, it's obvious to see. The five zip codes with the highest rate of positive tests for the coronavirus are in the neighborhoods of Corona, Cambria Heights, East Elmhurst, Queens Village, and Jackson Heights. All of these are low-income communities of color with large immigrant populations in Queens, which has been hit the hardest. This pandemic has resulted in catastrophic job losses for so many of the immigrants who make the city run. In late March, a CUNY study showed more than 40% of the city's Latinx population either had lost their jobs or had a household member lose their jobs. The impact on the city's Chinese and Asian immigrant businesses was severe even before the pandemic really hit due to anti-Asian discrimination and wrongful notions around the Chinese community. So the economic toll on our city's immigrants has been devastating. But beyond economics, the life and death impact of this pandemic, literally life and death has been tragic. The racial disparity is very evident with the overwhelming amount of deaths by black and brown New Yorkers in relation to their population. Black New Yorkers make up nearly 34% of non-fatal folks hospitalized and 29% of the deaths, even though they're only 24% of the city's population. The same is true for Latinx New Yorkers who make up 24.8% of the population, but account for more than 27% of the deaths. 
This is no surprise as race directly correlates with poverty, a lack of sick leave, exposure to pollution, jobs that leave employees exposed, and a need to take public transportation and immigration status. All of these can be real sources of exposure and potential health effects and death. The effect on immigrant communities of color has been felt beyond those who've contracted the virus. Foreign born workers held 49% of all private jobs before the pandemic crisis, but now they account for 54% of the lost jobs. Jobs lost by undocumented New Yorkers make up one in six New York City jobs lost due to the pandemic, and yet undocumented workers were intentionally excluded from the federally funded unemployment benefits or the cash assistance relief that was authorized by Congress. So what can the council do? We need to start in our low income immigrant communities and communities of color. We have a New York United campaign that has identified several common sense measures one, create an emergency cash assistance fund for those New Yorkers left out. Two, restore and baseline adult literacy funding, $12 million, to make sure that immigrant parents can have their children access remote learning. And third, renew $58 million in funding for immigration legal services to ensure continuity of services and help keep immigrants secure and safe against both Washington and this pandemic. Once again, thank you for convening this important hearing and allowing me to testify. We are committed to working with you all to come up with solutions to ensure that all communities of color have an opportunity to recover from the threat of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Please stay on the line as there will be council member questioning once everyone has testified on this panel. Next, we will welcome Haley Gorenberg to testify followed by Barico Williams. Haley. Thank you. The pandemic may have shocked us, but once it arrived, the disparate devastation in communities of color didn't. I'm the legal director of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. We're multidisciplinary, we're community driven, and there's a lot to say and do, so I will trim and address medical access, health disparities, particularly tied to environmental justice, and resources for young people. Medical access. Getting accurate medical information can influence whether you live or die. What gets in the way? Aware of misinformation circulating in immigrant communities, we started live streaming and recording medical and legal information in Spanish to thousands of households in the city, featuring our lawyer running Milpi's UndocuCare project, covering public charge with Steve's organization and with Spanish speaking doctors drawn from Milpi's medical providers network, including information relevant to people who can't stay home every day. I second Dr. Ford from the first panel about the lessons from the HIV epidemic and the need to address medical misinformation and mistrust in black communities rooted in generations of racist medical exploitation and believe black women. Accounts of worsening illness and death after health concerns of black women were reportedly discounted are circulating widely and they undermine effective access to healthcare. So NILPI recommends the city amplify the voices of trusted, reliable speakers and communities of color to keep high quality information in wide circulation. Ensure interpreters, including sign language interpreters. If we don't have them on site, video conferencing is next best. It's permissible to use non-professionals like, non, like family members in emergencies, but now when people are more likely to show up solo for medical care to reduce exposure of or through others who aren't patients, it's even more important that we have interpreters available. Keep and grow what works. Telemedicine could be a prime example. It's not just because we are on pause, but also because it's a good modality for many people with disabilities and it could improve their healthcare ongoing. Investigating and troubleshooting effective access to telemedicine could promote health for communities of color. Improving healthcare access can help address key disparities, which means more people from communities disproportionately affected, primarily communities of color, will survive. Turning next to those health disparities, especially underlying conditions that we've discussed as tied to environmental just injustice or environmental racism, asthma, heart disease, diabetes, many of these serious health conditions that facilitate COVID-19's most deadly turns tie to environmental racism. Bluntly, our first COVID-19 question at NLP was, how will our communities get screwed? Our analysis of health disparities led to the conclusion, our communities have already been pre-screwed by the impact of racism. 
With this hearing, let's get going and unscrew these disparities. Take one example, our urban air pollution. Mounting evidence, the Harvard study that Chair Torres just raised, shows us that dangerous fine particles amp the deadliness of COVID-19. Pollution is down for the moment. Let's seize the opportunity for real progress. Cre create renewable Rikers. Renewable Rikers would convert the city's notorious criminal hellhole and a COVID-19 danger into a cutting edge urban engine for environmental energy progress. Renewable Rikers can clear the air and give good green jobs to communities of color most damaged by mass incarceration and now by COVID-19. Trade out diesel school buses. With school bus depots concentrated in communities of color, more buses churn out fine particulates and deal a double or triple whammy to low-income communities of color clobbered by COVID-19. Electric buses will give us cleaner air in communities of color with so many bus hubs and cleaner air throughout the city. And let's remember the air quality inside, Dr. Hernandez mentioned, where we're spending a lot of time robustly enforcing local law 55 will combat dangerous mold, reducing the impact of asthma and allergies, particularly for heavily affected low-income communities of color. Better breathing can link to better survivability in the age of COVID-19. Final point, resources for young people. Okay, on a gray day inside our Zoom room, it may not feel like summer is around the corner, but it is. We are not alone in our deep dismay at the city's cutting the summer youth employment program. We've axed, and I quote, the nation's largest youth employment program connecting New York City youth with career exploration opportunities and paid work to explore their interests in career pathways, workplace skills, leadership skills, so that New York City youth are better prepared for careers of the future. What are the creative alternatives that will allow us to invest in our young people? More innovative partnerships, more remote work placements that could boost the city's recovery. NILPI is committing to taking on more summer interns, not fewer. It will take creative supervision. It will take resources. It will be worth it. Part of what we're seeking to do is contribute to a professional pipeline for young people of color. We need creative investment in young people who rely on these opportunities. And when we get back to school, that creative investment must continue throughout any budget difficulties. So our race discrimination case focused on lack of equitable access for black and Latinx students to public school interscholastic sports seeks to level that playing field for teams and funding. The Fair Play Coalition is campaigning now online, underscoring how the palpable lack of teams for everyone right now should motivate understanding of the problem and propel approaches that yield fairnesses, not more racial inequity when our students go back to school. Sports promote physical and mental health teach teamwork and leadership, tie to college opportunities. It's about much more than playing games. Two final notes on school-related well-being for students of color. As the school system lurched into remote learning, we started individually calling our special ed clients. Our families have not gotten clear messages about getting tech like iPads for their kids. City surveys were understood as deadlines our clients thought they missed. Meanwhile, on my city parenting list, a list of mixed privilege, there is a thread called unsolicited iPads with many families wondering why they got an iPad in the mail while others are beside themselves because their children don't have the tech they need. The DOE phone line to try and address the problem is widely regarded as unusable. Can we please fix this? Now, in the course of these calls, I was actually surprised that we didn't hear more initially about curricular complaints until our social worker told me her recent call blew right by special ed because the mother needed food and was afraid to leave her apartment due to family vulnerabilities. Making sure multilingual messaging about the New York City Food Delivery Assistance Program, including information on culturally significant specifics like halal meals, really penetrates in communities with high need will help ensure the program hits home. I'm sending more in writing. Our entire team at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest Thanks, Speaker Johnson, and thanks you, Chair Torres, for this vital conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Please stay on the line as we will open it up for council member questioning once everyone has testified. Next, we will welcome Barika Williams to testify, who will be followed by Adrienne Holder. Barika? I begin now. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Good evening, I guess, uh, and thank you to Speaker Johnson and to Chair Torres um, and for 
to the Black and Latino and Asian caucus members, especially for having this conversation. Um, I'm going to um, trim a little bit of what I would say, would have said, um, because I don't want to repeat things that others have previously said. Um, uh, my name is Barika Williams. I'm the executive director at ANHD, the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Um, and we serve more than 80 local nonprofits uh, across the city who work on housing and equitable um, economic justice work. Um, uh, we actively are listening to all of our members and all of our partners retooling and working to support um, their work in low income and primarily in communities of color and neighborhoods across the city. That's who our groups um, serve. Uh, ANHD was one of the first and early organizations to provide data and mapping that linked um, what we saw in terms of neighborhoods that we know historically have been vulnerable for years and for decades um, tied to where we were seeing COVID cases. Um, many people have highlighted this data, so I'm not going to restate it, but I do want to emphasize that this is not strictly tied to COVID cases and people of color. It, may, it layers many of the different vulnerabilities and disparities that we've seen for, for decades. So that includes rent burden, um, housing instability, uh, limited access to banking and financial resources, um, uh, the ability to sort of absorb and cope a financial hardship. Um, uh, and uh, where we also see the majority of our frontline workers. So we've got all of these vulnerabilities layered with the people who every single day are going in and putting themselves and their families at risk. Um, uh, also sort of a, a key piece to highlight is that, um, and, and I know one of the previous panelists, the doctors in the first panel mentioned this, um, but I really wanna draw on the fact that where, where we are now is a product of decisions um, that had a disparate impact on communities of color that this administration and previous administrations over the past decades have had because there was not an explicit understanding of a racial analysis lens and because these communities weren't listened to in terms of what they needed uh, in order to survive and thrive as independent communities and neighborhoods themselves. Um, ANHD did a series of work looking at uh, 18 hospitals that have closed over, over the past um, uh, 20 or so years in New York City. These neighborhoods and these hospital closures are directly um, overlap with where we see some of the highest rates of COVID cases. Likewise, um, in a quarantine and in a pause society, you can understand that it's very difficult um, for people to think about how to um, manage being safe and maintaining um, safety and health when they live in a food desert and accessing any kind of um, grocery store or food, um, let alone affordable grocery stores and food uh, means that they previously they were commuting. Okay. Um, so I also wanna highlight um, one of the things that others have drawn on. Uh, we know that the city has a, taken this approach of um, cutting uh, discretionary funds. Uh, I really want to highlight, we understand and appreciate the city's um, challenge and financial position, but really want to highlight that this shows a lack of how government is understanding, a lack of understanding of how government connects with communities of color. This would be cutting the very community, the very organizations that serve um, these, these tenants in these neighborhoods and these residents. So for ANHD and our groups, that means that we would be looking at not providing uh, advice to tenants who are struggling to pay rent, who are struggling for, um, with mortgages, who are facing evictions or foreclosures at the conclusion of this crisis. Um, these are the groups that are taking in the calls from NYCHA um, around safety protocols and what to do if a member of your household has died and passed away, but you're a NYCHA tenant. Um, uh, and likewise, we're the groups that are, are working with this, this ANHD, but also many of the others who have spoken who are working with the small businesses um, in communities of color who are undocumented, who operate in a cash economy um, to ensure that they are being supported and that they are in a place to support their workers. Um, Councilmember Torres specifically asked a question of what, um, what he should ask and what the, the council should ask differently. Um, and I would say one thing to highlight um, is that in the mayor's proposed task force, there is no task force on housing. Um, and we already know that every single two weeks, if not every single month, we are facing a crisis of how people are going to make their next payment, whether it's rent or mortgage. So the idea that that critical piece of economic instability right now is not even being, being considered um, in their framework is deeply, deeply troubling. Um, so I'll... Um, 
submit more as written testimony and uh, thank you for, for letting me speak. Thank you, Barika. Please stay on the line as they, we will be opening it up for council mm -hmm. member questioning once all members of this panel have delivered their testimony. Next, we will call upon Adrienne Holder to testify. We'll be followed by our last speaker for this panel, Melissa Sklars. Adrienne? Time begins now. Oh, good, good, uh, good evening. Um, I'm Adrienne Holder. I'm the attorney in charge of the Civil Practice of the Legal Aid Society. I'm here today to, to speak on behalf of the entire society, thinking um, um, that three minutes might not really be enough, so I'm going to try to make it really quick. Um, there's a lot of things when you think about the criminal defense practice, the civil practice, and the juvenile rights practice that we've observed with our um, client base and we've seen on the ground that we want to share, um, and we will be submitting um, some really comprehensive of testimony that actually goes into some recommendations. The horrifying consequence of the racial inequity in New York City are perhaps the, the most striking apparent parent in our criminal justice system. Uh, Black and Latinx people are more likely to be stopped and arrested and experience the personal costs of burdens associated with defending a criminal accusation. Not surprisingly, disproportionate arrests lead to gross overrepresentation in the city's jails and state prison systems. Uh, places often lacking in adequate medical care, programming, and support during the most normal of times. But during the pandemic, people of color, may uh, many already with pre-existing medical conditions, results in sickness and in death. Uh, New York City must continue to significantly reduce the number of people who are incarcerated in the city jails, and jails are a breeding ground for violence, disease, and death. COVID-19 only highlights that fact. And when the crisis is over, the jails will continue to be a dangerous place for people who are incarcerated and the people who work there. Um, youth detention should not return um, to high pre-COVID uh, rates. With a total of 17 young people um, being held in detention throughout New York City, whereas around this time last year, there, there were actually 39 youth in detention, it is apparent that many Black and Latinx young people have been unnecessarily detained and exposed to harmful trauma. Um, we owe it to them to change the way we address juvenile justice and re reduce our reliance on detention. During the COVID uh, pandemic, the number of New York City Administration of Children's Services filings, so those are instances in which ACS files a petition in family court alleging abuse or neglect of a child against a parent has shrunk dramatically. Although official figures are not currently available and more about data later, um, uh, our experience indicates a reduction of more than 50%. Uh, the dramatic reduction suggests that ACS recognizes that many more children can be safely maintained in their homes than it previously acknowledged, and a smaller number of cases filed in court means a reduction in the trauma of court intervention in the lives of people of color in New York City. ACS should continue to prioritize supporting children in their homes instead of returning to their over-reliance on court interventions and removal proceedings, which are traumatic for many children, all of our children. Um, the Department of Education, we've already heard it, I won't restate it, but yes, needs to provide children with access to technology and internet access. And in addition to that, we need to be mindful when we're looking at the educational issues around our children who have special needs um, and are not getting some of their special education therapies during this time. Um, they're falling behind at a dramatically- um, I'm expired. The overrepresentation of communities of color experiencing homelessness is staggering. 86% of homeless single adults identify as black or, his, or Latinx with only 10% um, of homeless single adults identifying as white. Individuals seeking shelter alone, which include the single adult population and runaway and homeless uh, youth are most at risk during this pandemic. The Department of Homeless Services shelters for single adults and the Department of Youth and Community Development uh, shelters for one, runaway and homeless youth are congregate facilities, preventing these populations from practicing social distancing. Residents in these shelters share bathrooms, use communal eating spaces, and may sleep only three feet from the person in the next bed. Homeless New Yorkers on the streets face an even different set of risks. And while this population generally lacks access to food, bathrooms, showers, and toiletries, the issue has become more acute as businesses and food programs have shuttered due to the pandemic. DHS refuses to offer isolation beds in hotels to this population and in violation of CDC guidance, the NYPD continues to push people out of subways and to sweep out temporary spaces. People living in the streets may have found without offering any real alternatives. Um, and so as a result, our homeless neighbors are left without any sustainable or safe options during this pandemic. 
Um, and, and again, data uh, really quickly. The Coalition of the Homeless notes that as of April 21st, the overall New York City uh, morale, uh, mortality rate due to COVID-19 was 117 deaths per 100,000 people. The age adjusted rate for sheltered homeless New Yorkers is 184 deaths per 100,000 New Yorkers. There's, there are a wide variety of steps this, the city can take to provide additional protection to homeless New Yorkers. And the Legal Aid Society supports the passage of intro number uh, 1927, which would require DHS to offer private hotel rooms to all homeless single adults, including homeless youth and um, unsheltered individuals to prevent further transmission of the virus and protect this vulnerable population. The city also needs to provide additional personal protective equipment to shelter residents and staff. And we support the mayor's decision to expand testing to include individuals living and working in homeless shelters. But the, the testing must be widespread, voluntary, and not used as a means to deter people from seeking shelter. Um, we've addressed a lot of the housing um, um, instability and, pre and um, preventing homelessness issues, but I just would like to say that um, HRA plays a critical role in addressing the dramatic increase in housing instability and risk of homelessness caused by COVID-19 crisis, and it's essential that HRA work with stakeholders to obtain rent arrears and sustainable subsidies for more New Yorkers. 44% of New York City renters are rent burdened, and four out of 10 low-income people in New York are either homeless or severely rent burdened. Even in a strong economy, a budget overwhelmed by housing costs increases a family's risk of food insecurity, lack of access to proper medical care and eviction, and with little room for savings, a reduction in work hours or an unexpected expense cause turmoil and may lead to displacement. Similar to the COVID-19 pandemic, involuntary displacement is not born equally. In New York City, low-income Black and Latinx households are most impacted by eviction and homelessness. And we understand the city budget may not be able to support this, but we urge the council to make the case to our congressional delegation for this money. Quickly, low-wage workers, for workers, decisions must be made for them at their work sites on science and worker safety, not the economy. There must be strong, unambiguous, and enforceable workplace safety rules established and mandated and increased PPE for all workers provided by employers. Low-income workers and workers of color are employed in industries that are the backbone of this economy. They cook and prepare our food. They clean and maintain our hospitals, our warehouses, our offices, and other workspaces. They deliver packages. They build our buildings. They drive our vehicles, and they take care of our children and the elderly. Because these jobs are so low paying, low income workers cannot afford at any to take any time off and must work to survive. Their lives and the health and safety of our communities are at stake. Workers must have stronger protections against work, workplace retaliation, especially when commenting or complaining about workplace safety. Employers must provide PPE for all essential workers, hazard pay and paid sick leave for employees who contract COVID-19 or have uh, comorbidities comorbid, um, that put them at higher risk of COVID-19 related deaths. And we have a whole list of things that HRA can do to, to continue to expand access um, to, um, 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 sub, uh, to real benefits. Um, we need them to not only provide online uh, access, but even for folks who need to call in to make sure that people don't waste their minutes on hold only to have the calls drop. And there's a whole list that we'll have in the testimony to share with you. I know I'm way over time, but let me just say that it is shameful to me that tomorrow will be May 1st and we have no data from HRA on the numbers of applications they're receiving and those outcomes of those applications. HRA tells us the demand is unprecedented and it's huge and we have no doubt that the numbers are huge, but without data, how does it tell the story um, that HRA cannot possibly process these cases without legal guidelines given their current resources? And so I think data is actually one thing the city council can get. It's a free ask. Um, we need it in all the areas, as a lot of my esteemed colleagues who have been testifying all day will tell you. We need it in all areas, not only to track what it is that we need to do in terms of being responsive to the needs of our um, um, uh, communities of color, but we need it in actually really reformulating what the policies are. Um, the mayor should also include these numbers in his daily briefings. After all, I think it's a critical part of the city's response to this pandemic. And so I will end there. Um, I, I look forward to a continued conversation because this has been so, so important and so enlightening for me um, today. This is one of the best hearings and I really do appreciate the speaker and um, Council Member Torres, as well as BLAC for, for having this really necessary uh, hearing for us to begin this conversation and really do something. Crisis demands redefinition, and now is the time for us to redefine how it is that we are going to respond to the needs of, of our communities. And you know,
know, going back to normal is not an option. It has never been good for our clients and we certainly don't need that in this, in this instance. Thank you. Thank you, Adrienne. Please stay on the line as we will open it up for council member questioning after our last speaker for this panel. And now we welcome our last speaker for this panel, Melissa Sklarz, to testify. The time begins now. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson. I want to thank Committee Chair Torres for inviting Sage to speak here today, this important committee on communities of color. Um, my name is Melissa Sklars. I'm the government relations strategist. I'm here speaking on behalf of Michael Adams about a conflict. Uh, he's the CEO of SAGE. SAGE is the leading provider of services and supports for LGBT older adults in New York City. Our programs include SAGE centers in Midtown Manhattan, Harlem, Bronx, and Staten Island, as well as in Brooklyn with partnership of Griot Circle, affordable elder housing in Brooklyn and soon to be in the Bronx, case management, mental health. Among our uh, SAGE LGBT elder constituents, more than 1,300 are elders of color. LGBT elders in general, uh, and specifically elders of color, are living at the epicenter of COVID-19, not only because of age, but because of high levels of underlying health, like HIV and diabetes, high levels of poverty, food and housing insecurity, lower access to health care and supportive services social isolation and thin support networks and mistrust of government based on historical and discrimination and mistreatment. All of these challenges uh, further exasperate transgender elders of color. Uh, the the COVID-19 pandemic shines a, a powerful spotlight on these inequities. We already know people of color are being sick, hospitalized, dying at harder rates. It's true for elders, and it's much true for LGBT elders and LGBT elders of color. Uh, much in New York is, is sheltering in place. Many LGBT elders of color who say it serves are still leaving work, still leaving home to work out of economic necessity. They're essential workers. They're employed in service sectors. Many are forced to leave their homes because they're caregivers. It's extremely risky for uh, LGBT elders of color because in our experience, uh, PPE is not available in communities of color. Many of our elders live in low income neighborhoods with fewer supermarkets, traveling further to buy food. Many are struggling to put food in the table. 62% of elders of color who SAGE serves and 50% of our constituents of color in Harlem are nutritionally insecure. LGBT older adults of color by, that serve by SAGE are more than twice as likely uh, to lack internet access at home, a troubling gap in equity that the internet is one of the few means of social connection during this crisis. LGBT elders of color receive this, uh, the support that they need mostly from us. And now without us being there, we've been forced to pivot. We have SAGE staff is, uh, with 1,700 wellness volunteer calls in the Bronx and Harlem and Grio and Brooklyn, there have been more than 400 calls to elders. Um, these calls are important. They, there's uh, our constituents hear a voice. It stays connected and knows that people are there and can help out. But outside of telephone support, there is so much more that, that needs to be done. We have a new volunteer base. Thank you, called Sage Connect, which will match volunteers with elders who need to receive calls. Um, we hope to make Sage Connect available in Spanish as well as English and are working to accomplish this. Uh, to continue this, we've converted our inside Sage centers into a virtual and telephone programs that are attracting hundreds of elder partic participants. We have 19 programs up in the Bronx and Harlem. If Michael was here, he would have a lot more to say. We, we do want to make, Michael Adams has a series of eight suggestions he wants to make to New York City, New York City Council, um, that we need programs that are designed to address the unique needs of LGBT elders, like those in uh, SAGE and Griot Circle. All elder services um, must be classified as essential services that continue to be funded. COVID-19 relief funds should be allocated by the Council for Programs that Serve LGBT Elders of Color and LGBTQ Elders more generally. Funding should be allocated to organize and support volunteer programs. New York Central Meal Delivery Program, Get Food, must ensure all LGBTQ elders of color and LGBTQ elders receive home-delivered meals if they are in need. 
Low-income neighborhoods of color and senior centers should be prioritized for distribution of PPE. To ensure internet access, there must be a new program to distribute tablets to NYCHA residents, and that should be expanded to include LGBT people. And finally, the city's prior program providing mobile Wi-Fi vans should be expanded into low-income neighborhoods across New York City. Thank you so much for Richie Torres and for Speaker Johnson for allowing us to speak today. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, now we will turn to Chair Torres for questions. Just to note that during the questioning period, panelists and council members who are asking questions, please leave your mics unmuted. And a reminder to everyone on this panel that if you have written testimony to submit, please submit it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Now turning it over to Chair Torres. I, I wanna thank all the panelists for your testimony. I wanna thank Marika, uh, your point is well taken about the lack of a housing task force. And Adrian, your point is well taken about the need for HRA data. So I took notes on both of those items. Um, Perika, something you said stuck with me. You, you spoke about a race analysis. And I often feel e even the manner in which we approach public health or infectious disease control might appear neutral on the surface, but has real world exclusionary effects. So one example is a drive through testing. You know, creates barriers for those who do not have cars or distance learning creates barriers for those who do. So, I mean, how, how do we make government make public health much more race conscious because that uh, that, top, that term stuck with me when you brought it up. I mean, it's it's um, it, I, I think this speaks to and Adrian mentioned it as well that one of the problems is as if if we try to just restart and restart as normal, we know we're just gonna be mimicking the same type of practices that embed all of those racial disparities and all those systems of inequities in them, right? So ANHD, our members, our Thriving Communities Co Coalition that works on land use that has worked with you all and the council so much has had long, hard discussions and has not come to any consensus with New York City's city planning for years now because they refuse to include any kind of racial analysis in how they approach planning, right? So they're not even willing to think about and approach planning in a way that says this neighborhood that is a neighborhood of color looks different, has a different set of baselines, has a different level of access, and therefore we should think about planning for it differently than this other higher income, wealthier, largely white neighborhood. And that, that's the reality. We can't even get to that threshold. Um, and we know that we need that consistently across the board, right? That we need that in public health. We need that um, when it comes to how we're providing homelessness services, we need that. And so it, I think it begs a real question of if we're going, if the plan is, I know one of the previous panels said something around, if the plan is to give every single community the same, to say, we're going to give each one of our community boards the same level of resources or the same number of testing sites, that's just not going to work, right? We know that that's not going to work. We need testing sites that are open for different hours. We've seen this um, paralleled in ANHD um, signed on to something that Riders Alliance did because some of our train lines are packed because it's the neighborhoods where we have our frontline workers, right? So they still have a massive level of folks who are using mass transit, other neighborhoods don't. I, I, I think it's a real barrier that the city seems to be having a lot of trouble in this moment and has not historically been able to do this. And if they don't, and if we don't do something different, we're just gonna mimic the same processes as before. And ultimately what that's gonna mean is that we're gonna come out of this and leave these communities entirely out of recovery. They're just not, they're not gonna recover, period. And communities of color are overrepresented in shelters, jails, overcrowded apartments, all of which are Petri dishes for infectious disease. Right. Um, Adrian, how, how dire is the situation in Rikers Island or in the city jails, based on what you're hearing from clients, it's 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 really dire. It's it's dire. Um, I mean, and we've we've the our criminal defense practice has been leading the effort to try to get folks out, and has been very successful in getting um, a lot of the vulnerable um, inmates out, and also getting people released early from state prison, um, which again shows that you know. In this crisis, there was able to be a reevaluation as act actually as to who could stay. But you know, we lost a client um, 
to COVID. And, you know, the idea that there are people who were not able to make bail or who are waiting um, 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 processing for low level offenses who are getting infected. And in, in um, case of one of our clients who actually died, I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's outrageous. It's just egregious. And so um, again, the idea that perhaps it's because of people of color, um, that there is not a priority for folks to actually look at what we're doing during this pandemic. I mean, that is the real, the, the real um, loss for all of us that to understand that we need to rise to this occasion. We've proven um, it, that when people think that everyone is being impacted, oh, then that's when people can talk about um, where, whether they need to bring in stimulus and whether we need to have some kind of compassion. We have proven that we can protect one another and we can have high guard, regard from one another when the, the issues seem to span out. But we do know that there's always a winnowing and you know it is a concern that as it continues to go and it looks like um, the, the impact really is more um, um, witnessed and impact uh, falls on people of color, that there's going to be less interest in actually how we solve these problems. And so we really have to talk about how we are going to be moving um, in a new direction. I do not want to return to normal. Normal did not work for our clients. And so we need to, we need to move and we need to move in an effective way, using data in a compassionate way, um, understanding that we're talking about real people who are getting sick and who are dying. I don't know if I. You can hear. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, um, Beatrice, I you hinted at this earlier, but one of the unintended consequences of shelter in place, as far as I can tell, has been a spike in domestic violence. Have you seen that on the ground? And and how do we as a city effectively confront domestic violence in the midst of shelter in place? I think it, it's, it's difficult because right now as we shelter in place, people do not wanna come out and they know that it's very difficult where are they gonna to turn to. So is it that we open up the hotels for people who, um, who need to leave their, their current stay at home? Do we open up more shelters for women and, and children? Because this is, I, we, we, we're not getting the calls, but we know it must be there. And we are concerned because once we, we are out, once we no longer have the stay at home, we are going to see it. And you know, we're concerned for the children who, it's just the children, the women, it is a concern. So can the city council have more hotels available? Can there be some public service announcements made in English and Spanish and all the different languages of New York City so that the women and the children know they have an alternative? I think right now they don't think they have an alternative. I don't know if I... I think there's some, uh, there's a lag in the connection, but I think um, Ms. Gorenberg, did you have your hand up or? Uh, yes, just briefly in connection with the domestic violence point. One of the things that we really um, are looking for the city to meet in terms of commitments is text to 911. And the city has said that with the, the COVID pandemic going on that they will still meet the deadline that they set for June for launching text to 911. And, um, one of the instances, one of the communities that is served by that can be people who are targets of domestic violence to be able to communicate without speaking, if need be, um, through texting. We had come to this from our work with um, deaf communities and hard of hearing communities. There's a lot of disability and uh, communities of color intersectionality, a disproportionate rate of disability um, in communities of color. And so from that perspective and Nopi's work with the Deaf Justice Coalition, we had come to text to 911 being a technology that has to be delivered, but also connects to many other service communities, including people who are targets of domestic violence and have other communication um, barriers. So just seemed like a place to flag that that's supposed to be available. And it's all the more important when we have more emergencies and people are confined in their homes at times to hit that deadline and not miss it in uh, 
the pandemonium of the pandemic. Uh, Melissa, you, you know that Sage has a dear, uh, special place in my heart. Um, and, and I love the, the senior centers that you run for LGBT elders. But for many of those elders who struggle with isolation, those senior centers are a second home. The people at the senior centers are a second family. And so how are your clients coping with the isolation that comes from social distancing? So, so as the testimony suggested, you know, we're doing outreach. We're making sure everyone has food. We, we, we connect with all of them. We're making over 2000 phone calls every month. Um, we want to make sure that all of our constituents are, are safe and in place. Those, those that are struggling, you know, we're there. We're able to make sure they get access to food and case management. No one is left alone and isolated. Um, if need be, we, can, we now have our Sage Connect program, and now we can go, instead of just calling once or twice a month, we can now have people call every day. We want to make sure that people feel connected and that they're, that they're not being left out and that we are well aware of what isolation is like for LGBT elders. Uh, it's, it's the most important part of our mission. It's what we do when we take it very Thank you, Melissa. Um, Bar Barik, I have uh, just one final point. You know, much we, the media often associates um, a high incidence of COVID with, with density. But as far as I can tell, it's not so much density that matters, it's overcrowding at the, at the household level. And overcrowding, it seems to me, is a manifestation of the affordability crisis. People are tripling up or doubling up because the city is becoming unaffordable. Do you want to speak about the connection between the affordability crisis and COVID-19 and how that has made us a petri dish for, for the spread of the disease? Yeah, and I think I think you're you're raising and flagging something that's important. I think one of the things that is a big concern is this um, communication uh, that density is the problem, um, right? And we can look to uh, some of our um, other countries and cities um, that have confronted COVID um, have density levels similar to New York City, sorry, trucks outside, um, density levels similar to New York City, if not higher than New York City, and who have taken the necessary steps, taken it on, um, have provided and, and put forward the resources necessary to support people um, in dense spaces, um, which we really haven't done, right? So uh, being dense, but being housing secure, where you know that you have a place that you can go to, um, where you can control and manage who is in and around you, um, is very different than having an informal um, basement apartment that isn't officially a lease, um, uh, that has multiple people in it, um, where you have a number of potentially undocumented workers, many of whom are being on our, our essential service providers and are receiving no supports in this, right? So I think that that is a clear difference between um, overcrowding and density. Um, and we see that other places have been able to handle um, both this health crisis and density together. Uh, so to make clear that, that density isn't the, the sole problem in this, it's really a matter of supporting people um, and giving them the supports necessary um, to have a stable home um, during this. We know that one of the calls actually specifically has been if you have an impacted person um, and are in an overcrowded household, uh, allowing uh, some of our underutilized and unused hotels um, for the, you to be able to send the person there or send the family member there so that you're not having to force um, that household to be in contact with somebody who is now COVID positive or symptomatic. And we know that those steps largely haven't been, haven't moved forward yet. And, it's, and Steve, um, I have a, you know, no, no community arguably has been hit harder than the immigrant community, especially the undocumented immigrant community, as you pointed out earlier, Elmhurst was the epicenter. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lack of health care in Corona in, in, in communities that represent undocumented immigrants. Can you speak to the relationship between the municipal health care system and the mm -hmm. undocumented immigrant community? Sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, 
So I would say, I think the undocumented immigrant community faces particularly huge challenges. Um, you know, I'm thinking about what Barika said in terms of density. Um, I think there are two things that I would mention. First of all, the undocumented immigrants and not just undocumented immigrants, but mixed status families as well, they were intentionally excluded from the federal government's relief packages. So if you're thinking about the $2.5 trillion that are getting spent out, you're thinking about unemployment benefits, immigrants are not gonna be able to take advantage of that. Undocumented immigrants are not gonna get that. The cash assistance, the $1,200 and up that people are getting in their bank accounts, not only undocumented immigrants, but mixed status families are getting left out of that. Um, and when you think about that, the fact that they've been excluded means in so many ways, they have to be out there on the front lines, you know, driving people to the hospital, cleaning infected facilities, uh, preparing and delivering meals. They have to be because they don't have any other choice. And so I think that's something to really note in terms of them being really exposed to the virus in so many ways. And then to your point, uh, Chairman Torres, um, healthcare is critical. Now, um, because the Trump administration has this public charge rule that basically says that your ability to get a green card or citizenship hinges on your access to benefits, it's caused huge fear in our communities. And there are so many undocumented immigrants that are just fearful at this point that they're not getting the kind of health care that they need uh, right now, largely because of the Trump administration. So it really spells, I, I think, you know, there's an access health program that the speaker has really pushed and other folks have pushed where you have folks who are providing advice to undocumented immigrants across the city. That's more important than ever now, because when you look at the fact that so many undocumented immigrants have foregone health care and are getting sick and are dying as a result, it's more critical than ever that this council be figuring out ways to educate them because it helps keep all of New York City safe. Um, and, and really protected at this time. So that, that's an important point. One, one thing that's of concern to us is we all know there are racial disparities in the overall death toll, but I suspect those disparities are even more profound in the stay at home death toll. Absolutely. I, I think I suspect more people of color and more undocumented immigrants are dying at home and those numbers are oh. not being fully captured. Huge numbers. You know, I just talked to, um, you know, I. I when you think about all the people who are being buried in, you know, in potter's fields and such, and, you know, we're hearing about so many undocumented immigrants that are, you know, at much greater risk of getting sick because they have to be out there because they are living um, in crowded quarters and because they're not accessing health care because of the sphere. Um, absolutely, the undocumented immigrant community is being deeply affected. And it's happening in Queens, it's happening around Latinx community members, but it's also happening with Black, African, um, and Caribbean immigrant community members. And it's happening along a lot of Chinese and Asian immigrant communities as well. This is really something that's just devastating um, for, you know, I, I just talked to a, a member organization where you have a family, both the mother and father are in the hospital facing very severe instances of COVID. And their 13 year old teenage daughter is at home watching two other younger siblings. That is the extent that which it's really affecting immigrant communities, particularly black and brown community members. And it's, it's really a tragedy that, um, you know, it's, I can't believe it's happening in New York City, but it is. Council member Torres, can I, I just wanted to um, highlight since you asked specifically about density, a key data point in this. Sure, yeah. Uh, so when, when people are talking about density being part of the cause of this, um, to really hone in on the difference between density and overcrowding, our, the densest part of New York City is core Manhattan, um, and specifically lower Manhattan, and that is our uh, white neighborhoods and our um, wealthiest neighborhoods, and it is our lowest rate of COVID cases. Um, so I really just want to hone in on the fact that density in and of itself um, is not actually the core issue. It is really tied to access to services, access to wealth, um, communities of color, and overcrowding. Yeah, and there, there have been some interesting data points reported about a decline in 
garbage collection in wealthier neighborhoods because many of the residents have second homes in which to seek refuge or uh, a ridership ten tends to be relatively high in communities of color because communities of color are overrepresented in the public workforce. So I think this, the impact of COVID-19 has revealed the extent to which we are truly a tale of two cities. Yes. So I wanna thank everyone for your insights and, and we're gonna go on to the next panel, but thank you for um, just being so patient. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll be moving on to our next panel, uh, which consists of Carlin Cowan, Beth Finkel, Aracelis Lucero, and Tasfia Rahman. Council members who have questions for anyone on this panel should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and the chair will call on you after all the panelists have completed their testimony. Once the chair calls on you, please specify which specific panelist you are directing your question to so that the panel knows who should answer. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and then you can begin your testimony. Once you are finished, please remain on the line as we will open it up to council member questioning once all members of this panel have delivered their testimony. If you have written testimony that you would like to submit for the record, please submit it to uh, testimony at council.nyc.gov, and this goes for the last panel as well. And uh, so now I would like to welcome Carlin Cowan to testify, who will be followed by Beth Finkel. Carlin? The clock will begin now. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Carlin Cowan, pronouns they, them, she, her, and I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer of the Chinese American Planning Council. Thank you for inviting me to testify tonight. CPC is the nation's largest Asian American social services agency serving over 60,000 Asian American immigrant and low income New Yorkers each year. Through COVID-19, we have continued our services, providing meals for seniors, home care, supporting community members that are facing eviction, navigating benefits, and continuing to provide remote learning, legal services, and other resources. Uh, many of the other advocates that have testified before me have gone into great detail about the racial disparities and disproportionate impacts that we are facing. I want to amplify what all of them have said, and I want to really focus my testimony on what we've been seeing in our community since COVID-19 started. We do daily wellness checks with our community members to collect data on what our community members are experiencing, and I want to share a few key highlights. We have seen huge disproportionate impacts in public health. Community members that have symptoms consistent with COVID-19 have been refusing to seek medical care even when they need it because they don't have insurance or are worried about affording care or that'll lead to them being deported. Community members that are limited English proficient have had inaccurate information or lack up-to-date information about best practices, how to seek care and resources. We've had community members that have died at home before they've even ever gotten testing or care. Community members that are not able to comply by social distancing rules because they're in overcrowded or insecure housing, because they lived in shift or informal housing, and homeless community members don't have access to sanitation or hygiene at all. And in fact, are preferring the streets over seeking shelter because it's a safer option at this point. We've also seen huge economic impacts. And of course, we know that those are inextricably tied to the health impacts. More than half of our community members surveyed have reported that they're out of work or income and will run out of money in the coming weeks. Many of our community members continue to work either because they're essential workers or because they cannot afford to stop working since they've been left out of federal relief and state unemployment benefits. Just as an example, in one of our preschool families, 20 out of 24 families lost all income within two weeks, and less than half of those families qualify for any kind of federal relief or state unemployment, leaving them unable to pay rent, buy groceries, or pay for prescriptions. We have our young people that are caring for their younger siblings while their parents are out at work, and they have been in charge of rationing their families' daily food intake because they're running out of food. We have homebound seniors that are unable to get food delivered through the city's meal program or receiving inadequate meals like bread and butter, like putting fruit cups, crackers, and Cheerios as a meal supply. And of course, on top of all of this, our Asian American communities, particularly our East Asian American community members, have been experiencing the double virus of anti-Asian and anti-Asian American discrimination and racism. 
While all of this is happening, the city is slashing funding to the very programs and social safety net programs that support these community members and help combat these disproportionate health impacts that everyone has been speaking of. Services like our senior programs, homeless services, youth development summer programs, public health and more are more necessary than ever and experiencing more demand, yet the city is cutting them. Discretionary funding, which is often the way that people of color led CBOs access city funding is hanging in the balance. So what I would really urge the city council is to continue to push to fully fund these services and programs that are more critical than ever. We've seen that the NYPD budget has actually largely remained untouched. And we know because of everything that had been talked about today, that the over-policing of communities of color and the expansion of NYPD into social services from the homeless shelters to our subways contributes to adverse public health impacts and fails to keep our community safe and healthy. So we urge the city to invest in social safety nets in our social services programming and our essential human services workers, as well as expanding relief to all community members, regardless of work status or documentation status. And thank you for your leadership on these issues. Thank you very much. Um, I would now like to call the next panelist, Beth Finkel. And after that will be Aracelis Lucero. Beth? Clock will begin now. I thank you. Uh, good evening. I want to thank Speaker Johnson. I want to thank Council Member Torres and the members of the City Council Oversight and Investigations Committee. I've been on since one and I just have to say, I thought I knew a lot about these issues and I have learned so much. And I'm in awe of my advocacy colleagues across all of New York. So thank you all for all of your work. Uh, AARP has uh, 750,000 members in the five boroughs uh, and we represent people who are 50 plus. We've been working on these issues of disparities for quite a while now. Disrupt Disparities has been our hallmark uh, of our work, working with the Hispanic Federation, the Asian American Federation, uh, Urban League, and the NAACP. And together we put out multiple briefs uh, on the issues. So the idea of, as many people have said before me, these disparities have been here for a long time, and now we're really up against the wall with it because the, the clock has been ticking all this time, and now, now people are just really, really in an unfortunate position from all, um, all sides of life here in New York. So when you look about, at it, you, your ARP and our partners have looked at it, it's in three major buckets. It's around um, health care, which has really been at the forefront of our thinking. It's about income, and I think we all know that our next piece of this is looking at economic security and the impact of older New Yorkers on that. And finally, housing quality and trans, uh, transit options and neighborhood safety, which I think are all going to be threatened as we move forward uh, with COVID. So um, we know that um, older, um, older New Yorkers 65 plus uh, have increased by 26%. And these residents are becoming more and more diverse. And we know that uh, communities of color, African American, Blacks, Hispanics, Latinos, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders account for about 62% of New York City residents that are 50 plus. And half of those 65 plus who are living here in New York are foreign born. So we understand all of the disparities that they're going to face coming out of um, their, their lives experiences and where they are right now. So I'm not gonna go read my whole thing. I'm just gonna give you like a bucket list of, in each of those areas of what we need to be focusing on now. I know others have said this, but the lack of data is really uh, very troublesome. We've got to get a handle on the data and get it not only in the communities, but through the age groups. And we know that older people are the ones that are the most besieged on the health front by this disease. So I uh, also need to look at health services in the community. Where are they? We know that nursing homes is where we're getting the most deaths. And we know that the workers in those nursing homes and in home care and in other adult homes are not sufficiently taken care of with PPEs nor with tests. And so it just keeps getting worse. The cycle gets worse. 
the families are estranged from those people in the nursing homes. There's no transparency of what's going on in those nursing homes and adult homes. And we really need somebody to step in and do the right thing here. On top of that, starting to look at economics, debt relief, what's going to happen when the moratorium on rent is over, when the moratorium on student loans is over, what uh, on mortgages, everything else that you can think of. People are not going to wake up three months by, from now, start a paycheck, and then be able to pay those past three months of what they're going to owe on everything. So we've got to have a plan now for how that works. Some, some pieces are in place, but the public has no idea of it. And so it's a massive education job we're going to have to do. I don't have to tell you all about payday lending. We know people are going to come out of the woodwork right now when, when communities of color are put upon. They don't have access to money. All the bad players come out, and they're going to be very susceptible in this environment. So we've really got to make sure that we stop them in their tracks. There's also going to be increased scams. We're already seeing a whole bunch of COVID scams that are targeting older people because that you know they're they're susceptible to it, and it, it's really going to be bad. And then how will we get people back to work? because the older workers are the ones that are gonna get hurt the worst because they were already in trouble to begin with and an older worker loses their job, it's that much harder for them to get a new job. Um, and finally, uh, what, and I know everyone else has said this, but when you look at the diminished government budgets, what's that impact gonna be on senior services and their families? These budgets are cut to the quick right now. They never got the increases that other service areas got. So there's just no room for cutbacks, especially with the huge numbers of older adults in New York. Hunger is an issue that really, I think the city has made uh, really good inroads and we're pleased about that. But as other people have said, we still need a lot more work, make sure we're connecting people to food. But I do think that great inroads have been made there. And I think we need to, to understand what this is going to do to the average New Yorker who thought they had enough money saved for their retirement, but all of a sudden they're either going to be out of work, furloughed, or they're going to have to dip into their savings. So we've got a whole generation of people who thought they were going to get taken care of, who now are no longer going to be taken care of. It's going to make 2008 look like a cakewalk. So, you know, sorry, gloom and doom. And I'm an optimistic person. So uh, there you go. That's from uh, AARP and all of our, our partners in Disrupt Disparities. And thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you, Beth. Please stay on the line as we'll open it up for council member questioning once everyone on this panel has testified. Next, we'll be joined by Aracelis Lucero, followed by Tasfia Rahman. And I turn it over to Aracelis. Clock is starting now. Hi, thank you very much um, uh, to the chairs, to Richie Torres, to Speaker Johnson and all the city council members for allowing us to share our experience as a grassroots community-based organization in the South Bronx. Um, we partner with the Mexican and Latin American immigrant community, um, children, youth, and families to develop strong learners and leaders. Um, we have a community-led and integrated model um, where we have a commitment to strengthening literacy, leadership, and power for the Mexican, Central American, and indigenous community. Um, and to start, I just want to share that in my lifetime as a South Bronx native and an immigration advocate for the past 15 years, I have not witnessed so much disparity play out in one single moment, which has led to such tra tragic outcomes and heartbreaks at an unprecedented magnitude in the way that I'm seeing it play out today, especially for our community and communities of color. Um, the community in which MASA has worked for over two decades is often considered hard to reach, largely undocumented. 95% of the adults are foreign born. 40% um, of the parents have less than a primary school level of education, 85 less than a secondary school of education, and about 25% of the community that we serve speak an indigenous language. Um, the majority earn $30,000 or less for an average household size of four and a half people. Um, and so um, we're also in the South Bronx, as um, many people here have already stated, um, the health disparities definitely um, hit close to home, and especially in the South Bronx, we heard earlier about the impacts of pollution. Um, but we also have a very high child poverty rate, 59% um, in comparison to the entire Bronx, which is 40%. And um, 27% overall for the city. Um, 
And so really the Masa families are often facing complex and overlapping barriers to accessing resources and services, all which impact their health, education, income, and overall well-being. Um, they are navigating complex web of systems and institutions in an unfamiliar language, and often with limited literacy in their primary language. Um, so I cannot stress how terrible it's been on the ground to try to support our families. Um, it has impacted our staff who are and live in the community who have also been um, affected by COVID, who have to quarantine, who live in sometimes similar conditions um, to uh, what, you know, the people that we support live in. Um, many of our community members work in the food service, cleaning, child care, and construction industry. 90% of the Masa families lost their jobs within a week. Um, that we had closed the office and after the city went on pause. Um, and so really the situation has been dire. I'm gonna share a couple of stories um, and um, I'm gonna turn- Time expired. To, um, go fast. Um, Maria is a single parent of two middle school students and a grandmother to an elementary school student that she also cares for. All of them come to her after school program. They, she talked about taping the fridge to prevent her children from frequenting the fridge and wept when speaking about the lack of words she had to explain to her children why she couldn't afford to even buy them a bag of potato chips. Jezabel and her husband had COVID-19 with small children in their house and no other family around to help. They are undocumented, they lost their job as a result and they live paycheck to paycheck. Also within two weeks of the city closing and of being sick, they had run out of food and were too sick to get out of bed and cook for their children. They called for help and, were able to, and we were able to deliver groceries that their children could easily make and predominantly snacks, you know, cold cuts um, that we knew the children could make. Um, in another instance, uh, well, right now we're about feeding about 400 families, our list, uh, 400 meals, our list is growing quickly to 400 families that are looking for food. Um, I speak about food because really um, we've had to respond first to the survival of our community, them living in fear um, and them not being comfortable accessing other resources. Um, and so one of the asks that we would like to have, and I think that Joanne spoke to um, earlier, was the food pantries. Um, we want to make sure that whatever initiatives to deliver food, our families not are, are not always comfortable accessing them. And if they are, they really are not culturally responsive. Um, our community is not eating granola bars and they don't want chips. And so I think that, you know, I know there is um, a lot of need and um, it just needs to be a little bit more accessible to our families. Um, in relation to health, um, there was a recent person, um, Evaristo, he's a 38-year-old recently arrived immigrant man from Mexico whose primary language is Tlapaneco, an indigenous language of Mexico. He does not know how to read or write and has no family here, but a primo or a cousin who is equally as terrified to be discovered by ICE. Evaristo has referred has been referred to us by another family who was severely concerned about his well-being. He is homebound, has been sick for two weeks, and is terrified of going to Lincoln Hospital because of his immigration status. After arranging for someone in Lincoln to help him, I explained the situation and was assured he and assured him he would get some support, but that in full and then the staff in Lincoln, in full transparency, um, shared with me that they would not be able to meet his language or literacy needs, that he would need to have someone who was literate accompany him to fill out paperwork and get him tested. I called Evaristo back to let him know and assured him that he would not be reported to ICE and that health costs would be covered. However, his fear has paralyzed him. He was unable to find someone to go with him and has since been discouraged to go by other community members for fear of all the people living in their home being discovered by ICE. All we were able to do for him now is to deliver daily hot meals. I call him every day hoping um, he made it the next day and to remind him of the help he can have um, access to. Sorry, language access um, is a critical need and just like health um, should be considered a human right. We cannot talk about human rights and not make um, critical and basic services linguistically accessible to all communities of color. Um, and pretend here and talk about, um, you know, human rights, like if everybody has access to them. Um, I'm part of the Language Access Coalition alongside with African Communities Together, the Coalition for um, Asian American Children and Families and the New York um, Immigration Coalition. And since last year, we have been advocating for funds to create language worker cooperatives 
for languages of limited diffusion that include Asian, African, and Latin American indigenous languages. Um, and then just really quickly around education, we are an organization that supports um, our children with education and our families. Um, it has been completely like difficult to move to remote learning. Um, every single challenge that you can imagine, our community has low literacy levels, they have limited English proficiency and low digital literacy. Um, there have been many Masa families where children have gone now at least four to five weeks without being connected. We've requested for ways to ensure that the DOE is understanding and tracking who is not connected and to look into why, and we have yet to know what that looks weeks later after requesting that information. Families until this day are not receiving the special education services that their children are entitled to. Families are not being reached out to in their native languages and in ways that are accessible for them. We have been following up with the district superintendent's office and have been appalled by some of the responses and how they have been reaching out. Most of our community members have low literacy and digital literacy levels and don't speak English. Um, and they are reaching out to families through class jo mo dojo in an email and in English. We have yet to understand why um, they are communicating in ways that they know is not accessible to our community. Um, and so we are advocating for the city council to really stop the massive budget cuts, cuts to education. This is not the time to pull back on our children. Um, this is our future and really immigrant families we feel are gonna really be left behind. They've been ignored. How are we gonna catch them up if we cut all these resources, if there aren't any summer programs, and if there aren't additional supports in September when children have to go back to remote learning, whether it's in person, um, there's a critical need for social emotional um, staff, um, staff, nurses to be present because I assure you that a lot of our communities are not looking out for their social emotional needs, are not able to access them and are terrified um, to come out Outside. Lastly, you know, we all know that the federal stimulus package is not going to support undocumented communities. The city right now has made, um, thanks to a partnership with the Open Society Foundation, some funding available. We need more, or we need to figure out long term how we're going to get especially undocumented immigrants back into the workforce. This includes thinking about, you know, how are we going to we know there's a huge digital, digital um, divide. I don't think we paid enough attention, even as Masa, I have to admit that that was something that was not a high priority and we can't do that anymore. Adult literacy and ESL classes need to be continued to be funded um, because we have now seen how having those skills or not having those skills have led to life and death outcomes. And lastly, I'll just say that the long-term economic impact is going to be dire. Today, we think about survival, but we should also be planning for getting back on our feet. Thank you. Thank you, Arcelis. Please stay on the line for council member questioning after everyone on this panel has spoken. Next, we will welcome Tasfia Rahman, followed by David Nasenti. Turning it to you, Tasfia. Hello, everyone. I'm Tasfia Rahman. Uh, for Asian American children and families. Um, since 1986, CACF is the nation's only pan Asian children and families advocacy organization. And along with the membership of 50 Asian serving and led community based organizations, we lead the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support those in need. The Asian Pacific American EPA population comprises over 15% of New York City. Yet the needs of the APA community are consistently overlooked, misunderstood, and un uncounted. And these inequities are further exacerbated in this crisis. We fear, we are concerned that the, um, because of long-term practices of um, lack of data disaggregation and the historical um, practice of lumping Asian Americans into the other category, we fear that um, infection rates and fatalities related to COVID-19 are being undercounted and inaccurate in the Asian Pacific American community. For example, in the, on, um, as of April 22nd, there were 830 deaths reported in the Asian American community related to COVID, yet at the same time, 1,655 COVID-19 related deaths were relegated to the other or unknown race categories. This shows that the breakdown by race is sporadic and by ethnicity is non-existent. Um, before anything can be properly addressed or assessed in terms of the need, the data is accurate and more data is crucial. Um, the second point that I would like to make is the, the gap in language access in both health and education. 
Um, the delay of disseminating in language information about the pandemic, including social distancing guidelines, has led to a higher risk of exposure to the virus for the most vulnerable in the APA community. Um, while the Health and Hospitals Corporation provides intake forms in the top 10 languages in New York City, community members and frontline workers in the community and the CBOs report that a lack of language assistance throughout various hospital systems, the COVID-19 city hotline and the mobile test centers. The continuing gap in language access has led to our communities to rely once again upon the community-based organizations to serve them in the absence of proper resources by the city. As CBOs act as interpreters and crowdsource translated materials regarding even the most basic of information on the pandemic. And while, while there were resources and information in language on the DOHMH website and Department of Education website, I think it's really important to understand how those information have actually reached to the most marginalized in our communities, considering the digital divide that Aracelis mentioned. Um, and so we are recommending that um, um, how, how many families are being reached or how many families are not being connected be monitored and tracked um, to understand, um, to understand, to make sure that the most vulnerable in our communities aren't falling through the cracks. Um, and, and, and one of the recommendations, one of the ways that city council can protect um, the communities of color is by protecting city council discretionary funding. Discretionary funding, including initiatives such as the Communities of Color Nonprofit Stabilization Fund, CCNSF, as well as Excellence Health NYC, are especially criti critical during this crisis. When smaller nonprofits are lacking a safety net as they continue serving low income, older, marginalized immigrant New Yorkers. Our organizations are providing services, with seniors, as well as delivering meals to combat social isolation, to equipping survivors and victims of gender-based violence with counseling and tools for housing and economic security, as well as disseminating reassurance and information locally for the APA community who are facing anti-Asian discrimination due to xenophobia, racism, and misinformation about COVID-19. Continuing to fund these organizations under initiatives like these is imperative to their sustainability as staff continue and will continue to do so to serve vulnerable community members. But the, um, so the mo communities most impacted by COVID-19 are usually the communities who are heavily dependent on discretionary funding. So it's very important. I, I understand that the city is facing perilous finance in a financial position, but unless, um, ugh, unless these um, discretionary funding is one of the few ways that people of color and communities of color get access to public funding, and it's imperative that these are protected, especially during this time and, and the aftermath of the pandemic. Thank you so much for the opportunity for, uh, to testify and, and your leadership in taking steps to assess and address the disparate impact of COVID-19 on our communities. Thank you, Tesfia. Please stay on the line as we'll open it up for council member questioning once everyone has testified. The next speaker is David Nocenti, followed by Chai Jindasarath. David? Your time will start now. Uh, speaker Johnson and Chair Torres and members of the council, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is David Nocenti. I'm the executive director of Union Settlement which is the oldest and largest social service provider in East Harlem. We have been in East Harlem since 1895. And East Harlem for each of those 125 years has been one of the lowest income communities in New York City. I just wanna say this has been a remarkable hearing. Um, and I'm not gonna to try to repeat all the eloquent testimony that has come before. So I'm gonna make four hopefully quick points. Um, the first being um, we're in a multi-crisis crisis. This is a public health crisis. We're in an economic crisis. We're in a food crisis. We're in a mental health bereavement crisis. We're in multiple other crises simultaneously. And unless we recognize that, we're not gonna make any progress. The second is all of you have listened to all this amazing testimony and you're the most knowledgeable people in the city about what's happening. And yet every one of us has learned a lot just listening to our colleagues. And so what this tells us is nobody understands the depth and the breadth of this. No individual person can, even our collective knowledge, because there's a lot of people who aren't testifying today, we need their knowledge as well. And so there's no way, even at this moment, we know what the impact is, and we certainly don't know what the long-term impact's gonna be. My third point is 
This is a marathon, not a sprint. Every one of us in our organizations, we are running constantly late hours, you know, trying to get things done, trying to save lives. Um, and we're gonna be doing this for a long time. And so we have to recognize that. I just wanna say that this, um, all of you know that this, the impact on communities of color on which we're having a hearing was easily predictable. And if anybody had said, let's have a hearing on February 1st and talk about what the impact's gonna be, we could have said what the impact would be. So government had an astonishingly slow, they were astonishingly slow to recognize and respond to this easily predictable crisis. And the problem with the government response is it's only right now responding to the public health crisis. If you think about what you see on television every day, we're talking about here's the chart of cases and we need to bend the curve. We have bent the curve, it's a plateau now. So what are we doing? We're closing schools, we're doing social distancing, we're wearing masks, we're cleaning. As of last night, we're finally decided we should clean subways. Um, and so I think what we need is government to recognize that there's all these other crises that are out there an economic crisis, a food crisis, a mental health crisis, an education crisis, and that we need people to focus on those crises and bend those curves. What I wanna see is I wanna see elected officials up there showing the chart of the number of people currently unemployed and what that chart will look like if we do nothing. And then the number of people who can't pay the rent and what that chart will look like and how much that's gonna go up if we do nothing. And then how many people have no food in the house and how many more people there will be if we do nothing. And how many businesses are closed and how many nonprofits are closed. And then I want them to come up with a plan for bending those curves to make sure the number of unemployed go down, the number of people who can't pay rent go down, the number of people who have no food goes down, the number of businesses closed go down. That would be a comprehensive response to this multi-crisis crisis. So I'm just gonna leave it there. Uh, I wanna thank the council for having held this hearing. I'm in awe of everybody I've heard before me and I'm sure I'll be in awe of everybody who speaks after me. But I think that government still is underappreciating the impact, the depth, the breadth and the length of this crisis, these crises and that it has to completely change. It has to have a paradigm shift in how it's focusing on this and not just look at it as, how many cases were added today and oh, it went down. So it's better than it was, we're on our way out. So thank you for the opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. Please stay on the line for council member questioning after our last speaker. And our last speaker for this panel is Chai Jindesar. Chai? Time will start. All right, hi, good evening everyone and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, thank you, Councilmember Torres. Um, thank you to our coalition partners, some of whom I see have already uh, spoken to the issue that I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on. My name is Chai Gina Surat. I am the Policy Director at Nonprofit New York. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and Nonprofit New York is an association of 1,500 nonprofit organizations in the New York City area. One issue of concern that is fully in the power of the City Council to address is Council discretionary funding, which which Tasfia and Carlin already went into, um, and I'm gonna just go a little deeper, um, because this is a racial equity issue, which many of you know. Um, we know the city is in a very challenging financial position. We know the state is broke, and we are advocating as strongly as we can with the New York congressional delegation for federal relief for New York's budget deficits. And in fact, we had a town hall yesterday with Senator Gillibrand and Senator Schumer, and we got commitments from them for this very issue. But even with federal aid, the city will have to find efficiencies in the budget. And they're trying to find efficiencies now through the council discretionary line. However, any cuts to city council discretionary funding will have a damaging impact on smaller organizations serving communities of color. Discretionary funding only accounts for 0.42% of the city budget. Grassroots organizations led by and serving communities of color often do not have the organizational capacity to engage in the onerous city agency RFP process. And while Nonprofit New York doesn't often get into the weeds on contracts, like other umbrella organizations we partner with, we have been asked by several grassroots organizations, culturally and linguistically specific groups, community um, 
<clears throat> land trusts and community development corporations to take on this issue because of concerning letters from the city. So last week, the city sent two letters to nonprofits with discretionary contracts. In the first, the letter said that contracts not deemed essential would not be reimbursed after March 22nd. So after significant advocacy, the city sent a second letter saying organizations would be reimbursed for expenses incurred up to April 24th. And after that, only essential work done in the same way as pre-COVID-19 would be continued to be funded on FY20 contracts. So in contracts, these organizations are running now and spending money on now. Uh, for an example of the type of work small grassroots organizations are doing, I wanna share a quote from an email from one of our members sent to me yesterday. She said, in the wake of COVID, many of us, local small nonprofits, have adjusted to serving our neighborhoods in Brooklyn, particularly East Flatbush, Crown Heights, Brownsville, and East New York, to provide meals, masks, baby supplies, and breastfeeding, doula support for pregnant mothers, online fitness classes for youth and seniors to offset the immediate community needs. We need resources for areas like technology, funding for tablet devices for mothers giving birth to include virtual partner and family support, and support for funeral services for black mothers who have died during time. All right. Um, discretionary contracts are exactly the kind of resource that these types of organizations rely on. And the city has indicated that there will be no assurances that organizations will be able to be reimbursed for their work through FY20. We have no sense of whether discretionary will be included in the FY21 budget. And from what I've heard from our members, there have been no updates on the City Council's Communities of Color Nonprofit Stabilization Fund, a signature initiative of the Council. So we are calling on the City to find more impactful efficiencies while maintaining a low cost budget line with huge impact for underserved communities. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll turn to Chair Torres for questions. Uh, again, a reminder for panelists and any council members asking questions, please keep your mics unmuted. Thank you everyone for your testimony. David, I wanna thank you for actually beautifully summarizing the rationale for this hearing, right? No single mind has the full knowledge that you would need to steer the city successfully through this crisis. Um, my, my first question would, is going to be to Chai. Um, can you just, how existentially threatened is the not-for-profit sector? Do you have like stats on the percentage of contractors that are at risk of failing if, if, if the status quo persists? Can we unmute Chai? Oh, actually, I just did it myself, sorry. Okay. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different data out there. Um, some of the most, I would say, nonprofits in general, there's, there's basically two, two main tracks. There's the nonprofits that are providing essential services, and then there's the nonprofits that are providing non-essential, that have had to shut down, basically. Um, so for, but even the organizations that are providing essential services, many of them have had significant revenue um, cuts already. Uh, and revenue drops. And I would say what, what's interesting about discretionary funding is that within the ecosystem of nonprofits in New York, um, community of color led small grassroots organizations are some of the most under resourced. And these are the organizations that subcontract with the larger, more established um, economy of scale nonprofits. Um, even those economy of scale nonprofits have had to lay off a lot of staff um, because of some federal legislation that has happened. Um, some has provided relief, others have actually led to more layoffs. Um, but community of color led grassroots organizations um, contract, either, either subcontract with larger organizations or get discretionary funding. Um, and so we're just very concerned because within the landscape of contracts for the city, uh, there have been assurances from the city for um, city agency contracts for the most part. We're still waiting on a couple of agencies. Um, but the, the, everybody was waiting to see what was going to happen with um, council discretionary funding. And what we, what we saw last week was very concerning, which is why a lot of our members started to ask us to raise the alarm about it. Um, I would say, you know, a lot of these organizations are so small that they can't even apply for the bigger grants. So if, if discretionary funding is dried up, if this is a line that the city decides to cut for savings, um, it's gonna mean a lot of uh, culturally specific 
uh, community of color led organizations will have to close. And, and Chai, just one more question as well. Do, do you know what percentage of the sector has had access to PPP? Do you want to unmute your? Okay. Um, that is the question everyone is trying to find out, including um, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, who's chair of SBA, um, and you know our senators. Everybody wants to know that. I think um, there was there was one uh, one survey done that showed about uh, tw I want to say this is going to be this is going to be back of the envelope math, but I would say. Um, about 20% of respondents who had applied for the PPP loan were nonprofits. Um, I think less than 10% of total respondents had actually gotten the PPP loan. Um, you know, we it's been in the news quite a bit. Um, everyone's trying to collect stories on what the data is. SBA has not released data on nonprofits that have accessed the PPP loans. Um, but generally, the trends that we are hearing anecdotally are um, that Smaller organizations have had a harder time. Um, organizations that have had language access issues because it was a first come first serve model. Um, organizations that had a pre-existing relationship with their bank tended to be, uh, have a higher likelihood of, of course, all this is anecdotal, but they tend to be the ones that um, got the grants. So of course, you know, um, the way that the PPP loan program it had to come together really quickly, but it is, again, we see structural racism playing out with the way that communities of color led organizations have been able to access that relief. It seems like the program benefited those who had pre existing relationships with the big banks. Yes. Um, that was my uh, bet. Beth, I, I, I worry, I don't know if I'm. Hi. You know, I, I worry in particular about the, the impact on, on our seniors, the nursing homes. Uh, the food, the failures in the food delivery program, but also the, just the long-term impact of isolation. You know, my worry is that the virus is going to keep spreading until there's a vaccine, and it could be years before we develop a vaccine. And so, what guidance are you giving your um, your, your clients on how to cope with isolation? I, I'm I'm so glad that you brought that up, Councilman, because you know. Isolation is really uh, a health issue. And it actually what they, the science is telling us is that um, being isolated is equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day on the impact to your health. So this is a, a major concern, I think, for all of us. So, you know, what we're trying to tell people is we're hoping that neighbors will be reaching out to other neighbors. I just saw talking about uh, disparities that up in the Bronx, RAIN, which is a great senior service uh, um, group, uh, services Hispanics up in the Bronx, uh, they, they've got a postcard going out to remind people that people are going to be isolated and knock on your neighbor's door. You know, you could sit out in the hallway, six feet away from that neighbor, you know, and have a cup of tea with them. You, you know, offer to go out and do an errand for them, have that conversation, make that phone call. And to the seniors themselves, what we're saying to them is, you know, this is a chance, and, and I hate to look at the is the optimist in me, you know, pick up the phone, call those people that you haven't talked to in years. They're going to want to hear from you. Everybody's in that same situation. Uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for intergenerational here. So, um, I, but I'm glad you brought it up because it is a major health issue. And I'm very concerned about seniors are not going in for their regular health checkups now, right? So what's, that's the other piece of this, that what are the health ramifications we're going to have because people didn't get their regular checkups or go in for small things that then the doctors find other things. And now we're going to end up in a position where a lot of older adults, I'm afraid, are going to have more catastrophic illness. And there's no catching up with that. So thank you. And I know when we, when we speak of communities of color, much, much attention has been paid to Latinos, African-Americans, uh, the Asian community, but not so much. Aracelis, you brought up indigenous populations, which, which has gotten lost in the conversation about communities of color. Do you want to speak more about the unique challenges confronting 
indigenous population? Um, yeah, and I think that um, when we've been looking at the Language Access Coalition, this is something that we've been advocating for since last year. Um, even before this pandemic hit across the health sector, across the education sector, it was clear. Um, and I think it's always been clear that um, there's some vulnerable populations, like in this instance, um, you know, the elderly and um, other populations who, because they're not in large numbers, really um, people find it more difficult to be able to find solutions or service them. Um, but this is exactly what's happening right now. Like I can almost assure you that the people that are, and this was, I was actually talking to the staff at Lincoln about this and I was trying to convince this one um, man to go to um, the, uh, to Lincoln was that, you know, they're really terrified. There's no language, no one that can in their own language reassure them of, that they're gonna be fine, that they've done it. Um, and so it is really essential that across like the healthcare system and our education systems, um, you know, that people are able to have access to information that is reassuring in their language. Some of these are not in print. It is all like oral languages. And so um, I think that, you know, that was a, a huge issue, like because of that one instance where um, the hospital couldn't guarantee, and I wouldn't want to name the person who was trying to help me out within Lincoln, but he was really honest with me. And he said, there is no, like, I'm going to be able to support him and take him up to, you know, a certain place to get him tested. And then at that point I need to leave. So he needs to come with somebody. Otherwise he's just like, it's going to go nowhere. And there's going to be no one to help him fill out his documents um, and to be able to explain it to him. So I think that, it is very like, I think this person has been fine and I think they're actually on recovery, but at that moment it was really scary because he was talking about not being able to breathe. So this is like, I, I can almost assure you that the people that are dying at home are undocumented or immigrants and potentially a large number are going to be people that do not speak um, even like Spanish, right? Um, so I think that it, it, if we really want to think about long-term solutions, language has to be a top priority. Um, I think the Department of Labor and Moya have been trying to do, have more efforts, but I think that it's really time to, you know, step up the bar and there are community members and this is what we're talking about with the language access coalition there are people who can start to be trained and there's other models um, in washington dc that have language banks for these least commonly spoken languages um, that we should definitely look into and i'm happy to send you more information about that well before we move on to public testimony do any do any of the panelists have any final thoughts anything now, I would just echo what everybody else is saying about the discretionary funding um, and out of full transparency, like, you know, the PPP, I've heard from, from other people that they haven't had any responses. People have had a difficult time applying. People are in response mode. Um, small community-based organizations are really trying to be there for the community, knocking on doors, trying to convince community members to access services. And so I think that, you know, we will... We will, we will be losing. I've, I was talking to a couple of colleagues um, this week and we were kind of joking around and we were like, I hope to see you on the other end, you know? And it's, it's like a sad joke, but we're really concerned, um, especially when those letters were issued. Um, and, you know, quickly um, got on a phone call to try to figure out if, you know, what can we do? Do we need to lay out staff? Do we need to start like a fundraising campaign? Um, and so these are really some difficult times. Um, we also have boards that we need to respond to who are like looking at our finances all the time. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing the need on the ground um, and the funding needs to come. Like, I know there's budget cuts, but um, if we are slow in our response, just like we were earlier, um, you know, this, this can really have longer term impacts that may be irreversible for some communities. This is David Nustan. I just want to add a quick point, and that's the impact on the small businesses. Um, you know, we think the nonprofits had difficulty getting PPP loans. It was almost impossible for a lot of small businesses to really do so. They didn't have the relations. They didn't have the documentation. They didn't have the sophistication. You know, and it's based on payroll, whereas a small business might be somebody and two family members and they take an occasional draw. They don't really have payroll. And, um, you know, if we don't have a comprehensive plan to address small businesses, 
there will be no jobs for people to go back to because of the, the percentage of low wage workers who work in small businesses. And so there has, that's why I keep talking about, there has to be a plan for unemployment for all these different things, but small businesses have to be on the list. I, I wanted, yeah, Phil. Oh, I would just wanted to speak quickly to the question that you asked Chai earlier um, and give you an example of what's been going on at CPC. We're a $30 million organization, 700 staff. Um, and in you know the past couple of weeks, we obviously received the assurance from the city that we were going to have our contracts kept whole until June 30th. And so we told all of our staff that everybody's job was safe until June 30th. And then we would see what happened. And in the past four weeks, we've had one and a half million dollars in funding cut from us because SYEP was cut, um, because discretionary uh, hangs in the balance, because we're already seeing Sonic and Compass being cut. And so now we've been in a position where, you know, we're scrambling to rearrange to, to try to keep our promise to staff that we're not going to lay them off on a day's notice. Um, we're waiting to hear back from the city council about whether and, and the city about whether our discretionary programs, feeding seniors, doing remote adult literacy classes and citizenship classes, wellness checks, serving our young people, getting the census count out, we're waiting to hear back if that's essential. And we don't know if we can keep, you know, the 150 staff that are covered by those contracts. Um, you know, we're, we've basically exhausted every private option that we have to shift funding. And at the same time, our community need is growing exponentially. You know, we could hire more staff, we could do so much more programming just to meet the, the community need. And the thing that really concerns me is that if the, these programs get cut, we're severing the ties to the, the city and to all the resources that the community member have. So SYEP, it's not just cutting programming for the 3,200 youth we work with. Those 3,200 youth are often the only line of communication that we have to their families who are limited English proficient, who are undocumented. Uh, and so if we don't have that line, how do we then get to their families and keep them safe? And, you know, we're going to do everything that we can, but there's only so much, you know, grassroots fundraising and getting donations of food boxes we can do. We can't serve 60,000 people that way. And so we're just really scared about how are we going to meet the needs of our community members and how are we going to keep our staff from becoming, you know, the folks that are then waiting in the unemployment lines. I appreciate that. And there's, there's recognition within the council that we have the, just the best and the greatest diversity of not-for-profits. And if we lose them, they could be gone forever. That's, it could do irreversible damage to our city. So we have to keep, we have to do everything we can here in the council to keep them afloat. Um, but I want to, I want to thank all of you for your testimony. I have until eight o'clock, so I'm going to have to start enforcing the time limit, but I want to thank this panel for your insights. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Thank you. Much appreciated. Great work. Really. So important. Janita, do you want to call how many members of the public want to testify? We're figuring. We're going to we're going to call the members of the public who, are, who have signed up to testify. Just give us Yes, hi, I'm back. Sorry, I was unmuted. I was muted for a second. As the chair mentioned, we'll be turning to public testimony and we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. You each have three minutes for your testimony. The individual speaking will be Oren Barzile, Marina Ortiz, Sarah Wolf, Sudha Acharya, Brian Romero, Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne, Valerie Joe Bradley, Lorena Carusias. Sade Lithcott, Ashley C. Sawyer, Elizabeth Clay Roy, Lucy Sexton, Chris Norwood, Jalisa Gilmore, Madagascar Kinsey Lamb, Monica Nyenken, Nancy Bedard, Raisa Rodriguez, and Solange Azor. Now, council members who have questions for a particular witness should use a raise hand function in Zoom and the chair will call on you after the witness has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. 
please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. And again, if you have written testimony that you would like to submit for the record, please email it to testimony at council.nyc.gov after today's hearing. And now I would like to welcome Oren Barzile to testify, who will be followed by Marina Ortiz. Oren? Time is starting now. Is Oren on? Oren is not on. Okay, we'll be moving on to Marina Ortiz, followed by Sarah Wolf. Marina? Time is starting now. Hi, I'm with East Harlem Preservation and the Committee to Empower Voices for Healing and Equity today. However, I'm speaking from personal experience and observations as an elder and a disabled New Yorker and an income limited Puerto Rican woman in East Harlem. I'm happy to report that East Harlem residents are getting a lot of support from local pantries and school cafeterias. Of course, we could do with less price gouging at the supermarkets. It's also refreshing to see less police in the street, but even now the focus is still on black and brown youth and more increasingly the homeless. I really don't get why we're talking about health disparities as if they are a matter of choice or self-control. Believe it or not, white people also smoke and drink and take drugs and eat fast food. But yes, we do live in sick buildings, 100-year-old tenements and public housing complexes that are surrounded by five bridges and a highway. We also serve as the pathway into Manhattan for truck deliveries. We have endured generations of lead paint poisoning, mold, bad water, redlining, and gentrification. That is why East Harlem had the highest number of COVID-19 cases in Manhattan. I'm privileged enough to live near Central Park, even though the, and, and even though the NYPD has vehicles at every entrance, police have consistently ignored gentrifiers flagrant disregard for the health of black and brown folks by refusing to engage in uh, social distancing or even masking, instead targeting youth on the corners. What we need is what we've always needed, truly affordable and decent housing and equitable health care, quality and free education and public transportation. What we don't need are more police, more people in jail and scapegoating of the homeless population as disease carriers. What we do need is direct financial support, training and real protections for essential black and brown workers whose faces are the ones we are seeing in news reports as victims of this pandemic. What we need is support for those on the ground who are providing mutual aid to their neighbors. What we need is protection from hate groups preparing to parade throughout the city tomorrow to demand an end to the quarantine. And we need an end to police assisted special treatment of privileged groups that have continued to endanger their neighbors by ignoring health guidelines with public funerals in the streets. The disparities are not new, they're just being magnified. I ask you to make serious systematic changes to guarantee racial equity at all levels of government. And if you're wondering how the heck we're supposed to pay for all these services, perhaps we could consider reprioritizing our priorities. I'm less concerned about open streets, bike lanes, state-of-the-art transit system, public service uh, parades, and I am about ending institutional racial disparities and making wealthy people pay their fair share. We don't need more police. The quarantine has showed that people of color are compliant. Time. One minute, we don't need any more studies and task force. We need wealthy New Yorkers to pull their weight and we need transparency and accountability for the economic and, and policy decisions being made. We cannot be expected to do more with less and tomorrow, May Day, tens of thousands of tenants and workers throughout the country will be letting their landlords and corporate employers know that they are not expendable. We hope that you will support us. Thank you, Marina. Uh, so, Chair Torres, do you have any questions? Let's go to the full public testimony. Sure. Uh, the next person up is Sarah Wolf, followed by Sudha Acharya. Sarah, turning to you. Time's up now. Go ahead. Is Sarah on? I see that Colvin Granham has her hand up. Hi there. 
I'm, um, I'm Sarah Wolf. Good evening. Thank you uh, to the speaker, Committee Chair Councilman Richie Torres, for the opportunity. Um, my name is Sarah Wolf. I'm the director of the Center for Healthy Neighborhoods at Bed Stuy Restoration, and I'm speak on be speaking on behalf of Colvin Granham, who's the president and CEO of Bed Stuy Restoration. Restoration has been a support of the central Brooklyn community since the late 1960s. And over these many years, restoration has been a driving force to address the social determinants of health that are really currently driving the outcomes that are devastating the lives of many individuals in our communities. During this crisis, uh, restoration is really reaffirming our commitment made to Bed-Stuy and Central Brooklyn as a place of support, providing the critical services needed to tide our communities through this crisis, including financial services and counseling, enrollment and social service benefits, workforce training and employment services for those who are able to <coughs> in a safe way, um, mental health services and support to small businesses. We're also providing emergency food relief and connecting our members to other food resources that are available in the community. And we're committed to closing the racial gap in uh, family and community wealth to ensure all families are prosperous and healthy in central Brooklyn. Now more than ever, the negative feedback loop of wealth and health are being made apparent with risks to low-income citizens of color for contracting COVID and suffering worse outcomes compounded by their high rates of pre-existing conditions, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, and by the poor living conditions, including housing, unsure unemployment, low wages, and general economic conditions. And the very same conditions that are putting people at high risk for these chronic diseases are also playing them placing them at the higher risk for contracting COVID-19. Um, you know, Central Brooklyn comprises over half a million people across Bedside, Bushwick, Brownsville, and East New York. And these neighborhoods have some of the highest concentrations of both poor and minority residents in New York with 94% 90 of the population being of color, um, poverty rates averaging more than 30%, um, and almost 45% of families receiving some sort of income support. Um, and not surprisingly, the health, health statistics also demonstrate disparities. Um, and we think that's largely because of ec the economic neighborhood conditions, access to healthy foods, transportation, and jobs. Tragically, our communities are, um, are Black and Latinx residents are um, dying of COVID at double the rate of white residents. And the distribution of new unemployment claims is following a similar pattern. And um, you know, COVID-19 is also of course rise, resulting in increased levels of food insecurity among already vulnerable residents, including the elderly, a high percentage of residents with existing chronic conditions, the already food insecure, and the many recently employed, unemployed low wage service, retail and other workers. While it is much too late to change the conditions that have led to this current crisis and its unjustly uneven impacts, we stand with our partners and other nonprofits and the city that have been working tirelessly to respond. That said, we would also like to offer recommendations as we move out of what appears Fine. to be, at least for now, the most acute phase of the pandemic and really begin to open up society um, to alleviate and to begin to open up society as we begin to open up, as we begin to open up, we really have to, um, just as low income residents of color have disproportionately comprised the essential workforce um, in healthcare, delivery, food, cleaning and maintenance. These are gonna be the same group of people that go back to work first, right? So while white collar and disproportionately white and affluent workers continue to work from home, it's gonna be our uh, African-American, black and Latinx and other um, workers of color that are going back. So what do we need to do? We need to ensure employee protections, including PPE, social distancing, paid leave for COVID or COVID related conditions. We have to provide resources for PPE testing and tracing in the communities where these workers are concentrated. And this includes Central Brooklyn um, that already have the most essential workers and they need to be made available to workers and community members in a way that's accessible to all. So for example, the driving, the drive up issue. Um, another um, thing that I wanna, I guess, emphasize that others have already talked about as the stay on evictions expires at some point, some sort, some sort of large scale rental assistance needs to be put in place. Otherwise we're gonna really see a much worse homeless problem than we already have. Um, so many people are not going to be in the position to pay back rent. They're already just month to month in the jobs that they have. And with the newly unemployed, um, and for those who do not gain reemployment, um, we want to ensure that they're not evicted. Hold on, honey. Um, the minority owned, and this is the last point, the minority owned food enterprises and assets currently serving our neighbors are clearly at increased risk for not being able to survive this pandemic and its economic fallout. While there are millions and millions, if not billions of dollars being made available to address the immediate needs of our residents, many businesses are not in a position to receive those opportunities and contracts. And it's creating a vicious cycle of underemployment 
and increasing emergency food needs in our community. So meanwhile, larger businesses with more capital assets are reaping, as we're already saying, honey, significant economic, economic benefits further widening the wealth gap without an intervention to intentionally support small businesses owned by people of color, cooperative worker organizations, which don't currently have the capital or larger mar margins needed to compete for some of these contracts. The same economic inequality that is contributing to this dis disproportionate mortality rates are gonna only be exacerbated, exacerbated. And an example is in the food system, right? There's millions and millions of dollars going to food. Um, when some of that funding, that money could really be supporting local businesses, um, local food businesses, local and regional farmers who have um, the, who have, you know, the, the values al alignment and who also will be able to support the economics um, conditions, economic wealth of our, of our own community members. Um, I think I'll stop there because I know I'm over time. Thank you again for this opportunity to um, testify. Apologies for the background noise. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, moving on to Sudha Acharya, followed by Brian Romero. Sudha, you're up. I'll start now. Uh, good evening. I'm Sudha Acharya, Executive Director of SACS, South Asian Council for Social Services. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. Uh, SACS's major focus is to assist underserved South Asian and other immigrants with their much needed health, health insurance and other benefits food security, senior support, and job preparedness. When we started uh, working remotely, we could continue to offer most of these services, except we had to close our South Asian food pantry. I'm so sorry. Uh, suddenly, okay, uh, the, the food pantry, but they started delivering food uh, all across Queens. Uh, we're actually uh, serving uh, nearly 2,000 individuals or about 500 families. But the number of families that need food is increasing every week. Uh, at, uh, we get referrals from 311, NYC Count, Moya, MSKCC, and Mount Sinai from other CBOs and for discharged uh, patients from Elmhurst and Queens hospitals. Uh, the boxes of food that they receive from cities sometimes have uh, meat in them, like uh, non-vegetarian items, uh, which are not culturally palatable. Uh, we believe, like other speakers who said before, that healthy food makes for healthy bodies. Our clients are in the informal sector. Other people have talked about who these people are, like the cooks and the baby babysitters uh, and so on. So I won't go, uh, go into that one. But their lives were not comfortable even before this pandemic. Uh, they were, they were uh, living, uh, you know, surviving from paycheck to paycheck. Now there's no paycheck. There's no money for rent. There's no money for food. As they work off the books, there is no, uh, there's no record of their earnings. So they're not, they, there can be no stimulus checks. Those who had jobs uh, with health insurance, when they lost their jobs, they lost their health insurance as well. They, we are, we are, we are uh, busy trying to, connect to, uh, trying to connect them to health insurance and SNAP benefits, uh, assisting them with unemployment insurance applications and so on. But there are a number of clients that as other people have mentioned uh, who are un, uh, undocumented. So they're not eligible for any of these, uh, these benefits. Uh, we have a number of uh, uh, senior clients uh, who are, uh, you know, who feel isolated and dejected. I'll tell you about one client whose cell phone suddenly did not work. She started banging on her window to get someone, someone's attention as the phone was the only, her only connection to the outside world. Fortunately, a neighbor Fine. saw her and helped her. Once she could call her counselor, it took, it took some time to calm her down. We are providing individual and group therapy Many need uh, counseling in this environment. We're also doing bereavement counseling. Funding for public uh, hospitals and quick implementation of NYC care in all the boroughs will be very, very important. Uh, I heard the, uh, you know, the chairman asking Steve Choi about healthcare for undocumented people. Uh, Steve mentioned the fear of public charge and so on. 
but most of the healthcare, uh, most of them are, uh, we are connecting them to uh, HSC options in the public hospitals. And you know what condition they are in now, you know, and Western Queens hospitals are so, so very busy with the COVID-19. Uh, so, but funding them would be extremely important. Uh, funding CBOs for their therapy and supportive counseling in the client's own language would be extremely uh, important and beneficial. Prepaid debit cards uh, for, uh, for those who are economically vulnerable really would help them uh, keep their heads above water, at, above water at present. Rent assistance would also. Uh, I, the last thing I would say is please uh, make sure that uh, 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 you know, discretionary funding is not cut because a lot of us depend on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, mm -hmm. Sutha. Mm -hmm. Moving on to Brian Romero, followed by Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne. Brian, you're up. Time starts now. Yeah. Good evening, Chairperson Torres and Council members. My name is Brian Romero. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm a policy associate at the Gay Men's Health Crisis, or GMHC, the world's first community based organization founded to respond to the HIV AIDS epidemic in the nation. GMHC serves 10,000 clients in our various programs, and in 2019, about 70% of our clients self-identified as people of color. Nearly 85% live below the federal poverty line, nearly half are age 50 and older, and 75% identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. GMHC serves clients who live throughout New York City, including in many of the neighborhoods most impacted by COVID. As the coronavirus pandemic evolved and we transitioned our programming into virtual and telephonic-based programming, we learned quickly through practice what we would have expected we would eventually find in the data. The coronavirus pandemic is disproportionately impacting black and brown communities in every way that we can imagine. As we know in many other social determinants of health, place matters. And so it has been no surprise to us to see which areas of our city have been most affected. It is now well known that 62% of our all confirmed deaths are among black and Latinx New Yorkers. The majority of confirmed cases of COVID in New York City for people who have died are black New Yorkers. Two days ago, New York State released data from a statewide antibody study that found that 32% of Latinos in New York tested positive while only making up about 18% of the state's total population. While GMHC has successfully transitioned some of our programming to be provided virtually or by phone, we continue to hear that our clients and communities have great need. 15% of our clients who have received pantry bag or voucher meals via our GMHC on the go program had not attempted to access our food programs in the past 12 months. 44% of, of clients referred to mental health services from our wellness check calls were not previously enrolled in any of GMHC mental health programs. We are continuously thinking of creative ways to provide relief to our clients, including our LGBT youth of color and older adults. Both groups have shared that while they may, not, they may want to participate in virtual groups, they do not all have the same level of technological literacy as many of us do, may not have internet or even own computers. Frankly, as a psychotherapist, I have been concerned about the vicarious trauma that the mental health counselors are probably experiencing. Our substance use counselors express concern that as needle exchange programs have closed their doors, people may be sharing used needles when using drugs, making the possibility of transmitting HIV more likely, particularly in our communities of color and our LGBTQ communities of color as well. In our ongoing advocacy, we have learned that 40% of food pantries have shut down and as immunocompromised communities must continue to stay home and self-quarantine, we have seen the demand for meals go up. This is particularly troubling as we are aware that communities of color are more likely to experience food insecurity and more than 55% of New Yorkers with HIV are food insecure. Time. Before COVID, GMHC already had a wait list for our pantry program and that has only increased since the beginning of the pandemic. And while we are proud to have created a meal service delivery program, GMHC on the go, the demand for delivery of meals has gone up to 250 more clients requesting meals. Overall, our clients who access our food and nutrition services are people of color over the age of 50, and all clients who access our food and nutrition services are living at or below the federal poverty line, and many are homeless or unstably housed. COVID has not been a great equalizer. It has, however, exposed the inequities of our city and our responses moving forward must center a racial equity analysis. And in a previous speaker, uh, Chairperson Torres asked more about what that meant. So solutions quickly. One, 
I believe strongly that the city should be using racial equity impact assessments in all programming, um, policy initiatives, and budget um, resolutions. What is a racial equity impact assessment? It is a mechanism that looks at policies that are being implemented and the negative repercussions on communities of color. This is done to mitigate harm on those most impacted by the structural inequalities that we've been talking about. Two, I wanna urge that the council think about communities that are often left out of relief efforts. We've already talked about immigrants, undocumented peoples. I believe sex workers obviously also need to have advocacy from our government. People who use drugs have not been really mentioned throughout this entire hearing. I want to also join the chorus in terms of pushing that the council urge the state to adopt revenue raising bills. Historically, the council would have a day when it would visit Albany to express its state priorities. Obviously with COVID, the council I don't believe has had that opportunity. So I really urge that the council include revenue raising bills in that advocacy. Um, and lastly, I really want to join the chorus of Dr. Gill who testified earlier about the fact that this is certainly a public health crisis. This is certainly a economic crisis and it is also a mental health crisis. As a psychotherapist, I understand and believe that we will see negative repercussions in communities of color for many years to come after this. The generational trauma will be very real and we need to start preparing for that now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Reverend Wendy Calderon Payne, followed by Lorena Carusias. Reverend, you're up. I'm starting. Uh, greetings, um, Council Member Richie Torres, Chair of the Oversight and Investigations Committee. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, for the record, I was actually invited by the speaker, by yourself, Richie Torres, and by Gibson to be an expert panelist. So if I had known that that meant that I was gonna testify at eight o'clock, which is understandable, I could have actually planned my day listening to all this wonderful testimony. I just asked for communication. I love you, really, I love you guys. But I thought, don't ask me to be an expert panelist and then not put me on a panel because you can't ask me questions with two minutes to spare. But I'm gonna go into my speech. Um, I'm the executive director of Bronx Connect. I believe many of you guys know us. We are the original credible messengers. We value the power of community, heal the community and our children. We have been involved in the alternative justice community for 20 years. We are part of the very integral close Rikers and build community platforms where we fight for the renewal of our communities by building from within. The public health crisis that we are facing is impacting our Bronx and Harlem communities in unprecedented ways. Our young people and families are working, um, the, that we work with are bearing the brunt of this pandemic. We recently conducted a survey of over 100 participants and found that over 90% of their household had at least one person experienced loss of wages. Many have also lost family members. Our staff, frontline responders, have continued with their intensive case management, their counseling, their mentoring, our addiction services, we support our youth in our programs. We are excited to say that over the last seven um, weeks, having interacted with over 50 young people, not one of them has been arrested. Isn't that wonderful? Um, many of our youth are experiencing many challenges that they had before COVID and COVID is now uh, just showing more of the inequalities that we all know are there. Let me give you some thoughts, right? Um, community messengers. We need to employ people who speak the same languages as our, as our community in doing all the work we have. So when Mayor de Blasio says he's going to hire 1,000 virus trackers, they don't all need to be social workers. They can be community messengers from our community because, to be quite frank, it's our staff that are not afraid of going into our buildings and knocking on doors, and it's our community that is not afraid of disclosing who they've been hanging out with to our communities. Okay, that's really the CMS cure violence model. Um, C City Council and the mayor's office needs to hold ACS and DO and docs accountable for protecting staff and youth that are placed and incarcerated right now. I heard that there are 64 youth at Horizons that they're not being socially separated. They're not given masks to wear. They're not even given proper hygiene supplies. This is unacceptable and these are children, even if they're facing very serious charges. Finally, and this has been my big thing when I talk to people, 
So I've been following this guy named Dr. John Campbell I'm... on YouTube. He's a retired professor of nursing from New England. He's, 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 he's excellent, by the way. I, I listen to him as well. So, so yeah. thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Torres. Well, he talks about vitamin D deficiency. And he, and my, so my kids, you know this, my, my children are biracial. They're cafe con leche, right? Well, he talks about how darker skin tones take longer to produce vitamin D. And we all live indoors anyway, so we all take a while. But he actually quoted uh, an, an NIH study that says that 1,000 IUs of vitamin D to people who are deficient in vitamin D have a 7% protective effect of respiratory illnesses. 70%. Well, do you know what? 42% of the US population is vitamin D deficiency, but 82% of the African American community and 70% of Hispanics are vitamin D deficiency. This should be a public health mandate that we talk to our community about getting tested. It actually said that vitamin D supplementation was safe and it has protected against acute respiratory tract infection. So telling people to take 1,000 IUs, a little pill of vitamin D a day that they can get in CVS is not gonna kill them. It'll only help them. So I, sometimes I, I keep on saying this to city council, anybody in health. Okay, finally, I gotta end my testimony. We're talking about this SYEP announcement. Um, I think my the hardest part about it is I feel it's being sold to our community as a way to um, protect people, but I think it's just a financial decision. And my problem is, is that if you are going to drop all this money out of SYEP, then I need you to see you drop it out of the police budget also. I've said it before publicly, if there's going to be cuts, they have to be equitable across all aspects of our society. Because employment keeps kids in positive behaviors. And I want you to know that my kids, my kids are not using SYEP to buy McDonald's and go to movies. They're using SYEP to buy food and clothes for their family. They're taking care of younger siblings. They're providing for basic necessities. To understand that communities of color are hit financially because of COVID and then to cut a financial source of income and employment is just, it's an insult to the communities of color that were not, you know, they were not spoken to before this decision was made. Um, and that is my testimony. Thank you so much for your time. And, and Reverend, I apologize for whatever lapse in communication happened. I, I will, we're going to have a subsequent hearing and I'll, I'll see to it that you are in one of the early panels. So I apologize. I don't mind waiting, but if you just said it, you understand? I didn't have to put on my suit at well, one o'clock. I could have uh, put it on at five. I, I did not plan for an 8 p.m., uh, but, but, but Julie noted. So. But Who's I enjoyed next? everybody's testimony, even if I, yeah, I sat around and waited. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, moving on to our next speaker, Lorena Corusias, followed by Said Lithcott. Lorena, you're up. I am starting now. Hi, uh, good night. My name is Lorena Corusias. I'm the executive director of Mixtec Organization. We are located in Sunset Park. We've been providing services to Latinx community and documented for over 20 years. And actually for 20 years or 20 anniversary is this May 20 uh, and it's canceled. So it's canceled because of COVID-19. So we are also affected. We provide services in four different areas, health, mental health, education, immigration, and the intersection in all the areas. And we provide services considering cultural beliefs and different ways to heal. We believe that our community has their own way to heal. For example, we have chocolate para levantar el alma, which means chocolate to lift your soul as a way to work with depression and anxiety. And at this point, and at this time, that type of work is super important. We've been putting all our services online and trying to support our community as much as possible. However, we are now, uh, we are essential for our community, but now we are dealing with discretionary funding cuts or different ways to get the reimbursement. So I want to tell you, I know everyone has been talking about many facts and many examples of what is happening to our community. And sometimes I feel like it's difficult to get the level of necessity that our community has. And to kind of put an example, I want to talk about Reina. Reina speaks 
Nahuatl, which is an indigenous language. She is a single mother of three children. She lives in a room and she also supports her, her mother and her father. She lost her mother two weeks ago and she lost her father a few days ago. She was a housekeeper and now has no job. So she has to deal with all the system, trying to get the ashes of her mom back and dealing with all this situation. And she doesn't know how to, how to claim the body, of, the body of her father. And this is just one of many examples that we have here at Mixteca. We deal with a lot of stress, with a lot of stress from our community every single day. Every single day we have to go and to answer phone calls from people that are losing their loved ones, that are really in a crisis. And uh, we have here countless stories of loved ones feeling ill, losing their livelihood, and having family members pass. Among the many painful moments brought on by the crisis, few stories are more tragic than those from families who have lost loved ones and they don't know how to deal with the system. The system is not made to support this type of community. And I can't, I don't know how to emphasize this more. And uh, we have some, we have some groups that we are hosting on Saturdays through Zoom. And uh, those groups are men group and women group. And they are talking about the loss of their compadres. Their coworkers just disappeared. And these are people that nobody knows because they used to live here alone in the city. And we really, as we've been widely reported, due to long-standing inequalities and structural racism, the Latinx community of New York has been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And we now in the point of finding the way to recover from what is happening for a long time and uh, we are asking the council to support the small non-for-profits like Misteca, because we are the ones providing food. We are the ones providing support in the financial, in the, in the funeral services. We are the ones providing local food for our communities accessible and according to their needs. And we are asking to provide support to, to our CBOs, to small CBOs like Misteca to continue doing this testing because we know our community has been isolated in a room when they just leave the family of five. We, we also hear a family of 10 people isolating, all of them COVID positive, isolating in one room with no food. And those are the cases we got every single day. And uh, I'm a social worker and psychologist and I can echo how the mental health and support is important for our community on their own way to heal. And we need support from the budget to continue doing this job. And uh, I know it's over past eight and I'm gonna stop there. And, uh, and I just wanna thank you for this opportunity to testify in behalf of my community. Thank you, Lorena. Moving on to Sade Lithcott, followed by Ashley Sawyer. Sade, you are up. Time starts now. Hi, good evening. Um, I want to thank Chair Torres um, and the members of BLACK, Speaker Johnson, and all the City Council members present this evening. Um, my name is Shade Lithcott. I testify today as the CEO of the National Black Theater, the Chair of Coalitions of Theaters of Color, and a member of the Harlem Cultural Collaborative, a diverse group of 11 physical space-based cultural arts anchors serving the Harlem community, and a co-leader of the Culture at Three Working Group on Reopening the City, a cohort of over 300 cultural groups who meet daily around the impact of COVID-19 on the cultural sector. Today, I represent a sector that employs thousands of people of color and serves millions of New York City residents in the most hard hit communities in all five boroughs. Our institutions preserve, serve, and shape culture. And what is New York and if, it's not a, if it is not a rich tapestry woven together by the contributions and sacrifices of people of color, yet, through COVID-19, we are able to see with pristine clarity the negligible disparity in equity and resources afforded our communities. Our communities are suffering, suffering alarmingly 
disproportionate rates of infection and death, period. Several factors make up these devastating facts as we have heard on this call over and over again. Studies have shown the presence of cultural resources in a neighborhood has a significant positive impact on neighborhoods' health, the outcomes of its schools, and its crime rate. As institutions that serve, develop, nurture, hire, produce, innovate, and incubate artists of color, we have always seen ourselves as the first responders in loving service to the needs of our community. Linking cultural engagement to social well being informs a set of strategies that can enhance the quality of all for all New Yorkers, but in particular, crucial in our communities. CTC, the Coalition of Theaters of Color, are institutions that have long-standing relationships with many of the city's most diverse and vulnerable residents. These are populations public initiatives find challenging to reach through this crisis, providing imperative dissemination of up-to-date public health information and resources to help bolster the city's effort. Today, our institutions and missions are more vital than ever in playing a key role in the recovery of our city, as many of our organizations are more than just theaters. For decades, CTC institutions have functioned as safe havens for communities in which they operate, each year serving hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers with vitally needed cultural, educational, social, and economic resources and opportunities for youth, seniors, families in local neighborhoods and to the broader residents living in the outer boroughs. We understand that all organizations, Fine. big and small, are suffering at, as a result of COVID-19. However, systemic inequities, particularly in public funding, have created a climate where our members operate in significantly underfunded and under-resourced contexts. This means COVID-19 affects that this means COVID-19's effects will have particularly serious long-term consequences on our members and the underserved communities that, rep that we represent. And sadly, many of us will not survive. At this critical juncture, we implore you, the City Council, to preserve the initiatives that serve communities of color. This includes discretionary funding. The Council's initiatives, we have, we have, we are not CIGs. We have no commitment or reliable investment from the city for our existence besides these council initiatives. We are thankful and recognize the leadership of the councils have allocated these funds, but more needs to be done now more than ever. While these are extraordinary times, we remain optimistic about the resilience of artistic communities in New York City, but we, but we must continue to be vigilant and recognize though we are all enduring the same storm, we are not in the same boat. If communities of colors are not well, none of us are well. Before the establishment of cultural initi initiatives, specifically uh, cultural, the cultural initiatives of color, CTC, CII, culturals of color received less than one tenth of 1% of the total funds awarded to arts and cultures in New York City and state, and only received 5% of total contributed revenue from individual donors, indicating a disproportionate resilience on government and foundation grants that are, in general, increasingly less secure, now more than ever with the proposed cuts. Artists and cultural institutions, like with every crisis our great city has ever faced, are lauded as the lifeblood of the city, resurrecting the heart of this great city. But with what resources? How are we expected to fulfill these roles where we are, when we are preoccupied by surviving? We welcome and deserve a seat at the table to partner with the council and the mayor to help shape innovative and holistic solutions to what recovery looks like for both our sector and our communities. Um, and I know I'm time, so I'll stop at that. But I think tech support is really important to our segment and that we have to be careful of the dog whistles around arts and culture and nonprofits because the baseline funding for culture in this city do not go to organizations of color. They go to 34 organizations that do not represent the rich diversity of this city. We, the organizations 
that serve communities of color are reliant as a safety net to discretionary funding in specifically and in particular to these cultural initiatives. So I implore you, ask us questions, engage with us. We should be on task force. We should be panelists that are asked questions because this sector is the lifeblood and is a part of the fabric of the safety net of this city, in particular, our communities of color. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shade. Sorry for the mispronunciation earlier. Uh, moving on to Ashley Sawyer and then Elizabeth Clayroy. Ashley, you are up. Your time starts now. Ashley, are you on? Okay, moving on to Elizabeth Clayroy, uh, followed by Lucy Sexton. Elizabeth, you are up. Time starts now. Thank you to Chair Torres, Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus and staff for this hearing and your leadership. My name is Elizabeth Clay Roy and I'm the Executive Director of Take Root Justice, a legal services organization that serves over 2000 clients and dozens of grassroots organizations to advance racial, social, and economic justice across New York City neighborhoods. Two centuries of public health research show that the most basic influences on health are people's living conditions, the housing, neighborhood, and working conditions, and their access to clean air, water, nutritious food, and affordable health care. And in the past, epidemics of cholera, yellow fever, tuberculosis, and influenza struck the poor more often than the better off. And what we're learning today in 2020 with all of our advances in knowledge, technology, and societal wealth is that we just haven't made enough progress towards health equity. So let's use what we know about the social determinants of health for a just and equitable response and recovery. The following is part of a list of the public protective infrastructure that our society needs for that response and recovery. First, housing is a human right and one of the most important public health interventions. Persistent mold and pest issues in apartments and poor building maintenance have contributed to long-standing respiratory illnesses for many New Yorkers, especially black and brown New Yorkers. All landlords must make rapid and consistent repairs to keep their tenants safe. And tenants need access to counsel more than ever to ensure their rights are respected. As NYCHA tenant leaders and Take Root Justice clients, Ms. Lakeisha Taylor and Ms. Sandria Coleman wrote in their daily news op-ed today, tenants in NYCHA regularly experience water outages and hot water disruptions, making hand washing and proper disease prevention difficult. Frequent extended elevator outages make social distancing impossible. And housing stability is critical as well. Black and Latinx New Yorkers make up 89% of those who are homeless at the beginning of this year. Affordability is the central issue. We need a rent freeze. And we need to ensure that homeless New Yorkers have a place to live consistent with social distancing guidelines, both in this moment and for some months to come, and as quickly as possible to strengthen protections for renters in the midst of this health crisis to prevent the enormous possible uh, growth in homelessness um, as soon as the eviction moratorium uh, from the state is lifted. This moment is quite possibly the end for thousands of small businesses that are owned and staffed by people of color. The loss of jobs, income, and precarious wealth will be devastating and, to, and deepen the health risks of poverty for years to come. New York City should expand on its existing grants and loans to create emergency relief fund for the small business owners, micro business owners, worker cooperatives, street vendors, um, and others to cover lost revenue and wages. Social cohesion and civic engagement are social determinants of health too, along with perceptions of equity and racism. Community organizations play a critical role here, especially grassroots, neighborhood-based, black, brown, immigrant-led organizations that have emerged in the last few years. They're at great risk of closing down in the coming months as their members and community supporters cannot afford to support them. But the communities most impacted by COVID-19 are the communities heavily reliant on city council discretionary funding, um, which has been, has been said by others, accounts for a small percentage of the city budget and should not be cut. We also support what other nonprofits are calling for, restricted funding should be made general operating support, eliminating the hearings requirement for FY20 contract registration, and no retroactive cuts. Um, improving health also requires democracy and justice, and so participatory budgeting, community-led planning, and access to justice must adapt and continue, as should elections, um, and not be canceled. 
And finally, I would also encourage the council to adopt a racial equity impact assessment for budget and policy decisions moving forward. We have to commit to a level of public protective infrastructure that reduces the severity of the health crisis for black and brown communities for the entire city and reduces the opportunity to return. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I see that Ashley Sawyer is back on. So we will start with Ashley and then move on to Lucy Sexton. Ashley, you're up. Good evening, can you hear me? Your time starts now. Yes. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Torres and committee members. My name is Ashley Sawyer and I am the Director of Policy and Government Relations at Girls for Gender Equity. We are Brooklyn based and our work has been to meet the needs and continue to remove systemic barriers that prevent cisgender and transgender girls and gender nonconforming youth of color from living self-determined lives. As you all know, we have been working for close to two decades now specifically to address the ways that girls of color in New York have been impacted by sexual and gender-based violence. And we have focused a great deal on educational equity and anti-criminalization efforts. You also know that we um, led the, the Young Women's Initiative, which is an, an extremely crucial process and initiative um, of city council to make sure that girls of color in New York have what they need in spaces like education, health, community support and opportunity and economic and workforce development. Now more than ever, that work is crucial through GGE's ongoing connections, which we have maintained by providing services remotely through the pandemic. And through our research, we know that youth of color have been hit extremely hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. What that means is girls of color, and particularly we're talking about Black and Latinx youth, they make up a disproportionate percentage of the people who are essential workers in this city. So when we talk about essential workers, often people overlook young people, but girls of color are working in grocery stores, they're working at Target, they are fulfilling food orders at Whole Foods, and they're also taking on responsibilities as caregivers. Our research has shown that in particular, Black girls are often perceived as second parents, and they take on tremendous caregiving responsibilities in their homes. One of our young people, Susuela, was just in Time Magazine this week talking about the caregiving responsibilities that she has for her elderly godmother um, and another family member who is a child, all while being expected to plug in to remote learning and help their families. Young people have also experienced a great deal of trauma. In my longer written testimony, I detail some of the examples that young people have experienced. But when we're talking about Black girls, Latinx girls, we know that they have lost loved ones. Many of them will be expected to log on for online learning every single day, even though they have lost their grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings, cousins friends, neighbors. One of the young people in our program told me that she has lost two uncles and an aunt all in a short amount of time. In ordinary circumstances, if a young person had experienced that much death in a short period of time, we would expect that their school would be meeting them with social workers, mental health support. But in this period of time, Unfortunately, young people have been yanked away from the crucial social su supports that they need through the Department of Education. And our concern is that that will only be Time. exacerbated. Thank you. Very briefly, that will only be exacerbated by the budget decisions that the administration and the council make in the weeks to come. It is extremely crucial that young people have access to mental health support, counseling, restorative practices when they return to school. Unfortunately, in the budget process and the budget negotiations that are happening now, we're seeing that the City Department of Education is being asked to take on the brunt of the city's entire budget. Um, and meanwhile, the NYPD has not seen even, even something even remotely similar in terms of budget cuts. Um, DOE, DOE is expected to experience six times the cuts proportional to their budget. Um, in comparison, the NYPD is only seeing about 1% of the proposed cuts and this is just unacceptable. Just really quickly to highlight some of the other things that young people have been experiencing, in addition to being caregivers, in addition to working in grocery stores as essential workers, um, girls of color are also being um, affected in their own physical health. We know that in this city, the Bronx in particular has the highest rate of childhood asthma in the entire country, which is a comorbidity that puts them at great risk for themselves. So while people have talked about COVID-19 impacting elderly people, 
when you're talking about marginalized youth of color, it has impacted them physically as well. And so young people will have lost not just their teachers who have died, but their friends and their siblings and that some of them have been at risk. And we know this is especially true for youth who were incarcerated in our city's detention facilities, horizons and crossroads. So very quickly, our recommendations are first and foremost, this council, this body has to make sure that adequate resources are committed for the mental health and trauma response in the DOE for years to come. And that means increasing the number of school-based social workers, restorative justice practitioners, intervention specialists, and supportive non-law enforcement adults in schools. And the decisions that are made about the budget have to prioritize mental health and emotional health of students. Um, we know that there's supposed to be a teacher hiring freeze. That is a very dangerous thing to do. We have have to preserve in some iteration the summer youth employment program. We know that that is an issue of safety for our communities. Young people need that money not just for extras, but they need it for the essentials. And we cannot forget that SYEP employs 85% youth of color. So when we're talking about the pandemic's disproportionate racial impact, we're talking about youth and we're talking about the decisions that this body will have to make. And we are expecting that you will hold the line and demand that the budget costs and the fiscal impact of this pandemic is not born exclusively on the backs of Black and Latinx and youth of, youth of color. We also have to make sure that there is an explicit commitment to racial justice in the response to COVID-19 and that that explicit commitment includes young people. They have been impacted despite the myth that it only impacts elderly people. Young people have been impacted personally, financially, um, and, and as a community. And then in addition, and finally, we have to make sure that every effort is made to preserve discretionary funding because it is, because it is the lifeblood of so many of the organizations that do the work day in and day out to keep young people alive and keep them healthy and keep them safe. Thank you again for your time and we look forward to your continued your collaboration. Thank you, Ashley. Moving on to Lucy Sexton, followed by Chris Norwood. Lucy, you are up. I'm starting. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you, Chair Torres, uh, for this uh, unbelievable, informative, and totally heartbreaking uh, hearing today and for allowing me to testify. My name is Lucy Sexton. Uh, I'm with New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, a citywide coalition of cultural groups, and I'm here today to bring testimony from cultural groups working in communities horribly impacted by COVID and the current crisis. We know that the council is trying to address the great and pressing needs of communities devastated by this crisis. These include healthcare, food, education, seniors, mental health. We ask that you remember that culture plays a role in all of these. Theaters have been turned into food distribution centers. Online programs by cultural groups provide a lifeline for kids stuck at home. Brick Theater in downtown Brooklyn has an intergenerational council working with senior NYSTRA residents in Fort Greene. And for all of our mental health, we need the connection, catharsis, and healing that arts and culture provide. The panel has talked about the importance of trust in communities for getting information and health advice out about reducing stress and long-term healings. Community cultural groups are key to all of these. As we look to, uh, at ways to support afflicted communities, we need to look at the fragility of the cultural groups that provide strength and resilience to those neighborhoods. Groups like Arts East New York, the only cultural center in that neighborhood. Before this crisis, they had announced that they needed to shut their doors this spring due to lack of funds. Their leadership is now suffering major personal losses in their families due to COVID. This is tragedy upon tragedy. And if they disappear, it will remove a vital place for gathering and education for a neighborhood desperately in need. Chinese Theater Works provides theater and cultural programmings to huge Asian communities throughout the five boroughs. In these difficult times when Asian people are under attack, we know art can be a tool for nurturing understanding, building bridges, strengthening communities. They depend on council initiative funding for this work. Pregones Puerto Rican Traveling Theater in the Bronx delivers bilingual and multi-generational arts programs for Latinx audiences. They need the need for the work with those families has never been more pressing. City Council initiative funding makes this work possible. Lewis Latimer House uh, in Queens does educational work with immigrant families and children. It depends on City Council initiative funding. Uh, and I just want to end by saying that in the shutdown, the cultural groups have continued their work online. The Hunts Point Alliance for Children has a renowned Shakespeare program for middle schoolers in their neighborhood. That neighborhood is one of the highest COVID rates on the planet. The program done in collaboration with the public theater has continued during the shutdown. 
with eight hours of training a week for these middle schoolers and 100% attendance from these kids. They are in this in terrible situation and they are able to be online doing Shakespeare. They're gonna do a performance online. I will keep you posted. Um, supporting communities in crisis means supporting their humanity and their ability to connect. Culture provides the community connective tissue necessary to survive this terrible crisis. We can be part of the creative solutions necessary in this unfathomable moment, but we need to survive and we need discretionary and uh, initiative funding to survive. Thank you so I'm much for this hearing. Done. Thank you, Lucy. Moving on to Chris Norwood, followed by Jalisa Gilmore. Chris, you are up. Your clock yes, starts I now. apologize. I have to testify over the phone, but I do. And thank you very much. I'm Chris Norwood, Executive Director of Health People, an entirely peer educator based health promotion and disease prevention organization in the South Bronx. I am testifying today to urge or beg whatever works the city council to form a task force on reducing chronic disease and what we have been told are underlying conditions. We are inundated with task force and yet not one from the city or state focuses on this issue, which is obviously key to this epidemic and to overall health. It is outrightly horrifying how black and Hispanic communities have been branded as almost having to have horrific horrific levels of chronic ill health when that is clearly untrue. In actual fact, public health departments in our huge medical industry have never, never really used the available and proven evidence-based strategies to slash chronic disease. Neither the New York City nor New York State Department of Health, for one example, even have a plan to control diabetes, our most widespread epidemic, and one that has created more harm and left behind more horror for years than actually COVID-19. With the 45% increase in diabetes related lower limb amputations, New York State refused to even make reducing these amputations part of the official state prevention agenda. The city council itself, and I thank them, had to pass a law to demand that the New York City Department of Health have a diabetes plan. Yet everyone in public health knows that real patient education can slash these statistics. The best known diabetes preventive education reduces the risk that pre-diabetics will develop diabetes by 60%. And that 60% reduction occurs equally for African-Americans, Hispanic, whites, and a range of ethnic groups, totally contradicting the narrative that we have been given. Uh, health and hospitals, just for another example, in the past year had a very successful project to reduce hypertension, again, among low-income patients. Sending CHWs into the homes of uh, kids who have asthma and teaching them and their parents how to properly uh, care for asthma slashes their emergency room visits and their law school days. My own organization, Health People, uh, which is based uh, in the South Bronx. We train people from the community to educate others. When our peers took real diabetes self-care education into homeless shelters, the result for the 201 participants was a 45% decrease in emergency room visits. Most of the peer educators had been homeless themselves who brought this education for the first time where it needed to be. But the fact is that that funding, H&H &H funding, was all the special federal funding to reduce emergency room visits and hospitalizations. That's over. We have to look at the fact that Time. even with this kind of success and progress, not the city, not the state, not the federal government will pay for this on a regular basis, even though it is so successful. And that should be a priority. And that's why I beg the city council to look at this. And I will let, you know, um, end with my time, but I do have one last thing like everyone else. Please city council, stop contact tracing, which is the same huge thing where bureaucracies build themselves and insist, insist, put, not a line in the sand, but bricks in the sand here and insist that this be done with the community and contracted to community groups. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Moving on to Jalisa Gilmore, followed by, and I apologize for the name mixed up earlier, Madaha Kinsey Lamb. Jalisa, you're up. Time starting now. 
Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Julissa Gilmore, and I'll be testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a citywide network of grassroots organizations from low-income communities and communities of color in environmentally overburdened neighborhoods. The negative health outcomes of COVID-19 closely mirrors the racial and economic disparities that environmental justice communities have faced for decades. Disproportionate sightings of polluting infrastructure in low-income communities of color have resulted in higher levels of respiratory illnesses, cardiovascular disease, and other chronic illnesses, increasing susceptibility to COVID-19. We are seeing these same communities are being hit hardest by the coronavirus pandemic. In New York City, African Americans and Latinos represent higher rates of fatalities than their representation in the population. COVID-19 testing and resources need to be prioritized in low-income communities and communities of color. Research is showing that higher levels of PM2.5 are associated with higher death rates from COVID-19 and that small decreases in pollution could have resulted in fewer deaths in New York City. While worldwide air pollution has been decreasing, it's unclear how it's changing in environmental justice communities that are currently enduring the highest levels of air pollution. New York City cannot afford to follow the lead of the federal administration and allow polluters to suspend pollution monitoring and reporting. It's likely that the COVID-19 crisis and subsequent stay-at-home orders will extend through the summer months. Many communities most impacted by COVID-19 are also the most heat vulnerable. Residents without access or funds to utilize air conditioning will be at the greatest risk for heat mortality. The New York State Home Energy Assistance Program needs to increase funding for AC purchases, provide utility bill assistance, and ensure all low-income households are eligible. Additionally, the city should begin to purchase ACs so that units can be distributed to the most vulnerable residents. New York City must also develop a plan for mitigation strategies for preventing the spread of the virus within cooling centers. Furthermore, extreme heat puts increasing strain on our energy grid, causing the most polluting power plants in EJ communities to be fired up, worsening air quality and increasing electricity costs. New York City must invest in resilient, clean and distributed energy to reduce strain on our grid. New York City must also prepare for a possibly more active than usual hurricane season coinciding with the coronavirus pandemic. Superstorm Sandy damaged and disrupted critical infrastructure and services and demonstrated the vulnerability of low-income communities of color. Furthermore, emergency shelters and hurricane evacuation may be complicated by social distancing orders. Similar to climate change, COVID-19 is exacerbating already existing racial inequalities. COVID-19 is decimating our economy and the widespread job loss and trauma for many people will continue to grow. Climate solutions will create direct opportunities for coming out of an economic collapse and address health disparities, but only if there is large scale coordinated citywide action rooted in equity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to Madaha Kinsey Lamb, followed by Monica Nyenken. Madaha, you're up. Thank you. We're starting now. Thank you. I am Madaha Kinsey Lamb, Executive Director and Founder of Mind Builders Creative Arts Center in the Northeast Bronx. Thank you, Chair, for your fortitude here into the evening and for the committee, the caucuses, and everyone who has spoken. Your vigilance, your diligence, your leadership is really uh, needed and inspiring, and all the knowledge that has been shared. We've seen some advances in the past few years um, coming from the council and other public officials, pre-K, support for communities of color with pre-K, children's after school programs, summer programs, support for the arts that expand the mind and educate the heart. The prospect now of so much of this being swept away is a direct attack on the communities that have suffered the worst in illness and in fatalities, often, too often, from the same families whose members have responded to serve the sick and the dying. This cannot be permitted to happen. This mindless approach to stripping services out of the neediest community, communities 
must be stopped. For Coalition of Theaters of Color, which is one of the programs that we get funding from that's discretionary, and the important support that has come to us at Mind Builders from other discretionary funds and other city contracts, our reach and the reach has really nourished the confidence, careers, lives, and audiences in the thousands each year. But here again, the disparities that you keep hearing come up again, and they are clear, smacking us in the face, everyone smacking everyone in the face across the globe that we are all essential. Since 1978, Mind Builders has been located in the severely underserved Northeast Bronx area. And since March 20th, we are now still serving remotely and giving as well through a special fund, the devices that are needed for the families, serving 700 young people and families from households in every zip code in the Bronx and beyond, classes in music, in dance, in theater, in community folk culture research. Right now, we employ 52 professionals and dedicated staff coming from the neighborhood and also from the five boroughs, teaching artists, pre-kindergarten instructors, maintenance, clerical, and management staff, all part of the committed team whose families count on their salaries from mind builders and who make the transformation of the lives of young people in our underserved communities possible. I join you now in speaking for the children and their families. I thank you for the support of the council and the public officials that have provided access so that many more families and youth could take advantage of it. Now we cannot go backwards. In good faith, we fulfilled our DCLA and initiative contracts with the city, paid our staff, continued to conduct programs beyond what we could have imagined possible. At Mind Builders, and with CTC theaters, it's always been about transforming lives and saving lives, promoting a way despite the deck and disparities being staffed against them. Please stand with them, our communities, and the possibilities for a full life that working together we can provide. Thank you, Madaha. Next up is Monica Nyenkan, followed by Nancy Bedard. Monica, your turn. Your time starts now. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you. So hi, my name is Monica Yinken. I'm here speaking on behalf of BYP 100 in our ongoing collaborative mutual aid work. Despite the cited institutional racism, such as incarceration, health disparities, medical racism, environmental racism, criminalization that make black and brown communities increasingly vulnerable, city council and the mayor have taken little to no action to ensure that black and brown communities survive this pandemic. The city's response to COVID-19 thus far has been to prioritize the NYPD to further the criminalization of our communities, to allocate more resources to wealthier neighborhoods and to center the expertise of people without experience in the public health sector. On April 1st, 2020, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced former NYC Police Commissioner James O'Neill as the COVID-19 Senior Advisor to the City of New York. In this role, he'll manage the supply chain for protective and medical equipment within all city hospitals. Samaritan's Purse, in partnership with the Central Park Conservancy, the NYC Parks Department, and the Mayor's Office has already opened up a Central Park Field Hospital to help with the overflow from Mount Sinai, while hospitals such as Elmhurst, which serves predominantly Black and brown folks, lags behind in protective equipment and additional resources. It is indicative of the carceral nature of the city council that our officials sit by idly while Black and brown people die during this pandemic. After having just recently approved the $11 billion to construct new jails in our very neighborhoods most impacted by this crisis. These funds, which could have been used to our hospitals and other public health services have done been allocated for jails and prisons. 
Uh, police will not keep us safe. It will not prevent our communities from contracting coronavirus. It will not provide us with protective gear and it will not meet any of our basic needs. By dragging their feet on providing these services, our communities actually need city council and the mayor are complicit in the systematic mass killings of black and brown communities during this pandemic. As the city negotiates the budgets and considers measures to address the COVID pandemic, we demand that James O'Neill step down as the COVID-19 senior advisor to the city Mayor Bill de Blasio appoint an expert on public health and hospitals to serve as the senior advisor. The city should halt all expansion of policing in response to the pandemic, which includes summons and arrests for not following quarantine orders, arrests for crimes of poverty, acts of survival and beyond. The city redirect any increased spending from protective gear for police to patrol the streets, to equipment, supplies, and to pay frontline workers such as nurses nurses, sanitation workers, EMT, home health aides, among others. We demand that the city declare mutual aid as an essential service that doesn't warrant being stopped or ticketed by the police. The city we demand the city declare a moratorium on jail admissions, as well as the release of all people serving city sentences, a detained free child, Time. and for technical, thank you, parole, uh, parole violations, especially those who are at risk. The city must immediately limit the restrictiveness of electronic monitoring and house arrest to ensure that the residents can move about safely to prepare for the pandemic. The city should allocate more money for re-entry services to community-based orgs in order to meet the increased need for people being released. The city should provide economic and housing support for black and brown communities, um, such as sex workers, street vendors, undocumented folks, people who all do not qualify for the support of the federal stimulus package. The city should provide immediate housing and economic support for people who are homeless, packed in shelters, recently released from jail. One such way would be to actually use eminent domain for the public good to seize any of the $250,000 vacant luxury apartments or the 100,000 empty hotels to house them. The city should use eminent domain to give communities access to the Bedford Union Armory, vacant land, and any other unoccupied space in order to provide necessary services such as field hospitals, food banks, community gardens, other community-based cooperative efforts, and the city should fully fund the Summer Youth Employment Program, a critical lifeline for thousands of Black youth to receive valuable work experience and necessary income, and to work with program partners to make sure all youth participants can have access to technology so that they can work remotely. We know too well the ways that the government takes advantage during these times of crisis to extend policing, surveillance, and incarceration. We have seen so far with the regressive amendments to the bail statute, the millions of dollars newly allocated to law enforcement and fines for not practicing social distancing. If we further allow expansion of these systems, they will be with us long after the we've contained the spread of the virus. It is unconscionable in the midst of a deadly pandemic that the city will prioritize the expansion of surveillance and policing over the health and city and safety of New York City residents and medical professionals. Thank you, and that's all I have. Thank you, Monica. Next up is Nancy Bedard, followed by Raisa Rodriguez. Nancy? Time starts now. Hello? Yes, we can My name is Nancy Bedard, and I'm a senior staff attorney at Brooklyn Legal Services. Thank you for this opportunity to testify about the impact of the coronavirus on communities of color. Brooklyn Legal Services has provided high quality, innovative representation to low income communities throughout the borough of Brooklyn for over 50 years. Our mission is to fight poverty and fight for racial, social, and economic justice for low-income New Yorkers. We have 19 distinct practice areas at Brooklyn Legal Services. And at this point, we are trying to provide holistic, multidisciplinary wraparound services uh, in-house for clients. And we are uniquely poised to try to meet the increased needs during this pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has thrown existing racial and social inequality into stark relief from the challenges of remote learning that the New York City public school students have to unfortunately the increased domestic violence. We know that COVID-19 is just impacting communities of color and these are the communities that we serve. 
We are working with minority owned small businesses and we're working with home owners who are facing foreclosure and they are less likely to qualify for any state and federal relief programs. Low income workers, primarily people of color, immigrants are facing huge barriers to assessing unemployment insurance and other wage replacement benefits. Our office, we are continuing to try to meet the needs of the community and are working on these from remote um, services that we're providing. Our most vulnerable clients, low income workers, tenants, immigrants, victims of domestic violence, the elderly and people with disability are not only faced with the COVID-19 health crisis, but they are also facing the inability to meet any of their basic needs. Brooklyn Legal Services is trying to be on the front line advocating for these communities who are hardest hit. By leveraging our legal expertise to address these systemic inequalities, we're working with minority owned businesses and homeowners and communities of color. As we said, they're not eligible for state and federal COVID relief, many of them. Many minorities and women owned small businesses have not been able to take advantage of any of these government funded programs, such as the Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury disaster relief programs. Also, we're having serious problems with homeowners who have, um, they are not being able to take advantage of the temporary suspension of mortgage payments because unfortunately, they're not being granted these services under certain circumstances as they are not eligible because Time they has are expired. already behind on their mortgage payments. Brooklyn Legal Services has tried to mobilize to provide legal assistance and representation to these communities. Hello, may I please have more time? Yes, you can finish your testimony. Thank you. People of color and immigrants are experiencing disparate and unprecedented levels of unemployment and Brooklyn Legal Services uh, are trying to help frontline workers who are predominantly people of color with assistance in this critical means of addressing employment and benefit inequalities. Workers of color are not only overrepresented in the low wage workforce, but also in the short term and contingent workforce and most likely lack access to necessary work related benefits to face unemployment. Our workers' rights benefit union has expanded our capacity to handle employment and unemployment issues to specifically assist low income and LEP limited English proficiency workers with UI benefits. We also have been expanding to help people enroll in public assistance programs, including cash benefits, SNAP and Medicaid. In addition, many immigrants who are not eligible for public assistance and unemployment insurance due to their immigration status have lost jobs after facing the limitations of local mutual aid funds. Our team of social workers quickly mobilized to establish an emergency client fund, which raised over $70,000 through individual donations. And we have been trying to distribute these funds to our neediest clients. Yesterday, our citywide immigration advocates filed a lawsuit against the executive office for immigrant review for forcing respondents in immigration court to continue working on their cases in the midst of this global pandemic, risking their health and violating the governor's executive order. We work with low income students of color at this time the current crisis has laid bare the racial and social economic inequalities that we know exist in the education system. Our focus has been on ensuring that clients are connected to remote learning and that special education services continue. Many students of color are without computers or internet access and cannot access any education. Of particular concern are students whose disability is so severe and severe that they cannot even benefit from remote learning at all. 
All the families where English is not their first language continue to face significant barriers in assisting children with remote learning and understanding online lessons or who are at work and have no ability to be there at home to help these students. BLS is working on these issues also of charter school and remote learning as the charter schools are not actually covered by the New York City DOE policies. We also have our family law unit that continues to work with victims of domestic violence as unfortunately we receive calls from people whispering from homes where they cannot um, find safety because they are shelter in place with their abusers. And also we continue to work on housing units and we're seeing unfortunately an increased number of illegal lockouts and there are serious repair issues where people have to stay sheltered with situations of moles and leaks and issues where people are having post eviction, meaning that they were evicted prior to this pandemic and have nowhere to live. Thank you very much for all the work that city council is doing. And we continue to hope that Brooklyn Legal Services can continue to stay on the forefront of this problem and address the needs of our most vulnerable clients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Raisa Rodriguez, followed by Solange Azor. Raisa? Your time is starting now. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Raisa Rodriguez, Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy at Citizens Committee for Children. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Um, it is my distinct honor to be part of, uh, of a hearing that has um, included so many speakers that have shared um, so bravely uh, their experiences uh, with this pandemic. Um, CCC is a independent multi-issue advocacy, child advocacy organization. Um, we essentially aim to ensure that all New York children are healthy, housed, educated, and safe. And so I'm here before you today, um, first and foremost, as a child advocate. Um, I want to call attention to the fact that when I first heard about this pandemic and about the high risk groups, um, I, I didn't need data to tell me what was gonna pan out. In fact, many of us knew how this would shape up. Um, but here we are today with this important hearing and the data is proving, reinforcing what we already know, that so many of our communities, our black and brown communities do not have the resources to withstand and to endure a public health crisis like this one. Um, and we also know how we got here. I will encourage all the members of the committee um, and all of the panelists today to really um, dive deeply into CCC's data that can really point to how we got here. The fact is that the conditions that children and families face that put them at risk have been here pre-COVID um, and they've gotten much worse with the pandemic. Um, in my written testimony, uh, we call attention to three communities um, as examples, but there are many communities. And so this is why I encourage you to visit the data at data.cccnewyork.org. But in my written testimony, we call attention to three communities as examples, Elmhurst Corona, Bedford Park in the Bronx, and East New York. You know, I was so pleased to hear so many of the panelists speak about housing conditions. So I'll shed, I'll spend some time talking about overcrowded housing. Um, when you look at things like um, overcrowded housing on our data set, we'll see that um, the rate in Elmhurst Corona for households experiencing overcrowded housing is 25%. In Bedford Park, 19%. In East New York, 16% of households experience overcrowded. When we compare that to a citywide average of 10%. Um, because of time, I won't go through more examples like what we already know in terms of uh, disproportionate risk when it comes to health access, diabetes, asthma, other risk factors. Time. So I encourage you um, to visit the data. The question I pose to the committee today is how do we use um, this crisis 
uh, to figure out best practices and lessons learned and how do we ensure that we turn the corner with a recovery plan that includes what children need. Um, and so I look forward to working with the council. Um, we look forward to working with the council and the administration um, to make sure that recovery for children includes health, um, housing, uh, food security, trauma. I am so pleased to hear so many council members aware of the need for behavioral health services, especially now that's going to be incredibly important. Um, and lastly, education. I don't think we can fully appreciate um, the impact that the loss of learning will have on an aggregate level. Um, and we need to be vigilant um, to ensure that um, not only all New York City students, but especially those that, we, that were already very far behind, students in temporary housing, students in foster care, students in youth involved in youth justice systems. Um, it's a long list. And I think together we need to continue to raise these issues. I thank you so much. Thank you, Raisa. Um, our next speaker is Solange Azor. And then our last speaker is Leah James. Solange, you're up. Time starting now. Good evening um, to the committee and thank you to everyone who's contributed so far. So I'm Solange. I'm here on behalf of BYP 100 um, in partnership with Monica Yenkin, who spoke earlier and our ongoing Black New York City Mutual Aid Initiative. So the statement of demands read by Monica earlier is informed by a combination of existing data on how this pandemic is affecting Black communities, historical precedent around the ways that Black folks are impacted by health and economic crises, and lastly, by our interactions with the New York City Black community as a result of this ongoing mutual aid effort. Um, some of that uh, testimony I'm going to be summarizing right now. So this ongoing Black Mutual Aid Initiative is a collaborative project between BYP 100, Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and Decrim New York. And it has allowed us to come in contact with over a thousand Black New Yorkers from whom we've heard firsthand accounts of their vulnerabilities and their needs. We've so far distributed over 60,000 dollars to more than 400 people. We have been actively phone banking and are in the process of coordinating supply distribution, such as food, masks, and other basic household cleaning items. So we have heard from an undocumented college youth who lost access to their on-campus income and is struggling to pay rent. We've heard from our siblings who are getting released, although not at a quick enough rate. We are hearing from them a need for safe housing that allows practice of social distancing. We have heard from black birthing people who are already 12 times more likely than their white counterparts to die in childbirth, asking for increased birth options, communicated rights, quick and free access to diapers and other childcare supplies. We're hearing from disabled black people fear around adequate medical treatment because of ableism and fat phobia. From the deaf blind community in particular, there is a reported lack of targeted communication and resource efforts. There's also tremendous fear of given, getting sick, uh, given how disproportionately Black communities are dying as a result of systemic denial of basic needs. Medical racism, as many have so thoroughly discussed today, has rendered hospitals that serve primarily Black clients underfunded and understaffed, which um, obviously in a pandemic is violent and not ideal. Legacies of ongoing medical racial violence has also resulted in mistrust of the medical industrial complex for Black patients. Oftentimes, when Black patients describe their symptoms, they are not believed, listened to, and are dismissed without adequate treatment or care. As a community birth worker, I have seen this firsthand. People have requested funds for basic living expenses, including rent and groceries. We have also seen significant requests for protective supplies like disinfectant, mask, and gloves. Much of our community is hard hit by unemployment, especially those who don't qualify to receive the federal stimulus check, domestic workers, undocumented migrants, sex workers, formerly incarcerated people. And in addition to the demands described earlier, which include an expansion of social programming, leadership changings, changes, we're also hearing an overwhelming desire for rent cancellation, uh, which makes sense given that 58% of Black New Yorkers are renters. Um, one of the things that we're hearing a lot is that the community feels like they have Time. to choose between, um, thank you, I'm going to wrap this up. Our community feels like they have to choose between paying rent and feeding themselves or their families. And although eviction has been suspended, there's still ongoing fear that once that is lifted, their housing security will be compromised if they've been unable to pay rent. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and I'm hopeful that New York City will listen to what the people are saying and respond appropriately. 
Thank you, Solange. And now to our final speaker, Leah James. Your time starts now. Good evening. Um, thank you to the council members and the panelists. Um, I hope all is well with you and your family. And thank you for the invitation to be a panelist. Um, my name is Leah James. I am a long-term organizer and community advocate. And I also as a lead organizer for Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition. And I, I mean, I'm the last, so I heard everything here and there of folks and everything, even down to the statistics and the data um, is accurate and what folks are seeing on the ground. And as an organizer, um, we are fixers and we provide solutions. And that's what we try to do every day, every day, even for ourselves. Um, as a New Yorker and born and raised in East New York, and now I'm a resident of the Northwest Bronx community over by Fordham Road. And I am a mother, so I am going through the same things and challenges as everybody else of the folks that we are servicing. Um, and knowing that we, our, we phone bank all our membership, um, we assist our folks with housing, um, trying to figure out ways to um, partner with other organizations to figure out should we, you know, do this cancel the rent. Um, folks have to choose between rent and um, groceries and so forth. So I'm on a phone calls with our membership and community um, residents and NYCHA residents and uh, rent stabilized tenants and a whole folks and try to create solutions. Um, and what I don't see and what it is going on in the ground here in the Northwest Bronx is that um, what I haven't been hearing is what's the capacity of the city agencies. You have HPD, you have environmental protection, you have department of buildings, you have all of that. And I have not seen or heard of what's the protocol for these agencies during this pandemic. We are dealing with residential buildings right now that haven't had gas before this pandemic happened. We have dealt with tenants that had rent issues before this pandemic. Um, I haven't heard anything of, of what is HRA's protocol. I'm doing HRA cases online for family members and um, that the case just got closed, food stamps and, and, and cash assistance. And so I don't know what's the protocol or what the agencies, I would love to see when the mayor makes his um, uh, press conference in the morning, because I watch everybody every morning and watch the news. And I don't see any commissioners from those agencies giving, you know, what's the protocol, what's the update. We have tenants that are still calling 311 because the landlord hasn't had any heat, given any heat or the gas. So, Time. you know, so, um, Sorry, I was going a little bit more. I'm just going last, so I don't really know. <laughs> um, what I'm also is not um, seeing is that the employment. Yes, folks is all um, doing unemployment and um, asking for unemployment insurance and things like that. But where's the jobs? I know there's jobs out there. Folks is willing to work. They don't want to be applying for unemployment, waiting to get the the funds. So where is the where's the employment at? Um, I know there's alternate parking. Um, so the streets is not being cleaned. So we have a lot of <laughs> masks and gloves in the street and the streets is looking very filthy. So where's these other um, like nonprofit organizations um, that, you know, have our folks go and get these opportunities to clean up the streets, spray down the sidewalks or whatever. We already going through the Bronx over here, especially in the North Bronx, has the highest disparities of asthma. Okay, so um, is I, I don't see any street cleaning. Um, I know folks already spoke before about utilizing nonprofits. We our organization has been around for forty six years in this community. We know these community. We partner with uh, religious institutions, schools, um, residential complexes. Mitchell Lama buildings, NYCHA, different things. We've been around 46 years. So how can y'all utilize and not just use this opportunity as a panel discussion, but have us in the table as a discussion to design what this post pandemic could look like. Um, our organization also has a youth arm called Sisters and Brothers United. 
have been fighting for restorative justice practices for a long time. And um, right now, some of our youth is getting uh, teletherapy because they was getting social services in the school. And right now, uh, the teletherapy is not really working out and um, families is not being offered those resources. Um, I have lost a family member as well. And um, to locate the body was a difficult situation. And then we have members who, you know, living with family members. And I know folks said like, you know, they have a lot of family members living in their house. You know, we had a member that his mother and his sister lived in his apartment all together. The mother died Friday. The, sister, the, mother, the mother died Friday, the sister died Monday, right? And then to deal with all of that and to navigate all of those systems is, is a challenge. So I haven't seen anything and you know, everything is so digital uh, technology and online and everything. I haven't seen any mailings. Um, we have the link NYC's on the corners. Um, I see them flash, you know, information here and here, but some people still would love mailings in the mail to know how to navigate these, these systems. Um, I haven't seen that. Um, also, I also deal with uh, NYCHA. I'm born and raised in public housing. So um, I take it personal to assist and to help my sisters and brothers in public housing. I've been out there as well, helping distribute and support the Senate, uh, the, the, the state giving the sanitizer and the mask. And people are fighting out here for food and masks like animals. It was already disinvested before this even happened. So, and let's not get it confused because you think that people of colors in these communities is conditioned to be like this, right? So it's like, oh, for, okay, you know, they could go along. No, it, don't get it twisted of condition, right? Because you got people that's living in public housing in these buildings that are nurses and doctors and RNs and housekeepers and all that, and got a pension, okay? And retired that they know what's better life. So, you know, um, I'm seeing these things and I'm, I'm, I'm just like, what is going on here? Um, and uh, we already know the internet access and, you know, as nonprofit organizations and community advocates and organizers, we, like I said, we always try to find solutions. You know, we try to share our internet access with our members from our house. We trying to do these things. You know, we have in our first membership meeting, virtual membership meeting this Friday and, um, just trying to do this, you know, have everybody have accessibility. I'm also a, uh, a member, um, a community advisory member um, of North Central Bronx Hospital. So trying to innovate ways and be creative. Um, I live in Councilman Richie's, di uh, Councilman Torres district, and we partnered with him um, before this pandemic to create the Healthy Builders Program where we went to residential, um, uh, private residential and NYCHA and um, to lower the asthma disparities in these buildings and use worker um, cooperatives organ, um, and Bronx based worker cooperatives to do green cleaning and integrate a pest management in these apartments to lower the asthma disparities in these people buildings. And we did it in public housing and we gave them asthma action plans to, to, to monitor that and then to a actually um, find the root cause of these issues in these buildings. Of course, it's capital and to, to advocate for that. But um, I just wanna know where's the, the city agency's um, role in all of this? I haven't heard anything, uh, what's the protocol? I don't know what to tell our members that if they don't have gas, what is the DOB's protocol and that, um, you know, folks is looking to go on a rent strike uh, tomorrow in New York City. And um, what does it look like for these rents and for uh, um, nonprofit management companies that need support? Um, we actually partner with a lot of folks that was on this call today, NHD, um, Associate Neighborhood and I mean, Housing and Development that use our work that we do on the ground to create maps and do our own data and do our own thing. So um, I think that's uh, 
all I have to say. I piggyback on a lot of the what the council members have said. Um, Ayala earlier about the mental health, people anxiety. Even my anxiety got triggered in this thing. I didn't even know I even had it, right? And so, because I'm being a homeschooler now with my daughter, and um, working and trying to balance that. So this is the reality. This is the world that we live in, and um, I, you know, I always support a lot of uh, anything and partner with anybody to make things happen and create solutions. That's just me. I've always been like that. And my family's been like that. And, you know, I, I, I breathe and live all of this to support my community and fight for what's right. So if we got to change what it looks like post pandemic, I mean, post um, COVID, let's do this. Let's make this happen. So um, I think that's all. I'm the last. So <laughs> that's Thank you. I, I take the privilege. I stood. I came. I left. I came back because I wanted to be a part of this. And um, thank you. And I appreciate it. And our local small businesses. We fought very hard over here in the North Bronx for our uh, small businesses and to get loans and things like that. So thank you. And I appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Leah, for your testimony. And I just want to thank everyone for their powerful testimony their raw emotion. We heard eight hours of testimony from advocates that represent communities of color, making this one of the longest hearings in the history of the city council. You know, normally city council hearings are subject to strict time limits, but the speaker felt this topic was so important that he allowed me to take whatever time we needed. This is going to be the first in a series of hearings that we're going to hold on the subject. The next hearing will focus on the administration, so we're going to hold the administration accountable for addressing the issues that were raised based on eight hours of testimony. So I want to thank you for making this whole thing possible. I want to thank the speaker, the Black Latino Asian Caucus. I want to thank Councilmember Debbie Rose, who's been logged in for eight hours. Thank you, Debbie. Good to see you. And I also want to acknowledge that we were joined earlier by Antonio Reynoso. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And we look forward to seeing you at the next hearing. Take Thank care. you. I just want to take a few seconds to see if there's anyone else who we left off from the testifying list who might want to raise their hands right now. We'll take a few seconds to just take a look. I don't see anyone, so turning it back to Chair Torres. I know you already gave some closing remarks, but you can also gavel out. Uh, my metaphorical gavel, this, this, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Take care, everyone.